A new Nintendo console has been dancing a merry jig in the international marketplace for quite a while now, so we're well overdue for another cynical attempt to make the Mario 64 Lightning strike again and restore life to the lurching atrocity that is Nintendo's main franchise. I mentioned in the Phantom Hourglass review that the company has a terrible habit of treading old ground, but even by their standards the Mario ground has been trodden, bulldozed and purged with fire and salt. This time around they've taken the same ill-fated route Jason Voorhees took and have travelled into space in lure of innovation. But don't be fooled, this is your standard fill-in-the-blanks framework. Mario's hateful, emotionally retarded ball and chain has been kidnapped again, but before you can do the rescue you have to collect a whole bunch of stars, and it is always stars for some utterly arbitrary reason. And in the end Mario succeeds in rescuing the needy bitch who once again fails to put out, although frankly I've given up expecting any kind of actual human intelligent reaction from that clueless bint. For me, the interesting relationship is the one between Mario and Bowser. I mean on some days they fight to the death in fiery climactic showdowns, but on other days they go go-karting together, play tennis, even team up in some of the RPGs. Sure he kidnaps the princess a whole bunch, but no one seems to begrudge him for that anymore, it's just what he does. It's like begrudging a dog for licking its own balls. Initially Mario Galaxy gets an easy ride because it has to be inevitably compared to Mario Sunshine, the last proper Mario game disregarding all that spin-off bullshit, and you could transplant the head of Yosef Gobels onto the body of a praying mantis and it would still compare favourably to Mario Sunshine. I understand that Mario is a plumber, but while having him clean up huge piles of semi-liquid shit makes for good characterisation, it's not much fun to anyone except obsessive compulsive squirt gun fetishists. What I did like about Mario Sunshine though were those sections where they took that asinine water pistol away and left you to navigate a set of colourful platforms floating in the middle of a bleak empty void. They were frustrating but in a good way, frustrating like opening a carton of ready-made custard for your rhubarb crumble, knowing that the rewards will be all the sweeter for the effort. I remember saying at the time if they made a Mario game that was just this kind of shit then I'd be all over it like Robbie Coltrane on a plate of chips. Well it seems some kind of Nintendo independent thought detection van was passing by my house that day because Mario Galaxy is pretty much that. Okay, I admit it, Mario Galaxy is fun. It feels like a return to form, lots of interesting levels with a huge variety of settings, terrains and challenges, plus watching Mario rocket through space at meteoric speeds, holding his little stubby arms out has a rather perplexing charm to it. It's cutesy and colourful enough to be kid-friendly while still challenging the adult audience, and some moments are appealingly fucked up when taken out of context, like force-feeding a guy sweeties that he explodes and turns into a planet, or crawling around on the exterior of a giant woman picking debris out of her rampant pubic hair. On the other hand, the boss fights are pathetic, pretty much all of them won by swatting their projectiles back at them like a game of interstellar pong. The final boss fight in particular is about as hard as the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man's dick in the presence of his grandma, but then I guess Bowser is pretty much resigned to inevitable failure these days. Oh yeah, and the implementation of a live system is still as unnecessary as it was in Mario Sunshine and as it has been ever since we stopped designing games for amusement arcades run by people destined to be the villain in an episode of Scooby-Doo. My main complaint is with the gimmicks. Criticising a Wii game for being gimmicky at this point feels like criticising a midget for being short, but when Galaxy tries to be unique it gets in the way of the fun. The constant changing of gravity and camera angle makes it hard to predict whether a push in a given direction will send Mario the right way or send his big fat ass sizzling into the nearest lava pond. And this isn't helped by awkward and unintuitive camera controls. Plus it certainly wasn't a smart design choice to make the player have to shake the controller so much because like many gamers my skeleton is made out of Jacob's cream crackers, and within hours I felt the pangs of early onset arthritis in my wanking wrist. But these issues certainly weren't enough to stop me beating the game, or at least getting as far as the end credits, that's by no means the actual end, but striving on for 100% completion is for unemployed psychotics and Koreans. My conclusion is that you could do a lot worse than buying Mario Galaxy, but it would have been better with a GameCube controller. That's right, it denigrates the very console it's supposed to sell, and that's so deliciously tragic. All in all though, I'm left wondering where this series could possibly go from here. I mean, once you've gone into space, everything after that feels like a step backwards unless your next film teams you up with Freddy Krueger. Maybe they could do Super Mario Universe, but that's really only postponing the issue. Of course, Nintendo always has the option to axe the franchise and start a new one with new interesting characters, then maybe they could start a snow shoveling business in hell. Reviewers take every opportunity to fling their poo like angry chimpanzees, but don't think that ballistic shit is all I'm about. There are things that I love, and one of them is the Silent Hill series. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it loves me back, but like an abused spouse, I keep returning no matter how many times I get slapped about by his friends Mr. Frustrating Combat and Professor Dodgy Camera Positioning. What I love about Silent Hill is it's absolutely peerless storytelling, which when compared to the general standards of writing in the games industry makes it look like Charles Dickens joining a forum for Invader Zim fanfiction. I still hold up Silent Hill 2 as the benchmark for video game storytelling and atmosphere. Yeah, the combat sucks in a rusty fire hydrant, but it's supposed to. You're supposed to be an ordinary dude or dudette, trapped alone and scared in a hostile oppressive environment, not Tommy Testosterone tits. The series dribbled away with Silent Hill 4, leaving me and many others with big old Silent Hill blue balls, but sooner or later it was inevitable that some prick would try to take my blue balls in hand and ring out some money to pay off his hookers, hence Silent Hill Origins, a new game exclusive to the PSP of all things, outsourced to Climax Studios, a western developer who couldn't have missed the point worse if they fired in the wrong direction and the point was in a different country altogether. Climax Studios apparently looked upon Silent Hill's oppressive combat and decided it would be best improved with the addition of God Helper's quick time events. Also, you have one second to name any 
game in which weapon degradation has been a good idea. Time's up, that's what I thought. There's something very wrong about a katana that shatters after five or six hits, one that ostensibly isn't made out of glass or chocolate. This is balanced somewhat by the fact that you pick up a new melee weapon with every alternate step, but whenever a weapon breaks mid-fight you switch immediately to the fists, leaving you to either slap the given monstrosity to death or let it chew on your ass while you dig another weapon out. It also raises the problem of where the main character found a body warmer that can store 18 portable television sets. But since I have such a huge stiffy for Silent Hill's story I won't berate Origins too much for bad gameplay decisions, as blisteringly idiotic as they were, but in terms of gameplay that affects the story there's a mechanic that allows you to shift at will between Silent Hill's trademark evil dark world and still evil but slightly less dark world, which in practical terms just means twice as many rooms you have to explore and is additionally rather detrimental to the atmosphere. Giving control of the reality shifts to the player removes the feeling given in the previous games that the main enemy was the town itself, a weird faceless malevolence toying with the clueless Berkey controlling out of some twisted grudge. But the Silent Hill in Origins doesn't seem to give two shits, and frankly I sympathise. Clueless Burke de jour is Travis, trucker and professional retcon who gets embroiled in the dealings of Silent Hill's friendly neighbourhood death cult circa seven years before Silent Hill 1 when the town was still getting into the swing of things. He's also got a dark secret and a troubled past, the Silent Hill equivalent of a season ticket, but it's impossible to care about him because a he's a breathtaking nonentity with all the emotion of a polystyrene block, and b there's no reason for him to be in the town at all, there's no missing wife or daughter keeping him motivated, the only conceivable reason for not turning on his heel and fleeing with nary a backward glance or stop at the gift shop is sheer determined retardation. The end credits of the game makes a special point of thanking the fans, which makes sense because that's what it feels like, a fan game. Its thinking seems to be that it can repeat the mastery of Silent Hill 2's storyline by tacking an arbitrary tragedy onto the main character's backstory and throwing in a transparent pyramid head wannabe, disregarding all the important things like pacing, atmosphere and a genuinely tragic and sympathetic protagonist with more charisma than a mouldy lemon. Silent Hill 4 The Room got a lot of deserved stick for some truly award-winningly bad game design, but I rate the story as one of the best in the series despite, and indeed partly because, it never actually goes to Silent Hill. And this is the thing, the first three sequels to Silent Hill all experimented with the concept, taking it to new and interesting places. Okay, maybe not so much Silent Hill 3, but shut up, I'm trying to make a point here. The point being that Origins is a pretender, nothing more, it does nothing but reiterate themes the series has already covered more competently, call me a sniffy games are art fagma sexual. To me, the Silent Hill series is over, and if Silent Hill 5 convinces me otherwise then I will remove three of my own vertebrae, curl my spine back, and eat my own ass. Once upon a time there was a little engine that could, the Cry Engine to be precise, developed by Crytek for the games Far Cry, Crisis, Chrysanthemum, and Jesus Christ Superstar. The games powered by the engine are characterised by tropical islands, sprawling non-linear game worlds, shitty vehicle sections, and racism. Far Cry was a game of many frustrations. While the scenery was expansive and pretty, you couldn't spend much time admiring it before finding your body attempting to occupy the same space as 10 million billion bullets fired by enemies with telescopic x-ray vision who could see you hiding in a bush 9,000 yards away, possibly owing to your relentlessly ugly shirt. It was the kind of game where you have to bind quick save and quick load to the left and right mouse buttons before you can get anywhere. Now we have Crisis, a pseudo-sequel to Far Cry in that we're back on a war-torn island, except now it's the future and Far Cry's protagonist has been replaced by his great-great-grand completely unrelated person who didn't inherit his predecessor's massive balls, and as such replaces the Hawaiian shirt with a regenerative nanotech suit. On balance it's pretty much just Far Cry again if it were put under the pussification ray. Joining you are your squad, a quartet of similarly dressed Delta Force man-children consisting of one commander, two red shirts, and Jason Statham. Your task is to infiltrate some island in the South Pacific and slaughter Koreans. There's probably more to it than that, but I found it hard to sympathise with the heroes when they're using expensive top-of-the-range military hardware and are backed up by the entire armed forces of the United States, while most of the enemy have to make do with wartime machine guns and harsh language. I know it's unusual for me to praise graphics when I'm normally down in the core working the gameplay and story gnomes to death, so understand how beautiful Crisis has to be for it to warrant a mention. Crisis is so pretty that were it an inmate in a male prison, it would be the bitch of every motherfucker in that place before you could say Andy Dufresne. At the point where you go inside the alien spaceship, sorry I forgot to mention there's an alien spaceship, I literally smacked my gob at the visuals. Somewhere deep inside my brain my little reviewer voice was gabbing off about the level design being unintuitive and confusing, but I hushed him because it just looked so damn nice it didn't bother me. Of course, with amazing graphics comes the inhumane treatment of processors. Crisis is apparently designed for some kind of hypothetical future computer from space. I played this on a brand new gaming PC resembling the monolith from 2001, constructed from magical obsidian by the proud dwarves of Middle-earth, and it still chugged when things got busy. But I guess this is the sort of thing that PC nerds get big raging PC erections for. Crisis feels like a PC exclusive through and through, I suppose, since there are enough controls bound to the keyboard to rival Microsoft Flight Simulator. In general, it's a fairly standard at FPS, as in you and the enemy point curses at each other and hold buttons down until one of you dies, although the ability to turn invisible and run around behind enemies giving them wedgies does add another dimension of entertainment value. But while each individual base usually has several infiltration routes, the progression as a whole is still fairly linear, which I don't feel makes the most of the engine. Something like the Cry Engine would be well suited to a game based around exploration, like say Shadow of the Colossus, something where you can really show off the terrain. As it stands it's just a somewhat above average first person shooter, until you get into a vehicle that is, and then it becomes an adventure into annoyance and failure. Every single one handles like a three-legged 
mule, and occupying one during a battle is like occupying a pile of gasoline and matches that explodes when an enemy so much as coughs at it. It's nearly always preferable to stay on foot, which thankfully is usually an option, but there is one section towards the end where you're forced to pilot a futuristic helicopter jobby and, well, imagine that you'd just woken from a 20-year coma, celebrated the occasion by drinking six bottles of Mad Dog 2020, then were called upon to pilot a light aircraft bearing a cargo of hippopotami. That's what controlling this section is like, and they expect you to enter dogfights in this thing. That's like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube with your elbows. Crisis is a game for sightseers, and if you have invested in the sort of computer that can run it, then you owe it to yourself to check it out, if only to justify that investment to yourself. Who knows, you might even have fun playing the actual game too, especially if you have a vegetation fetish. So basically what I'm trying to strain out like an uncomfortable kidney stone is a recommendation. It's not perfect, but then who is, besides Columbo? What would you get if you took the corpse of J.R.R. Tolkien, ground it into a fine powder, and snorted it off the doughy breasts of a prostitute suffering from Tourette's Syndrome? Well, first you'd get a throat full of dead writer, then the police will probably want to talk to you and you'll no doubt make an enemy of Mrs. Tolkien. What you probably won't get is The Witcher, because it's a video game and more easily acquired from your local electronics retailer, you idiot. The Witcher takes place in the same time-locked period of medieval England that all fantasy takes place in as inevitably as the fucking tides, and follows the adventures of an amnesiac platinum blonde called Gerald. Sorry, Geralt. Gerald is a witcher, a sort of demon hunter for hire. Not, as you might reasonably assume, a witch hunter since you run into witches fairly often and don't seem to care. You could make a convincing case for the word witcher meaning a bloke who has sex with witches a lot since even in the short time I was playing female magic users were queuing up to nibble on my plus 69 staff of penetration. What quickly becomes obvious is that witcher is very much a PC exclusive game which are typically designed to be as complex and unintuitive as possible so that those dirty console playing peasants don't ruin it for the glorious PC gaming master race. The first warning sign is that the manual is thick enough to beat goats to death with and then once you get into the game the interface is just a few steps shy of Microsoft Access in terms of friendliness. There's your inventory screen, your character screen, your alchemy screen, your glossary, your quests, your map, you have to switch between combat mode and stand around picking your nose while enemies carve you like turducken mode, and once you're in combat mode do you fight in strong, fast or group style, and if you'll be wanting to mix potions then I hope you've gone through the necessary 8 week correspondence course. If disliking this sort of shit makes me stupid then call me retard McSpacky Pants, but I'd rather be stupid and having fun than bored out of my huge genius mind. My first quest seems straightforward on the outset, bring 10 monster skulls to talk to prick number 17 of 54, but a stipulation was that I couldn't get the skulls until I had researched the monster in question. Apparently Gerald's amnesia extends so far that he needs to swat up before he can figure out where the motherfucking skull is located, but whatever, we'll run with it. When it came to revealing exactly how to research, however, the game was tight-lipped. God forbid that you could research the damn things by, you know, killing them. Admittedly, I might not be entitled to complain about the game's unintuitive nature because I didn't spend a weekend memorising the documentation, but even that wouldn't have made the game any less dreary. The box promises 80 hours of gameplay, and I believe it, because the game draws everything out mercilessly. A large percentage of those 80 hours will be spent making dull conversation, running from one side of the map to the other at the behest of fat NPC jerks, or just wondering what the chuffing hell you're supposed to be doing next. When you do finally get into some combat, it's almost on sufferance. You fight enemies by clicking on them once, and then if you're really advanced, clicking on them again. As I progressed through the starting village, a set of red flags came up that brought me to a sinister realisation. One click combat, endless trudging from place to place, quests involving killing X amount of monster Y for lazy stationary cockhead Z. This is a Mamorpaga! A single player Mamorpaga with no alliance dipshits teabagging your corpse, but a Mamorpaga nonetheless. Anyway, I have a tendency to completely lose interest in a game's story when I lose sight of the ultimate goal, and by the time I reach the second questing zone, I'd literally forgotten who I was supposed to kill or why I had ever cared, because the three women I'd had dirty middle ages sex with had mellowed me out somewhat. Some people might call the Witcher misogynistic for the fact that every single woman in the game shows off a cleavage you could lose your dog in and will jump on you at the slightest provocation for a PG-13 sex scene followed by a paradoxically explicit dirty postcard. Personally I think it's less the Witcher's obvious hatred of women and more the same misguided pretension to maturity that also causes the characters to cuss with every alternate word. You might say it's sexist to treat women like a baseball card collecting minigame so you can ogle their luscious rounded boobies and melt away between their smooth milky thighs as the sweat runs in rivulets from their writhing sensuous body, but Sorry, I forgot where I was going with that. The reason why this is a first impressions rather than a full review is that I found the game to be so boring and stodgy that I couldn't play it for more than a couple of hours before deciding I had to do my laundry or wash the gimp or anything that would mean I wouldn't have to put myself through more of it. And as a general rule of mine, a game that feels like work generally isn't looking at a good write-up. The Witcher was not fun for me, but you might have a better time if you're incredibly boring and if it's been decades since your last sexual encounter. And if that's the case, stop watching my reviews, Dad. Now here's something that hasn't graced the home console market in a snarling zombie dog's age, the rail shooter, also known as the FPS for the Bone Idol. This is exactly the sort of thing the Wii was tailor made for, but some might say that a mindless infinite ammo approach is a betrayal of Resident Evil's survival horror roots. Until that is, you remember that the series officially kicked survival horror in the head around the time Resident Evil 4 was letting you mow down your first legion of unruly Spanish peasants. Umbrella Chronicles is a difficult game to comprehend. It appears to be a celebration of Resident Evil's storyline, which to my mind is like celebrating Andrew Lloyd Webber's devilish handsomeness. Part of Resident Evil's charm is that it still takes itself seriously 
seriously, despite having the most atrociously written story and dialogue of any product of human endeavor since Hulk Hogan took one too many clotheslines to the head and decided he could act. For the uninitiated, the Umbrella Corporation is a bioweapons giant with very gullible investors, a bizarre obsessive compulsive tendency to build secret research labs under things, and a policy for exclusively hiring one-armed stroke victims to handle all their dangerous viruses. Do you remember what the villains from Captain Planet were like? How they'd steal an oil tanker and deliberately run smack into a beach to teach all the sea lions a lesson in complacency? Do you remember wondering why they didn't just sell the oil at huge profits and not have to get beaten up by a big blue man in little red pants? Well, that's basically the Umbrella Corporation. It's controlled by a handful of people who in any sane world would have been sectioned under the Mental Health Act before they could even finish presenting their proposal to murder 90% of their research staff. A villain whose only motivation is total commitment to being a bastard is not good storytelling. It leaves plot holes the size of a catamite's rectum, like where they keep finding investment, despite their inability to work out the rather glaring design flaw in a super soldier with an enormous herniated major organ. Umbrella Chronicles is a heavily cut down retread of three of the major Resident Evil games, starring Johnny Bravo, a prostitute, an idiot, a mullet, a nine-year-old boy, a brick shithouse, and Carlos. And despite being given this opportunity to revise things, it's gratifying to see Capcom continue their proud tradition of unintentionally hilarious dialogue. I have a bad feeling about this, announces Jill Valentine after having been repeatedly savaged by the undead, demonstrating her vital intuitive ability to sense danger about an hour after it has commenced. Where did all these webs come from, wonders Chris Redfield aloud while staring directly at a giant spider. And then there's the recurring series baddie and backstabbing enthusiast Albert Wesker, whose every line of dialogue is solid gold because he sounds like Lloyd Grossman with throat cancer. As for the gameplay, what do you want me to say? It's a rail shooter, you point at something you want dead and keep pressing the button, there aren't many ways you can cock it up. Okay, my old nemesis quick time events make an appearance, but this is really one of the few kinds of games where they might be appropriate since you're already being prompted to mash buttons with the response time of a paranoid gnat. On the whole, the experience has this charming retro feel to it, it's exactly the sort of thing you used to play on holiday in some seaside amusement arcades where your mum and dad would leave you while they walked around a nearby maritime museum pretending they were enjoying themselves. It seems, however, that Capcom absentmindedly forgot that they weren't actually making an arcade game and didn't have to relentlessly bilk us for coins. The difficulty is very unforgiving at times, with far too many unreasonably brief windows between a monster appearing on screen and them helping themselves to a Jill sandwich. There's one measly checkpoint in each episode, not counting the boss fight, and when you've fought through a horde by the skin of your teeth only to lose your final millimetre of health to a zombie kitten's corrosive piddle, getting warped back to half an hour ago will not do much to slow the launching of Wiimotes through TV screens. And while I'm complaining, I wanted to try this game out with the Wii Zapper, but those bastards might as well be carved from the wood of the true cross for how easy they are to get hold of in this fucking city. But I can't blame Capcom for that, so I'll just blame gods like I usually do. I admire the spirit of Umbrella Chronicles, because as my Silent Hill Origins review implied, I admire a series that tries to mix things up, not just release the same game every bloody year in what is known as the EA strategy. And I'm sure Nintendo appreciate having another entry for the critically small list of games where the Wiimote controls are actually appropriate and not a gimmicky contrivance. But why a rail shooter of all things? The rail shooter is a thing of yesteryear, a backward step down Anachronism Avenue. And let's not forget that the rest Resident Evil story isn't so complex that it needs reiteration. All in all, it's a very unnecessary game which gaming history will swiftly forget. If you like the prospect of Capcom wanking off in your face for a few hours, then knock yourself out. But personally, I reserve the privilege of wanking off in my face for only my closest friends and Valve employees. Never let it be said that I'm an impressionable 20-something gaming media prick. If I reviewed every bloody game people told me to, I wouldn't even have the free time to mainline the heroin necessary to keep me from putting a gun between my teeth, so for the most part I let requests go fuck themselves. The only time I review a game from recommendation is when it's simultaneously recommended by about 4,000 bleating lambs, which was the case with Call of Duty 4. This game came recommended more highly than a triple-cunted hooker, and brace yourself for a shock because it deserves the praise it gets. Mostly. I was surprised because I have this presumption about series like Call of Duty and Medal of Honor being samey shooters with futile pretensions to realism, time-locked Bill Murray style, somewhere between 1941 and 1945, endlessly repeating America's sole moment of glory and living memory by punching out an endless stream of cackling Nazis with one hand and scoffing apple pie with the other. Call of Duty 4, conversely, is set in the present day, which inevitably means that the enemies will either be Arab insurgents, Russians, or both, and the plot will involve the theft of nuclear weapons. And while this turned out to be right on the money, it's executed in a very compelling way. The plot deals with a conflict in a Middle East country that tactfully goes unnamed, undoubtedly because the state of that region fluctuates so much that it could be a waterslide park by the time this comes out, and your perspective shifts twitchly between a number of different participants in the conflict, allowing you to experience various different environments and combat styles. The US Marines posted in unspecified Istan whoop their way into open warfare with their guns balanced on the end of their massive erections, while the stealth-based British SAS scurry around in the bushes like cockney weasels. These changes of perspective and gameplay ensure that boredom is impossible, the controls are tight and intuitive enough to be effective however you have to apply them, and to balance the unentertaining seriousness of this sentence, boingo boingo whoopsie knickers. What I like about Call of Duty 4 is that there's less of the smarmy black and white my country tis of the jingoism that turns me off most war games. 
lives, while the US Marines act with short-sighted self-righteousness convinced that they're the heroes in their own personal war movie, you know, just like in real life, their attitude eventually leads to them screwing the pooch so hard that the pooch has to lock itself in a bathroom for an hour with a tube of soothing cream. You spend most of the game with the British SAS as they covertly fix things from behind the scenes, but they're depicted as a bunch of morally questionable psychotic thugs, again just like in real life. COD 4 never sacrifices gameplay for story or vice versa, and that's a principle that many game devs neglect like an orphaned chimney sweep. A sequence that stood out for me was a moment where you quantum leap into the body of a chap dying slowly and horribly of radiation poisoning in the aftermath of a nuclear explosion, dragging his useless legs around a wasteland steeped in graveyard stillness before finally breathing his last unloved and unmourned thousands of miles from home. It was an unflinching and effective statement which cheered me up immensely, and not just because I hate my fellow man, it was the turning point that shifted Call of Duty 4 in my eyes from above average gun wank to actually pretty excellent gun wank. All right, all right, the use of the word excellent should never go unqualified. It's far from perfect. It always seems to be up to you to push forward because your allies are content to sit in their hidey holes, shooting at endlessly respawning bad guys all damn day. Unless a grenade flushes them out, most likely dropped by me. Some of the characters are difficult to take seriously, like the incidental Black Marine, who unironically raps over the end credits, or the SAS commander, who has the kind of absurd facial hair that would indeed have given him a proud military bearing circa 1915, but these days just makes him look like a German porn star. Despite all that, though, I was becoming genuinely attached to the characters, which is why the ending is such a fucking cock slap. It comes out of nowhere in the middle of a fucking gunfight and gives no closure whatsoever, only a completely irrelevant epilogue thing plonked on after the end credits. It's like having a big tasty meal at a nice restaurant, but when you ask for the check, the chef comes over and farts in your face. Oh yeah, and some guns take so long to reload that it'd be faster just to send off for a new one by mail order, but now I'm just nitpicking. All you need to know is this. There are two kinds of games. Games that I stop playing because I've been bored or frustrated into a state approaching rigor mortis, and games that I stop playing because I've just noticed I should have had dinner two hours ago. And Call of Duty 4 is in the latter category. It's a truly shining example of the genre that sucked me in like, well, like a triple cunted hooker. And now since this review has left me with a lot of surplus bile, let me close by requesting that if any more of you would like to tell me how to do my job, then please get hurled out of a plane and land anus first on the spire of Winchester Cathedral. It's an idea that many people seem to latch onto, that if we were created by some kind of god, then obviously he did it because he loves us so huggy muggy much. Never are the holes in this theory more obvious than while playing god games, because it seems that when you place most people in the position of a god and give them responsibility over many tiny lesser beings, then their attitude towards them is usually less about beloved children and more about target practice. SimCity societies may on the other hand support the benevolent god argument, because if being god is this boring, then unconditional love is the only reason I can think of for not having slaughtered the whole unstimulating lot of us around the time we were still squeezing our own smallpox boils for nourishment. I hadn't played a SimCity game since the very first SimCity on the Amiga, which I was never any good at. I remember wondering why no one ever wanted to live in the nice houses I built next to the nuclear power station. It made sense to me, it would mean the electricity wouldn't have to travel so far, and as such would be less tired and more efficient. I also had difficulty grasping the notion that further away buildings had to be connected to the power station with wires. I just assumed that the little flashing lightning bolt icon meant that the people in the house were listening to ACDC. The gist of SimCity societies is that the emphasis is on the actual people in the city. First you have to build places for them to live, but no one will actually move into them until you've built four or five statues or fountains around the place, the fussy plebs. Then you build places for them to work, day in, day out. Then you build entertainment venues to stop them realising that their lives are a never-ending monotony in a walled-off bubble society run by an omnipotent cretin. Then you wait for the game to arbitrarily throw up some more money for you to do it all again. There's a degree of customization in that you can buy specific buildings that reflect a society based around capitalism, authority, art, scientific learning, existentialism, jam making, nose picking, but all you really need to worry about is making sure that the number of people is as close as possible to the number of jobs and that you plonk down a new cake shop every now and again to stop them moaning. Don't feel pressured though, they're not exactly difficult to please. I set out to make a brutal authoritarian dictatorship because it makes my balls feel big, so all my workplaces were things like Thought Police headquarters and all the venues were propaganda theatres and most of the gormless fuckers were still content or elated. Christ, this must be how Nazi Germany started. The only time the average mood dipped was when I had a major criminal infestation which I traced to some slum housing I'd included for the authentic downtrodden feel, but the problem was instantly fixed by demolishing them and building some more state housing projects which my citizens thankfully tolerated enough to not turn into serial murderers. I suppose the clinching flaw in this game that revolves around keeping people happy is that the people provoke empathy in the same way Jeremy Clarkson provokes animalistic lust. When you're building stuff, and you're never not building stuff, you remain levitating about a hundred feet above the ground, smacking down your big housing project rubber stamp, so for the most part the actual people are little scrabbling insects, a tiresome and unnecessary addition to my beautiful homes, like the mildew in the showers. This isn't like The Sims where you can zoom in far enough to see the tears roll down their faces every time you delete all the toilets, there isn't enough feedback to let you know you're doing your job properly, and when you aren't doing your job properly, like say for example at the point when you start tormenting them for giggles, there's no satisfaction to be had there either. But even when your city is a hotbed of misery, there's very little consequence, nothing like a halfway decent mass ritualistic suicide, nor is there any significant reward for doing well. All you ever do is build more and more crap over the surrounding countryside and with no real motivation for doing so unless you have a grudge against trees. Frequently it doesn't even matter where you build your crap. Okay, it's still a bad idea to build schools next to the paedophile training centre, but you can place statues and other decorations in a cave on the 
the fucking moon and it still somehow cheers everyone up. It's like Baby's first Sim City, with all the strategy reduced to that of a crossword with only two clues that someone else already filled in. Ultimately you could have an equally fulfilling time just drawing a city in MS Paint. That way you don't have to spend 60 bucks and you can get additional entertainment by drawing all the buildings with tits. Welcome to the 2008 Game Developers Choice Awards, my name is Yahtzee and I claim responsibility for the escapist zero punctuation feature when I'm not gabbing off at award ceremonies. Having been very politely requested to not be involved in the voting and to stop throwing rocks at your cars, I've taken the opportunity to present a personal retrospective of 2007 in my trademark psychotic manner. Take it away, myself. Ever since the Doom Marine first grimaced his way up Satan's ass, first person shooters have been defined by the faceless voiceless dorks that tread on their first aid kits. One could almost say that each era of gaming is defined by its anonymous taciturn underdogs if one wanted to sound like a twat. I'd like to take a moment to name 2007's best gun-toting stoic. Honourable mention goes to old hand Gordon Freeman, sadly disqualified for having a face and a name, who reappeared this year in Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Millwall 1. A scientist using a magical suit of armour to fight an Orwellian rage demon in a ruined city controlled by another evil scientist who sometimes seems to be channeling Alec Guinness. This is not to be confused with our runner-up, the faceless voiceless nameless dork from Time Shift, a scientist using a magical suit of armour to fight an Orwellian rage demon in a ruined city controlled by another evil scientist who sometimes seems to be channeling Mahatma Gandhi. But the Time Shift scientist is different because he can slow down time, so he's not ripping off Gordon Freeman, he's just ripping off everyone else. But the winner of the 2007 Best Invisible Dumbfounded P*** Award is none other than the main guy from 2K's steampunk objectivist philosophy fest Bioshock. Now there's a lot of criticism that can be levelled at him, he's a bitch, he's an alcoholic, he has some very strange ideas of how to treat small children, but all of this is countered by the fact that he has a magical hand that shoots bees. And that's why he takes the prize, because no matter who you are, the moment you're compared to a magical hand that shoots bees, you're going to f***ing lose. All games are about realising a fantasy, whether it be the fantasy of being a courageous war hero, or the fantasy of being a future space adventurer, or in the case of some Japanese games, the fantasy of possessing a prehensile dick. 2007 was a good year for fantasists who spent their pubescence stage diving off their bed while jerking off the end of a tennis racket. The popularity of the Guitar Hero series has proved that it's possible to recreate the feeling of rock glory even when the experience is cut down to its underpants. It seems as long as we have the music and the roar of the crowd, we're prepared to overlook the fact that we're standing in our living rooms holding moulded plastic ukuleles, flailing on colourful buttons like laboratory chimp with a head full of electrodes, and the release of Rock Band allowed friends to grow closer by giving them the chance to totally humiliate themselves together. It seems that these days even the most talentless, brick-headed, rhythm-deficient drill dispenser can know what it's like to be in a rock band as something other than the drummer. Part of me wonders if, like how the invention of realistic virtual sex will wipe out the human race within one generation, simulated rocking will kill the real life music industry. Now that it's no longer necessary to actually learn how to play an instrument, show up for gigs, stay up all night snorting drugs off people's body parts and still be alert enough the following day to dodge casually thrown beer bottles, bright young fellows with rock potential will instead use up their talent learning how to press buttons in the right order. Admittedly you don't get the benefits of constant sex or embarrassingly large amounts of cash, but you also don't have to drop dead at the age of 35 from a combination of exhaustion, drug abuse and bullets. Two thousand and seven was a significant year in gaming, which is disappointing because it's such a dorky number. I mean, two thousand you could respect, two thousand ten, two thousand five at a pinch, but two thousand and seven just sounds like a year with red hair and huge plastic framed spectacles. Who wonders why women don't seem to be impressed by his limited edition Big Daddy figurine? The year kicked off with the release of World of Warcraft: Burning Crusade in January, further cementing two thousand and seven as the year of the hopeless shut-in, offering new and interesting ways for the client base to continue sabotaging their own lives. It was also a year for pretenders to the Mamorpica throne, with the release of Lord of the Rings Online, Tabula Rasa, Hellgate London, and Fury. But nothing can make a dent in WoW's monolithic market share, because if I took every opportunity to acquire World of Warcraft free trial CDs, I'd have enough to make an attractive fashionable cape and perhaps a matching hat. Meanwhile, on the console battlefield, it was a significant year for the PS3 more than any other. At the start of the year, she'd been freshly kicked out onto the stage to nervously dance for our amusement, and it was hard to shake the feeling that she wasn't quite ready for prime time. Her shows were too expensive and she only knew two songs, but over the last year the girl's been exercising and eating properly, and I think it's fair to say she's become a decent rival to her peers, the Wii, who only knows like four or five songs, and the Xbox 360, who frequently comes onto stage drunk. Perhaps now there's decent competition, we'll have some decent concerts in 2008, and perhaps I should stop labouring this analogy before its tits fall off. It was also a year for mascots, with Mario as usual working off his tight little Mediterranean arse in 10 new releases, 17 counting Virtual Console, but the significance of this year is that it marked the point at which Mario buried the hatchet with old nemesis Sonic the Hedgehog in order to compete in a friendly sporting competition and presumably beat the living shit out of each other this year in Smash Bros. Brawl. Personally, if it comes down to a fight between two guys who make a living jumping on people, then my money's on the one with spikes growing out of his flesh. But what could have been a better closing moment for 2007 than the release of a new Duke Nukem Forever teaser. Yes, it seems that 3D Realms have been doing something other than giving each other piggy 
piggyback rides for the last 10 years. In a stroke, all the anticipation we haven't felt since 1998 returned like a taser gun to the base of the spine. I just hope that 3D Realms understands that if this game doesn't turn out to be history's greatest contribution to human culture and the cure for at least one type of cancer, then I and every other reviewer on Earth are going to saw its bollocks off. <laughs> There are games for all kinds of people. There are games for rappers and games for graffiti artists and games for people who feel up girls on Japanese subway trains, but there have never been any decent games for white supremacists. That is until Uncharted, Drake's Fortune, a rip-snorting adventure in which a waspish manly man runs around slaughtering everyone who had the poor judgement to not be born white. Okay, maybe I'm making too much of a big deal of this, but I'm not kidding when I say that every single minority on Earth is represented in the ranks of Uncharted's bad guys, a stream of assorted blacks, Asians and Latinos brought together by their mutual desire to kill whitey. This is with the exception of the very British main villain, but he gets arbitrarily killed off about ten minutes before the end in favour of a more ethnic final boss. Sorry to spoil that for you, but I assumed you could predict a plot point like the bad guy dies. But like George W. Bush, let's forget about the well-being of non-Caucasians and put on our reviewing pants. Uncharted has its sights very firmly on the notion of cinematic gaming and plays like a Hollywood movie, specifically the Hollywood movie National Treasure, with a big scoop of Raiders of the Lost Ark mixed in. You play Nathan Indiana Jones as written by Joss Whedon Drake, as he scavenger hunts for the inevitable lost golden treasure in the standard exotic locales while being aided by the troublesome initially hostile blonde love interest and the elderly mentor type figure who might as well wear a t-shirt saying, I will die or turn Evil. Before I twist the hatred valve, I just want to say that the water effects in this game are really good. Water pouring from pipes actually shimmers like real water does, and the main character's got this shirt that looks realistically wet after you've been swimming, but what's cool is that it will only be partly wet if it was only partly immersed in the water, and well I think it's interesting. Although it is odd how they put so much work into making his shirt look wet when his hair acts like it's held in place with polymer cement. Gameplay is divided between puzzle platforming extracted virtually unaltered from the slack vinegar scented womb of absolutely any Tomb Raider game, and Gears of War style action gunplay based around firing from cover and propagating the master race. Oh yeah, and there's some vehicle sections, but are those really worth mentioning anymore? Saying that an action game's got a vehicle section these days carries about as much weight as saying that it comes in a box. Anyway, Uncharted's hybrid gameplay falls into the familiar trap of trying to do everything and just making it bland across the board. A major problem is that it's a very visually busy game, with at any given moment the screen's stuffed with more greenery than a dope fiend's window box, which drops leaves on both the gameplay train tracks. In the platforming there's sometimes little to differentiate the next ledge you have to jump onto into meaningless background texture that will lead you only to good old jagged rock junction, and in the combat it's often hard to tell where an enemy is until they've already shot you, perfect aim at 900 yards naturally, which doesn't strike me as good battlefield strategy. Oh yeah, and there are quick time events. Let me speak directly for a moment. I sort of understand why developers keep using quick time events, I suppose an arbitrary reflex test is as good a method as any to get through a cutscene, but if you must use quick time events, make them a core part of gameplay, don't just throw them in randomly every now and again. Uncharted has got maybe three or four in the entire course of the game. What that basically means is that it's impossible to be ready for them. Quick time events are fine if it's reasonably possible to get through them on the first go, but otherwise they're just irritating. Jericho did this as well. I know I can't stop developers using quick time events, but you can stop doing this at least. <laughs> I'm being overly mean. The gameplay is quite adequate. Of course it is, it's been blanketly ripped off. Not a single element of it hasn't been tried and tested in at least three popular previous games. Even the story has been nicked bodily from at least five adventure movies that I can think of, seven if you let me count all the Indiana Jones films. Like I said, there's a definite pretension to being like a Hollywood movie, and like a Hollywood movie, it's populated entirely by shallow stock characters whose attempts at witty dialogue just come across as intolerably smug. Oh great, exclaims Nathan Drake sarcastically whenever a gaggle of gun-wielding darkies show up, rolling his eyes with knowing complacency until you want to reach into the screen and beat to death with his own hair. If it were a film, it'd be one of those dreadful straight-to-video knockoffs released to wring a few more precious drops of milk from the teats of the Da Vinci Code fad, probably starring Christian Slater. The word that best sums up Uncharted is safe. It takes no risks and pushes no envelopes. An envelope would move more if you put it in front of a glacier. It's just insipid like an unbuttered Jacob's Cream Cracker. Quite edible, but crying out for something more, a certain je ne sais quoi like a nice bit of brie. I don't expect every single game to spark a revolution, but it could at least let off a single measly firework. It would be very narrow-minded of me to say that all Japanese cartoons suck. That's like saying that all glass rockers are paedophiles. The fact is that there's bound to be at least one thing to your taste in all the different varieties of anime, whether you're into samurais or giant robots or serials about awkward young men very pointedly not having sex with a selection of eager women, but it would be fair to say that there are certain popular trends in anime that tend to set off my cynicism alert. I would list them, but thanks to Capcom I don't have to. Now I can just point at Devil May Cry 4 and say pretty much that. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not some spectacle adjusting model railroad enthusiast who cannot function without absolute realism at all times. Leaping eight times your own height, swinging swords the size of small cars around, and deflecting bullets with other bullets are all fine with me as long as it's entertaining. I'll even accept that getting a 7 foot katana jammed through your torso is totally survivable, if a bit homoerotic. A game starts whittling on my chips however when it populates itself with smug self-satisfied dick spurts and starts neglecting gameplay because it's too busy letting them swagger invincibly about until I want to flatten their androgynous faces with a kayak paddle. Allow me to expand. The abominably lengthy intro cinematic contained a total of three high energy bombastic fight sequences and my entire contribution to them was to sit on my arse taking a drink every time someone defied the laws of physics. There was no reason why these fights couldn't have been playable, but the game seemed afraid that I would cramp its style. It's like 
like Devil May Cry 4 invited me out to a bar, then left me alone in the corner nursing a strongbow while he busily tore up the dance floor with a giggling society girl. Eventually she was called away by her cackling friends and he came back to our table with fresh drinks and apologies, but I won't forget this betrayal, oh no. Capcom seemed to be pulling the Hideo Kojima gambit with this installment, wherein the beloved established character is supplanted for most of the game by a whinging pubescent successor whose motivation can best be summarised as pussy whipped. It seems however that after all the hilarious fanboy rage that Metal Gear Solid 2 weathered, Capcom are trying to pull the wool over our eyes by making the new character, Nero, look, dress, behave and speak exactly the same as the old character, Dante. If you're having trouble telling them apart, remember that Nero is a pussy, while Dante is more of a cunt. Anyway, if you want to know the story, Nero spends most of the game chasing his cardboard cutout love interest, while Dante concentrates on wearing too many belts. Devil May Cry 4 is a game that really makes me want to hate it, since everything about it is as aggressively juvenile as a 12 year old on pixie sticks, but there's really nothing wrong with the core combat gameplay, it's as obsessed with style as everything else, but building combos is fairly intuitive, and if you seriously don't find something entertaining about launching an enemy into the air and keeping him afloat with a cushion of bullets, then it's time to reassess your standards. But the lone shiny gold star I stick on for the combat is almost immediately torn off for some truly obnoxious level design. Jumping puzzles, fine. Timed jumping puzzles, fair enough. Timed jumping puzzles with fixed cameras, now we've dropped into the ocean of shittiness, but then they hit us with a timed jumping puzzle with a fixed camera where enemies spawn in every time you fail, and now the ocean of shittiness has closed in over our heads with no rescue boat in sight. Breathlessly intense punch-ups aside, Devil May Cry 4 strikes me as a rather lazy game. Several moments come across as artificially lengthened, like what my spam mail seems to think I should be. Take the recurring board game segment. There are certain rooms throughout the game which for some demented reason you're not allowed to leave until you've thrown a big spiky dice a sufficient amount of times to make a big representation of yourself move across a bunch of squares. There's only one path so there's bugger old strategy involved, it's just pointless delays like a hallway full of balloons. After the first time it happened I assumed it was just some idea that the lead designer's girlfriend had had that he'd agreed to put in for the sake of his sex life and we'd never see it again, but then for the entire last hour or so of gameplay it came back, bigger and more of an embuggerance than ever. This led me to deduce that the developers genuinely thought that it wasn't terrible game design and that in turn led me to deduce that the developers were all pillocks. Not that there was any shortage of evidence to that effect, virtually the entire midpoint onwards consists of revisiting all the previous levels in reverse order. This was a bad idea in Silent Hill 4 and time has not sweetened it. Considering how short the game is anyway, I can't help wondering if this is some kind of cry for help. Please go the Devil May Cry team. Please stop buying these games so we can do something else. We have totally run out of ideas. I spent the last six months rendering the glisten playing off the greasy exposed breasts of some athletic hip cocking slut and now I want to kill myself. Let's face uncomfortable facts, shall we? No series on any form of media has ever still been good after being shaken down for sequels, with the possible exception of the Back to the Future movies. Devil May Cry 4 is the agonised grackle squawk of a series being put through the ringer, utterly submitted now to the fanboys and the weird girls who write erotic crossover fanfiction and smell like old meat. The combat is all I can recommend, but it's hardly worth buying for that. You could probably replicate it by putting a wasp next to a spider, playing some Slipknot in the background and pouring red and green gummy bears on whoever wins. People often ask me, Yahtzee you Herculean exemplar. You have so much to say about what makes a bad game, but what is your measure of a good game? Well actually no one's ever asked me that, mostly they ask retarded questions like when am I going to review 20 year old Nintendo games like everyone and their dog, but it's the kind of question I'd like to be asked so I'm going to answer it. One of my measures of a good game is one that teaches me something. Burnout Paradise for example teaches me that if Princess Diana honestly couldn't survive a trivial little crash like that then the girl must have been made out of wafers. If there's one thing that makes me squirt liquid hate from every bodily orifice it's street racers, bunch of smirking sideways baseball cap wearing fuck scoffs bobbing their heads in time with their hydraulics and extending random fingers like they're about to intrude upon somebody's pubic region. As a street racing game Burnout Paradise earns points right from the start for not featuring any of those grope cunts or indeed any human beings at all. The game takes place in a strange post-apocalyptic future where advanced sat-nav systems have resulted in a race of murderous sentient cars and the only surviving human being is an insane DJ calling himself Atomica, who spends his nights running around setting up ramps everywhere and his days holed up in a radio station trying to talk the cars into destroying themselves so that he might one day reclaim society. That's the only explanation I can think of for the total absence of pedestrians and why you never see any poorly strapped in children go hurtling through windscreens during one of the many, many, many high-speed crashes. Burnout is a game that hates players with a passion. If it were a fascist dictator it would build concentration camps for players and what's more he'd lay every brick personally with cement mixed from his own blood, that's how much he hates you. Every aspect of the gameplay is geared to ensure that you crash as often and as viscerally as possible, the streets twist and turn unexpectedly, the main camera angle has the back end of your car taking up most of your view like a mongoloid hippo, and the streets are densely populated with pupils of the local driving school for elderly sufferers of Alzheimer's disease. And when you do inevitably crash, Burnout's gloating satisfaction hangs thick in the air, slow motion sets in, the colour washes out and the action switches to the optimal camera angle to watch yourself pirouette through the air, as if to say, hey everyone, come and see Captain Crash is a lot. I do admit, however, that flying 500 yards upside down while raining metallic painted scrap metal is, to coin a phrase, totally fucking sweet. At least when you're not in a hurry to get somewhere. Unfortunately, this being a racing game, you generally are in a hurry to get somewhere, and there's nothing that causes more auto cannibalistic frustration than colliding with a bollard at full speed, 10 yards from the finish line, and having to watch yourself spinning on your roof for a few seconds while your opponents snatch first, second, and third place from under your mangled nose. Burnout Paradise's unique selling point is that it's an open world game, one of those games usually pitched with a sentence beginning like 
Grand Theft Auto but. In this case, like Grand Theft Auto, but a hell of a lot more broken. The idea is that you can drive freely about the city as much as you like, and when you start a race, all you're given is a finishing point, allowing you to choose your own route. Fine in theory, but theories are treacherous things that can at any moment disintegrate like a biscuit raft. And the major flaw with this one is that you have to keep looking at your mini-map to make sure you're on the right course. My driving instructor used to give me enough stick for taking my eyes off the road at 30 miles an hour, and here's you hurtling through the streets at Mach 10 with any number of crash hazards closing in on your distracted arse. My point is that the reason why racing games traditionally feature closed circuit tracks is that the fun in a street racing game comes from driving really fast and breaking things. That's a winning formula. Then you throw map reading skills into it and it's the metaphorical shot of Bailey's, overpowering all the other flavours. I keep having to pause the game in the middle of high speed chases to bring up the map, which like a menstruating woman falling off a tall building, breaks flow. An open world racing game could work, Carmageddon did something like that and it was pretty fun in a late 90s kind of way. Maybe that's because there were lots of old ladies around to help relieve the frustrations, or perhaps because it didn't take control from you every shit gargling time you ran into a wall to let the physics programmer dance on your grave for 20 interruptive seconds. There are more things I can get pissy about, like the lack of local multiplayer, or how the single player gameplay basically involves grinding the same races about a hundred shitting times, but you have to judge Paradise by different standards. This isn't a game intended to be played all weekend. This is a game that you play for maybe an hour or so to psych yourself up for playing a killer rock guitar solo or punching out an angry bear. Yes, this is a game for cool people who like fast cars and don't have time to play games because of all the sex they have. And if all you can do is sit there gabbing off about the design and game flow, then you've probably missed the smirking sideways baseball cap wearing points. Australia, as most intelligent people know, is populated by the descendants of convicts sentenced to exile for cutting purses and throats on the streets of London Town. As for the people whose purses and throats were cut, their descendants all now work in the games industry and conspire to continue the punishment of Australians by stapling an arbitrary number of months onto every single motherfucking release date. So while we're waiting for stuff like No More Heroes or Rock Band to finally deign to show their faces down here, let's take out our frustrations on some shitty dinosaur game. I'm actually rather glad that a really unequivocally bad FPS has been shat out in front of me because there are a lot of problems with first person shooters these days and Turok plays like an itemised list of them. So rather than do what I usually do, i.e. crucify the game with big blunt rusty nails shaped like penises, let's instead use Turok as an example to go through a few of the mistakes first person shooters keep persistently making. Perhaps I could persuade developers to stop making them, then maybe I could persuade the tide to turn back and ride a winged marshmallow to the Sherbert kingdom. 1. Use console controls responsibly. When I am aiming at something and I nudge the right analog stick slightly, this is usually because I want to be aiming at something slightly to the side of whatever I'm aiming at now. It does not mean I want my entire body to rotate 90 degrees, and I especially don't want that to happen when a velociraptor is running straight at my face brandishing a dessert fork. Of course, the absence of mouse control will always cripple console FPSs, but the good console FPS will compensate for it with, say, smoother aiming or auto-targeting, but since, as we've already established, Turok is not a good console FPS, aiming at things is like trying to play darts after letting your arms fall asleep. 2. Bring back health meters. I don't know when the games industry in general fell out with health meters, maybe someone threw a big party for video game interfaces and Mr. Health Meter got drunk and acted like a tit so now everyone shuns him. Whatever, games just don't have health meters anymore. When you're hurt, you just heal up by sitting in the corner sucking your thumb for a few seconds, which makes things a little patronisingly simple, but it's very accommodating towards players who happen to be the three-year-old children of syphilitic lepers. What's so bad about health meters anyway? Okay, they're not what you'd call realistic, but I kind of thought we'd abandoned realism around the time space marines were stabbing dinosaurs on the planet Zog. 3. Give grenades halfway decent splash damage. 4. Stop ripping off aliens. Aliens was a good film, I'm glad we're all in agreement there, but it seems you can't walk ten paces in today's first person shooter market without tripping over grizzled, sassy, multi-ethnic military types, often wearing or at least located somewhere inside suits of powered armour each the size of four brick shithouses stacked together. Turok goes the extra mile by ripping off the entire cryopod scene from Aliens verbatim, except with Sigourney Weaver replaced with an overly masculine stupid haircut. No change there then, ha ha ha, raucous laughter. When you consider that the original Turok games were about a time travelling Red Indian, this new instalment has had to really work hard to rip off Aliens, they had to lock the established setting and storyline in a wardrobe and throw it off a cliff. They've approached ripping off aliens with the same determination that most developers would approach making a game that's actually good, and that's sort of admirable, I guess, in a retarded kind of way. 5. Stop zooming into the backs of people's heads to show we're taking control of them. 6. Stop blowing all your money on big name voice actors who then totally phone it in. So Turok has this grumpy friend who looks like a cross between Gimli son of Gloin and Popeye the Sailor Man and whose voice indicates that he is a incapable of human emotion and b a recent victim of cranial drill intrusion. Out of curiosity I went on IMDB to learn what amateur dramatics wannabe voiced this gobshite and found it to be none other than Ron Fuckmothering Perlman, a Ron Perlman I can only assume who realised early on what kind of dross he was working with and vowed to bring that across in his performance and if Ron Perlman thought Turok was shit who are you to argue? Did you ever warm the frozen hearts of audiences worldwide in City of Lost Children? No? Well shut up then! 7. Conclusion Most of these problems with modern FPSs can be explained with four words, let's be like Halo. But I remember a time when FPSs didn't all march and step behind that inexplicably popular festival of mediocrity when FPSs weren't all about soldiers or space marines, when they could be about undead cowboys or backwards pig rapists or wisecracking misogynistic wankers. I remember a time when FPSs had a sense of humour about themselves and could have colours other than gunmetal grey and dogshit brown. I remember titles like Exhumed and Chasm and Witchhaven 2, although on reflection I'd rather forget about them.
them. Long ago, in the mists of time, when main characters didn't need to have biceps bigger than their faces and when bump mapping was just something cartographers did to their wives, there lived adventure games. This shy, thoughtful tribe was known for its great storytelling tradition and ruled the great PC gaming planes for many years before mysteriously dying out around the onset of the Quake era. Some blame the aggressive expansion of neighbouring first-person shooter tribes, but personally I think it's more to do with the fact that most of them were shit. Most of your average adventure game experience was spent casting a truckload of miscellaneous knickknacks around, patiently rubbing them all one by one against everything else in the hope of hopping onto the train of logic unique to the game's designer. For every decent adventure game like Monkey Island or Grim Fandango, there were five excess baggage fests driven by moon logic, funnily enough all designed by Roberta Williams. So the genre popped its unintuitive clogs, not that adventure game fans have ever been able to accept that. Attempts are constantly made to revive the genre by jumping on its gas-bloated stomach, but this rarely causes more than a feeble squirt of pungent fluids from one of the less wholesome orifices. Now it's Capcom's turn to take a wholehearted two-footed bounce on that poor defiled body with Zack and Wiki, an adventure game for the Wii featuring western-style point-and-click controls and inventory puzzles, but that's where the internationalism ends. If you find the Japanese offensive, then you'll find this game offensively Japanese. The main characters are a brash youth with no voice and stupid hair and his aggressively cute monkey friend voiced by some painfully shrill harpy thing, and the antagonist is a hot angry girl in a miniskirt. Now all it needs to do is dispense used panties and depress the Chinese. Another thing this game doesn't have in common with 90s western adventures is a connecting storyline, or indeed much of a story at all. Whack and Zicky uses a mission-based format, breaking the adventure gameplay into manageable bite-sized chunks, plonking down a couple of obstacles between you and a treasure chest and leaning back folding its arms waiting to see what you do next. And this is the point where the game shines, because the point where you figure out that you're supposed to put the key in the door or perturb the angry sloth with the frighteningly large dildo creates the same smug cock ooh look at me I didn't have to consult GameFAQ's good feeling that I've always liked about adventure games. And the fact that there are only a handful of inventory items that you use repeatedly rather than a billion, each with one UND PRECISELY VON application, removes one of the major things I don't like about adventure games. But then of course Zim and Spacky breaks the cardinal sin by making it possible to die, not just as a result of insistently clicking on a grizzly bear six times, often without warning as a consequence of simple curiosity or in some cases just letting your mind wander for a few seconds too long. And if you do die, you have to go buggering right back to the start of the mission, meaning you'll have to repeat all the spastic Wiimote flailing you've had to do to get to where you were. Which links me neatly to my next paragraph. Once again, the Wii proves itself some kind of patron deity of gimmicky pointless bullshit. Every time you use a tool or item, you have to make an equivalent gesture with the Wiimote, but half the time the movement of the on-screen tool bears only rudimentary similarities to the gesture you're expected to make. The one that sticks out in my mind is when I was expected to turn a big horizontal wheel, and none of the movements that seemed obvious caused the damn thing to budge an inch, so I ended up randomly waving the Wiimote around like it was an uppity bat, trying to find out through trial and error which of the many possible movements the game was thinking of. I would say that I'd have preferred the game to not showcase the Wii's exotic abilities, but I'm pretty sure that was the whole idea. Come to think of it, Wank and Sticky is a game with a lot of needless attachments, like the fact you can buy hints, totally useless while the internet still exists, or the practice of awarding points based on how quickly you solve puzzles, which I frequently took personally. But if you complain about unnecessary additions, you're just being a tosser. It's like complaining about, say, a perfectly good hot dog because the vendor is the Boston Strangler. You can still enjoy the hot dog and just try not to make eye contact, and overall I enjoyed Zack and Wiki. It's fun and original and has a lot of charm, as long as you can tolerate a slightly childish tone, which on reflection you probably could if you're an average Wii owner, because statistically you're eight years old. Oh yes, and some people might find the characters' pseudo-verbal grunts and squeaks a bit annoying after the first few hundred times. I didn't, but my roommate said it was like having his ear canals raped by a man wearing a sandpaper condom. Not in those exact words, obviously. I'd be the first to admit that in my reviews I tend to go straight for the gay jokes too much. Somehow a burn becomes doubly funny when you imply that the subject also likes it rough from men with hairy bums. I've honestly been trying to cut down on them lately, but Jesus, look what I've got to work with. Two inseparable muscular men, one big and grizzled, the other young and spunky, running around in gimp masks, knocking down big missile erections, plainly sexually uninterested in the only woman of their acquaintance, and despite ostensibly making a lot of income as contractors, they can only afford one parachute between them, which they're a little too eager to share. Okay, I promise not to make a big thing of this. Besides, the gameplay's more like a recruitment video for private military contracting than an endorsement of the bumming lifestyle. We're quickly and frequently reminded that the military is shit and so is everyone in it, while mercenaries are unstoppable immortal badasses who make tons more money and like it rough from men with hairy bums. No, bad yate! I meant to say, and you get to wear funky skull masks like it's Halloween every day, except that it's you giving out the candy and the candy is bullets. It's your standard mix and match present day military shooter plot, you start off killing Al-Qaeda suicide bombers in post 9-11 Afghanistan in a bit of ripped from the headlines gritty realism that falls on the border of tasteless, and before long you've moved on to the rest of America's favourite punching bags, first the Iraqis, then the Chinese, and finally their number one one hate figure, other Americans. If you don't see the standard double cross plot twist coming, then you probably need help dressing yourself, but let's not dwell on it, we're not here for story time people, let's talk about all the sexy violence. The major selling point, the one right there in the title, is that you're assisted by an NPC partner. There's more to it than that, obviously, because if there wasn't I'd have to tactfully break to EA that they were beaten to it by every shooter made in the last five fucking years. The major difference is that you have to pull the little levers in your partner's head to make him hold position, regroup, advance, or whatever, and to the game's credit it's pretty intuitive. It's just that sometimes messing with the little levers causes something to snap inside his noggin. On a couple of occasions he throws up and just stood there while the enemy turned as
us both into bullets and hamburger sandwiches. And then there was the time I was standing by a door while he went to push a button across the room and I accidentally pressed the button to regroup and he ended up endlessly running back and forth like a sheepdog with a piece of shrapnel in its head. Actually, there are quite a lot of things QA should probably have picked up on. Having grown tired of my AI partner's insect-filled brain, I tried playing co-op split-screen with a friend. In one shootout sequence, there was an elevated holdout position that I gave him a boosty up to as part of a cunning higher ground strategy, but since my friend had trouble understanding that enemy bullets were something to be avoided, he was taken down. When this happens, you basically can't move or get up until your partner comes over to stick a healing foot up your ass, but since there was now no one to give me a boosty up to where he was, all I could do was hop impotently up and down like a skull-faced bunny until his bad case of idiocy proved terminal. So it's a buggy game, but not without compensating factors. There seems to be an issue with the difficulty curve in that there isn't one. Gameplay consists of a linear succession of samey stop-go shootout playgrounds, and your characters can absorb so much damage you think they were written by Frank Miller or something. Health regenerates fast, enemies are reluctant to advance, and even if you do get taken down, you'll be a-okay as long as your partner gets over to you at some point in the next year or so, which isn't always guaranteed, but still, it makes me wonder why they felt they needed two people for this. I don't feel Army of Two makes the most of the whole two thing. All you need the other guy for is distracting the enemy so you can run up and shoot their buttocks off, a job which could be done just as well by a scarecrow or a loud noise. And even that's never really necessary except when they wheel out the enemy wearing impenetrable bullshit armour on everything except his bum, which I suspect are only thrown in to give the other guy a contrived and flimsy reason to be there, like the ledges that require boosties. So all this company needs to do is strap some fireworks to a stepladder and they'll only have to pay one set of wages. I was being facetious earlier, I don't really get a gay vibe from Mr and Mrs Skeletor. They remind me more of a pair of eight-year-old boys running around the schoolyard kicking girls in the shins. The option exists to pimp out your guns with funky paint jobs and bling, and if that idea appeals to you, then give yourself a nice saltwater douche because you're officially a cunt. It's just a little bit tacky to combine juvenile power fantasy with real-world politics, but I don't want to beat Army of Two with that when there's perfectly good bad game design I could beat it with. It's repetitive and broken and nothing you haven't seen before. If you can play Gears of War with one hand and Splinter Cell with the other, then you don't need to play Army of Two. And make sure you film it because that's a pretty impressive talent you have there. No More Heroes is a Japanese game based around Jedi lightsaber fighting and starring as the main character a hopeless pop culture obsessed social reject who spends most of his time whining, getting strung along by women and being a generally unlikable fuckbend. So at least you can't fault it for understanding its audience, predictable joke. The game is brought to us by Suda51, the 51st result of an illegal Japanese cloning experiment to create the world's most auteur game designer, Suda's 1 through 50 having perished after their minds failed to absorb the necessary level of pretentiousness. His last game was Killer7, and let's get one thing straight, I fucking loved Killer7. There we were, living our great predictable lives, playing our great predictable games, when along came Killer 7 in a Technicolor dream coat, leaving slightly perplexed joy in the wake of its huge motorbike, showing exactly what could be done when you flaunt all established convention and just start exploring what can really be done with gaming as an art form. I still don't know how to classify it. Puzzle, action, adventure, rail shooter? Well, whatever it was, it was a preciously unique, amusing cartoon whale in an ocean of secondhand bong water. Now we have No More Heroes, a Grand Theft Auto clone. Shine on, you crazy diamond, said Yahtzee, his voice thick like sarcastic marmites. Well, that's a bit uncalled for. The experience is still as off the beaten track as I've come to expect. You play Travis Touchdown, the aforementioned specky narcissistic weirdo characterised just a little bit uncomfortably close to home, who buys a lightsaber and vows to become the greatest assassin in the world. You know how it is, when you buy a barbecue you throw a lot of parties for a while to fool yourself into thinking it wasn't a waste of money. To achieve his aim, he has to slice his way through ten colourful boss characters in a trippy ultra-violent yellow submarine-esque odyssey through social satire, in between riding his bike, playing with his kitten and buying trendy clothes in an optional side quest to look as much like an absolute bell end as possible. The open world aspect is illusion, the game is essentially linear, not that there's anything wrong with that. There is, however, something wrong with repetition. After you kill a ranked assassin, you go out into the city to grind yourself retarded. To proceed, you have to cough up a sum roughly equivalent to the street value of three human lungs, so first you take a low-paying part-time job which unlocks some higher-paying assassination submissions, there being lots of overlap in the industries of litter picking and professional murder. Next, you drop into a room with 50 of the same mouthy big girls' blouses you fight absolutely bloody everywhere, and get handed a big bag of money once they're all raining down upon the landscape in a million overconfident bits. Funnily enough, my favourite part of the Between Mission rigmarole is the menial part-time job at the start. Each time, there's a different clever little minigame that tries to make the most of the weak controls. If they were higher-paying, I'd probably have chucked any assassination gigs altogether which can be summed up as mash A until bored, then mash B for a bit instead. Actually, the sword fighting is pretty fun, as it had fucking better be, considering the amount of it we have to do, but there's one aspect of it that makes me want to slap Suda51 until his eyeballs switch places, and that's the fact that after killing an enemy, Travis has a random chance of screaming out the name of one of his favourite puddings and gaining superpowers for a bit. And when you put random chance into combat mechanics, all strategy has been thrown out of the window, then scraped off the ground and used to pick up the broken glass. And then Sod's Law ensures that the enemy who finally gives you a superpower will inevitably be the last one in the room, leaving Travis running around with glowing Dragon Ball Z here for 10 seconds, seriously menacing the walls. The actual gameplay of the ranking boss fights usually boils down to wait for them to attack, block or dodge it, then bitch slap them a few times while they scratch their heads like silly chimps. But the awkward thing about No More Heroes, or at least about reviewing it, is that like Killer7, it's intended to be satirical, and when there are problems with the gameplay, I'm worried that it was intended to be that way as a satire of, I don't know, pretentious video games, and if I were to call it out on that, then I'd lose my credibility with the cool alternative crowd. But then I remember that any game designer who sacrifices fun to make an artistic statement is obviously stuck so far up his own arse that he's in danger of choking on his own 
head. Enough ragging, because in spite of the last eight paragraphs of petulant bird-like warbling, I enjoyed No More Heroes a lot. The unpredictable story and quirky aesthetic kept me fascinated enough to keep ploughing through it just to see what happened next. So I'll say the same thing about No More Heroes that I say about Killer7 and Earthbound and Branston Pickle. As flawed as it is, get it anyway, because you will never experience anything else like it. God knows what would happen if you spread Branston Pickle onto No More Heroes, possibly the universe would end. And it would be awesome. Being British, middle class, and whiter than a snowman with a bukkake fetish, I'm no stranger to cultural guilt, and have ambivalent feelings towards the homeless. On the one hand they're obviously all tragic victims of an uncaring society, but on the other hand they're also tragic victims who smell and shout at me in the street. So I admit to feeling a bit guilty about looking forward to Sega's newest working class bludgeoning simulator, but maybe it's possible to worry too much about this sort of thing while you're caving in a teenage runaway's skull with a bit of old pipe. Thankfully the guilt is assuaged this time around by the main character himself being a homeless rather than a squeaky clean federal agent, thus making the action seem more like a series of entertaining bum fights than a class war. Since the intense teeth splattering scream fest that was condemned, main character Ethan Thomas has gone to the Sam Fisher school of emo haircut transients and become a liquored up broken bottle street fighter, but all is not well in whatever the hell city this is, Ville. Everyone below the C2 demographic has suddenly gone what is medically known as batshit bonkers and have taken to the streets to twat each other with sticks. And then there's the serial killer running around knocking off people who actually matter. As the one remaining competent individual on Earth, Ethan is reluctantly called back into action, and by that I mean set loose in a succession of ruined buildings armed only with a bollard and a bladder full of wild Irish rose. The first condemned was an underappreciated gem featuring a stark portrayal of society's very lowest rung that filled my pants with unrelenting grit and terrified we. It's a rare first person game that emphasises melee combat and an even rarer one that implements it so realistically rather than in most FPSs where you pretty much just hold down the attack button until everything in front of you breaks. You could almost feel the impact going up your arm as you whacked clouds of blood and broken teeth from the gobs of the downtrodden, but getting past all that it was not without its issues. The forensic investigation element was little more than an adventure in instruction following, scarcely more fulfilling than clicking an OK button, and the levels featured fucking retarded doors that would rather snobbily only deign to be smashed open by a particular brand of sledgehammer which you were then called upon to go and fetch from some local murderous junkie's house. Condemned 2 starts on a high note by throwing those dictatorial fetch quests into a bin on the dark side of Mars, and the note only gets higher because forensic investigation now takes the form of challenging little quizzes, and while they do demand that the player know slightly more than is reasonable about blood splatter pattern analysis, you're not punished too much for cocking them up. So if Condemned 2 brushes the two errant turds off the otherwise delicious apple pie of Condemned 1, Condemned 2 must logically be a flawless flaky treat, right? WRONG! And shut up. For a while I was seriously all set to name Condemned 2 as my game of the year, right up until around the halfway point everything was slinky, forensics clever, combat visceral, atmosphere pant wetting. But experience has taught me that while declaring a game shitty because of the first few hours is perfectly valid and completely professional, you should never assume that a good game will stay good. The first warning light flicked on a few hours in when the creepy doll robot suicide bombers showed up, but at that point I didn't think the worst, so the subtlety had been cut down a notch, I can dig it. The second warning light started blinking shortly afterwards in the museum level when I suddenly found myself swinging a broadsword at lads in full medieval armour, but hell it was still reasonable, I'd hardly expect them to be hefting fire extinguishers when swords are available. The warning lights only went off like Blackpool Pleasure Beach when characters started bandying around the phrase ancient mystical cult because I realised I'd been through this before. Condemned 2 is a textbook victim of indigo prophecy syndrome, that's Fahrenheit syndrome in Europe. It's a disease that chiefly afflicts games with a grounding in reality but with a slight supernatural element with sequels at increased risk. The main and most obvious symptom of indigo prophecy syndrome is a plot which in the second half goes what is medically known as snooker loopy, with lesser symptoms including total abandonment of subtlety, the introduction of ancient mystical cults, and the main character pulling hitherto unknown superpowers out of their arse. There's a final boss sequence in Condemned 1 in which you run through a dark claustrophobic labyrinth with the serial killer in hot pursuit. It's really intense and genuinely terrifying, and part of what makes it so effective is that it takes place in a normal house, exactly like Ose for example, yours, right down to the psychotic serial killer who lives under your bed and is standing behind you right now, but don't look because that'll really piss him off. Condemned 2, by contrast, ends on a stupid sci-fi tower thing resembling something the Combine would throw together if they were all drunk, and a piss-easy final boss fight which you win by shouting at him so loud his brain explodes. I wish I was fucking kidding. Condemned 2 had so much going for it, but as I played through it all the things I liked dribbled away one by one. The forensic bits became less frequent and more insipid, the melee combat gave way to shooting and using your fucking retarded Dragon Ball Z Hadouken thing, and the story shits itself inside out. In Condemned 1 it's never explained why the homeless all went kill crazy, and the fact that it was unexplained exacerbated the creepiness. In Condemned 2 it's explained on the first fucking level, some prick nailed noisy hubcaps to the walls that were keeping everyone awake. Thanks Condemned 2, I was almost getting intrigued. This isn't rocket science, mysteries lose all their appeal the instant you explain them. This is why they never explained why Scully never got it on with Mulder, besides the fact that he had the charisma of a cardboard cutout with a bag of sick tape to it. <sighs> I really haven't been looking forward to this. Last week I accidentally left my copy of this game in a friend's console, and I was genuinely pleased. It meant I could review Condemned 2 instead, a game I actually had some interest in. But there comes a time when we all must pay the piper and eat shit's waffles. I don't even know why I'm reviewing this game. Oh wait, yes I do, because you dipshits wouldn't stop crying about it. So I was able to defy the ghettoisation of Australian gamers and acquire an import copy of the game thanks to the charity of some guys at Game, game Traders Robina, which you should probably visit because Game, game Traders Robina is your one-stop shop for games and the trading thereof. 
in Rabina. Now, I am fully aware that SSBB is primarily a multiplayer game and that I can't get away with my usual routine of only playing the single player and attempting weakly to rationalise my fear and disgust of other human beings, so this time I took this game which was incidentally sent to me by Game, game Traders Rabina over to My Friend Guy's house. house to try it out with a bunch of other man children with no prior understanding or interest in Smash Brothers to see how it held up. And the result, a resounding eh. I've never liked most fighting games because I argue there's got to be something wrong with a game in which you can spend 15 years practicing and learning every slightest nuance and still lose to someone randomly smashing buttons. At our grouping, for example, since maybe just under one of us had been boring enough to read the manual, our deathmatches could probably have been faithfully recreated by hurling the controllers down a flight of stairs. But even if we had all gotten our PhDs and wavebird bitch slapping, the fights descended easily into incomprehensible clusterfucks, the characters are so small and the camera zooms out so far, and most of the attacks are such particle effect maelstroms that they might as well just obscure all the action with billowing dust clouds like in the Beano. But maybe I'm approaching this the wrong way. Maybe this isn't a game intended to be played seriously. Perhaps I should just be embracing the spectacle, and I must confess, engineering a scenario in which Mario can brutally beat the stupid out of Princess Peach while the crowd screams for blood is very satisfying, and it would be pretty sweet to watch Solid Snake get Sonic the Hedgehog into an arm lock and slit his throat. Oh wait, we can't, can we? Because those characters aren't unlocked straight away. I hate it when multiplayer games do this. You bring a hot new unreleased title to a party and you're the toast of the evening until you discover that half the fucking content has to be unlocked in single player, and then the toast of the evening becomes a damp square of cold mush. I mean, I know video game developers are all hopeless social rejects, but surely they've gone to at least one party in their life, even if it involved past the parcel. Get this, if you want to be playing as everyone's favourite Azure Attention Deficit Woodland Mammal, you have to play for ten cunt gargling hours. Well, we didn't have ten vagina swilling hours, Nintendo. We had one vodka fueled evening, most of which we probably wouldn't even remember the following morning. Considering lest we forget how prominently Snake and Sonic featured in their fucking hype, there really needs to be a law against this sort of thing, preferably one of those maritime laws that lead to someone getting tied to a mast and flogged. But I suppose if you're hosting the party and have time to prepare, you could always embrace your pathetic friendlessness and go through the single player campaign, which a surprising amount of work has gone into, actually. It's a side-scrolling action platform extravaganza with pre-rendered cinematics up the arse that play like visualisations of the top ten most sickening Nintendo fanfiction circle jerks. And it goes on for bloody hours, mainly because they pull the old bullshit of making you go through all the levels twice, and considering that they're already pretty fucking samey, it deserves some kind of prize for services to pointless repetition. Fuck Solid Snake, they should let you unlock Bill Murray. Of course, the problem with playing it alone is that when you finally do get your mates around, suddenly you've turned into that guy. Don't pretend you don't know what I mean, that guy who's so much better than everyone else at the game because he plays it on his own, the loo. Loser. Suddenly you're not in it for fun anymore, and the goonish grins of your uncoordinated friends fill you with contempt. Soon you seek out other that guys for the sake of a decent challenge, and then you're lost. You're a fanboy. Congratulations, line up for your free t-shirt and cat ears. Actually, that doesn't happen so much with Smash Brothers Brawl, because as we've already established, there's only so good you can get at slapping your palm against a controller like a circus seal. As I've said time and again, Nintendo is a company that is altogether too much wanking off of its old franchises. That might be fine while the Wii is riding high, but all it'll take is a few more virtual boys and they'll wank the whole company away. Some of it gets really obscure, too. Who the fuck is Marth, and why is unlocking him considered a reward? Oh, and thanks Nintendo for putting in a character from Mother 3, a game you're never going to fucking release outside Japan, despite the fact that I can fucking guarantee that more people would play it than Mario Kart 11 billion in the next generation. But really, reviewing Smash Bros. Brawl is pointless. Chances are you already know if you like it. There's a simple test. When the name Nintendo Wii was first revealed, did you ever seriously try to defend it on an internet forum? If yes, you will enjoy this game whatever its faults, and you might as well start spamming my email address with hatred right now, you miserable fanboy twat. Chains of Olympus is a PSP exclusive prequel installment in the God of War series, a bunch of games that combine an at best loose understanding of Greek mythology with a level of violence that hovers somewhere between excessive and completely off its tits. If nothing else, there's no better series for working off frustration, which is handy because I certainly have a lot to work off after I've been playing with a PSP for a while, when my index fingers are locked into hideous hook shapes fit only for picking out the crumbs of filth that gather in the stupid analog pad thing when my thumb keeps slipping off like I'm trying to clumsily finger a robot prostitute, but I digress. There'll be plenty of time to beat on the PSP when I'm capable of making a fist again. This review is probably going to end up as a general retrospective of the entire God of War series because, frankly, review one game if you've reviewed them all. You play pasty historical misery Guts Kratos, a Spartan warrior with a preposterous jawline who works as a sort of independent contractor for the Olympian gods, specialising in killing things that would need to go on a starvation diet for years before they could be classified as humongous. You're hurled into a pitched battle right from the start, just in case you thought you were playing something with a modicum of restraint, and before long it's revealed that one or more gods have gone off the straight and narrow, and it's up to you to brutalise them back into line. On the way, you'll kill enough blameless innocents to fill a decent sized Parthenon, meet a few mythological creatures, and tear their limbs off, and chances are good you'll die and go to Hades at some point, but it's okay, you generally just walk out again. In fact, Kratos does that with such reliability, they might as well install a revolving door. There's some variation early on, but sooner or later every God of War game goes through the same motions. You always end up at the temple of such and such having to prove your worth, which is another thing Kratos has to do with anomalous frequency, makes me wonder why he didn't ask for a signed certificate after the first time. I'm not really sure how I feel about the rigidly unchanging formula though, because while forcing the same Minotaur to give your dagger a terminal blowjob does get old after a while, I'm always the first to cry foul when developers wipe their dicks all over a good thing just for innovation's sake. And there's nothing about God of War that really needs changing, it all fits quite nicely together, like furious bloodstained sticklebricks. Well, okay, there are 
certainly more than a few nitpicks I can make, and I wouldn't be the critic I like to think I am if I didn't furiously pick nits like an amphetamine fueled chimp. The fixed camera gets annoying when there are enemies off screen, at least half the spells and attacks you get loaded down with throughout the game generally prove to be bloody useless. Around weaker enemies, there's really no reason to use anything other than the instant kill grab attack, or as I like to call it, the fuck you button. And there's a terrible habit of having unskippable cutscenes just before really hard boss fights, because obviously after getting our gonads shoved down our throats watching the same tedious dialogue play out a sixth time is just the kind of respite we need. I've just realised I haven't even mentioned what kind of game it is yet, because I assume most viewers already know, but if you're one of those girlfriends of viewers who don't actually play games but likes watching these videos anyway because they secretly want to fuck me, God of War is basically Devil May Cry meets Ray Harryhausen, but with less of the stop motion plasticine of the latter or the smirking bugger cunts of the former. And like Devil May Cry, what we're really here for is the combat, which as I've already said is satisfying to the point of eroticism. There's something almost balletic about Kratos swinging his chains around, disemboweling a succession of gurgling dance partners, and there's actually skill to it. Mashing square and triangle will serve up to a point, but sooner or later you'll have to start learning how to get around attack patterns, you know, like you've actually got a brain and shit. But I think what I like most about the combat is that it fits the character so well. It's like after they finished animating a sequence in which the player bites off a Minotaur's face, they thought to themselves, well there's really no way we can characterise this guy as anything other than a brutal psychotic, so they just rolled with it. He's not particularly deep, and he's not particularly congruous, especially when he starts whining about his poor mistreated family while cutting green healing blobs out of wailing bystanders, but Kratos' sheer unbridled horribleness offers an appealing holiday from our namby-pamby civilised selves, which what with most of us unwittingly living in an emasculated conformist nightmare world is nice to have now and then, if only to stave off suicide for another few hours by running around in our pants mangling passers-by like a human smoothie maker. In a game, I mean. So after all that, let's return to our tissue-thin veneer of consumer advice and talk about whether Chains of Olympus is worth getting. Well, if you felt God of War needed to be about four or five hours longer, then go for it, but you wouldn't be missing much if you held out for a PS2 port. Don't expect anything new, but it's still fun, especially if you picture all the monsters as your childhood bullies. Yes, how do you like that, Brian Payne? We'll see how many dead legs you can give me when you've got a priceless historical artifact sticking out of your bonce. Funnily enough, I don't get direct hate mail as often as you might think. I guess you're all afraid I might ignore you to death, but the Brawl review brought in an unprecedented and yet not entirely unexpected amount of negative feedback, and I thought rather than just dispense bile all the time, it would be nice to sample some for a change, and perhaps also take the opportunity to respond to some of the slightly more valid arguments, so without further ado, go team retard! <laughs> you! SSBB is awesome, I'm pretty sure that the reason you don't like SSBB is that you were crap at it, it's true isn't it, and don't try to blame it on bad controls or opponents having super moves that strike you out in one hit, it's because it took you five hours to figure out up was jump and A was attack, now who's the twat? Well it's certainly not you, because you've just been upgraded to dickhead, and a presumptuous dickhead at that. Actually I don't remember making any reference to bad controls or overpowered super moves in my review, so either you've got the wrong address or you're projecting so hard you could point yourself at a wall and show off PowerPoint presentations, but the accusation of simply being bad at games is one I've fielded before, and while it's true that I've never beaten the Luigi Purple Coin Challenge, I like to think I review for everyone, and considering I've been gaming for most of my life, most average people are going to be even worse than me, and that's a scary thought. By the way, it's alright, you can swear on the internet, your mum probably isn't going to read it, I know because she's too busy being fucked by me. This review, by and large, was pretty poor, just because people want it doesn't mean he should do it, and Yahtzee pretty clearly is and has been nothing more than a professional troll for a good while now. If this entire video wasn't clearly for the purpose of bashing a game he quite clearly doesn't like in the first place, it might actually have been more entertaining than listening to a grown man cry about peer pressure. It's true I didn't like Brawl before I even started playing, but then the same is true of every game, object, animal and human being I encounter these days. Since the internet is almost diametrically opposed to the notion of quality control, in recent years it's been a lot easier to just assume everything's shit until it can prove itself otherwise. I like to call it the Guantanamo Bay approach to reviewing, but as for why I review stuff by popular demand regardless of personal feeling, it's partly because it feels more professional than constant self-indulgence, but mostly because I use my traffic figures to measure my worth as a human being. I like the idea of a professional troll though, it makes me think of a hideous creature under a bridge handing out business cards. This guy is so played out, it must suck not enjoying ANYTHING in life and wasting your time searching for things to hate. Yes, I suppose that would suck, you'll have to tell me what it's like sometime. You suck, suck, at reviewing video games. How can you even call them reviews without a score? It's more of a rant on games that are mainstream. Just because they're mainstream doesn't mean that they suck. You obviously have absolutely no taste in good games. You don't even talk about the game really. If you don't like it, you just point out every little thing that's bad about it. Okay, I put my hands up, he has me there. I do point out every little thing that's bad about a game, but then I'm a critic. It'd be weird if I didn't. If I put people's balls in my mouth for a living, I'd be a prostitute or possibly a GameSpot employee. But I criticise, so I'm a critic, and I don't believe in scores because I don't believe a complex opinion can be represented numerically. You like numbers? How about four? As in, fork you! Do you really need someone in authority giving you a simple yay or nay before you buy anything? Why don't you roll over so they can stamp on the other side of your face? In your entire review, you never said anything about how fun the game is to play with your friends. Perhaps you should lay off the cheap vodka and play the fucking game with some real buddies. Okay, this one confused me. I played it with friends and we didn't have fun, what more do you want? By real buddies I assume you mean people who actually like Smash Bros Brawl, but I don't really regard any people like that as buddies. I prefer to regard them from behind bulletproof two-way looking glass. There wasn't really much of a review here. From a purely objective standpoint, SSBB is actually quite a superb game, as you can tell by reading reviews. I think you should look up the word objective, because I don't think it means what you think it means. It's worth remembering that all reviews are subjective personal opinions, and if you personally enjoy the game then they really shouldn't get to you. Unless of course there's a despicable little niggling doubt in the back of your mind that maybe you're 
you're not having as much fun as you've convinced yourself you're having, which doesn't go away no matter how many times you try to slap it down with the wet flannel of weak excuses like this one. I'm not a fanboy, yes you are, but you may have judged Brawl a bit harassly. Nintendo made it so that the players could have fun mercilessly beating the ever Why am I reminded of the all-purpose theist cop-out argument, God moves in mysterious ways? Nintendo is a big boy now, he doesn't need defending. Small-time curmudgeons like me are not going to reduce anyone who works there to tears and they care even less about you. I've never really understood the almost crusader-like fervor that consoles attract. Most people would say it's because your mum is only prepared to buy you one console and if it turns out you didn't pick the winner, the best thing to do is go into denial until the very fabric of reality spontaneously changes because God knows that's more likely to happen than you admitting fault. Speaking as a person who is white enough to afford all the consoles, this is probably the most balanced generation of all time, with it all coming down to what you personally want from a console. The Wii is an excitable little yappy bastard, good with children but a little exhausting, the PS3 is a big dependable black monster, slow but lovingly bringing in your slippers every morning, and the 360 is just a good all-rounder that only occasionally pisses itself and dies. About a million years ago, a company called DMA Design created Grand Theft Auto and discovered that the combination of controversy, wacky humour and vehicular homicide was a lucrative one indeed, so they made a whole bunch of sequels, threw some TVs out of some hotel windows and changed their name to Rockstar, in a slightly overcompensatory effort to make us forget that they made Lemmings. Not that there was anything wrong with Lemmings, at least not until the franchise was rigorously milked to its last sour lumpy dribbles. Thankfully GTA's teats seem to be remaining plump and fresh for now, with the fourth instalment, or at least the fourth one with a number on the end, apparently thematic indulgences like Vice City and San Andreas don't count, indicating that Rockstar subscribes to the Because I Say So school of sequel numbering, also known as the Resident Evil method. This year's morally flexible everyman is Nico Bellic, an Eastern European mercenary who was last seen helping overthrow the Combine in Half-Life 2 and who arrives as a penniless immigrant in Liberty City. As is always the case with this series, Nico must reach the top by climbing up a big pile of stolen cars, bodies and escort missions. After a couple of jobs in which I drove my friends around and took one of them bowling, I embraced my new country by buying a baseball cap and some sneakers, deep-throating a hot dog and slumping in front of some blisteringly awful television for a few in-game hours. It was at more or less this point that I thought to myself, hang on, am I playing Grand Theft Auto or Grand Theft Normal Boring Life? What's next? The write a letter to your mum mission? So I immediately ran outside, jacked a car and ploughed through two mailboxes and an accountant. Instantly, the nearby policeman, who was clearly as impatient for this as I was, spat out masticated donuts and gave chase. Now we're getting back to what GTA is all about, I thought, as I turned into a pedestrian precinct, the background wailing of sirens adding a melodious backing to the rhythmic snaps of pelvises shattering against my radiator. Unfortunately, while steel lampposts snap off their housing when anything heavier than a kitten leans on them, Mother Nature continues to outdo human technology, and my rampage was brought to an abrupt end by the world's toughest poplar tree, causing Nico to go hurtling through the windscreen in a manner as wintingly painful as it was fucking awesome. But I was desperately attempting to restart the twisted metal salad that used to be my car when I realised I couldn't hear sirens anymore. Yes, it seems now you can shake your wanted level pretty much just by driving away really fast, which you think the police would be prepared for. Lose your pursuers, take a few turnings, and bingo, Nico Bellic model citizen. It makes sense in theory, but I felt somehow defeated as I sulkily went back to my cousin for more escort jobs. Once you inevitably grow tired of the sandbox mayhem and start on the mission paths, you'll find that GTA 4 is initially about as fast-paced as a Jacob Bronowski documentary playing at half speed. The first hundred weight of missions are virtually all tutorials, which highlights the inherent problem with incorporating so many different gameplay elements that you need to spend half the game explaining the bloody things. You have to learn how to drive cars, how to drive trucks, how to drive geese, how to use your phone, TV, internet, how to fist fight, how to gun fight, how to shoot from cover, how to shoot from the back of a giant tyrannosaurus. The game doesn't really kick in for me until you get to the second safe house, and that's easily five to ten hours of gameplay depending on how sandbox happy you are, so this is a game that requires a time commitment, and I mean a big one. If you have a day job, I recommend sticking a pillow up your jumper and claiming maternity leave. Once it gets going though, it's a roller coaster thrill ride, a roller coaster that stops dead every now and again like it's run by British Rail. I'm not sold on the TV channels because unlike the radio stations, they can't be heard while driving, and hence come across as the game trying to distract you from actually playing it, like it's got confidence issues or something. Then there's the mechanic wherein you keep friendly with characters by taking them out drinking into shows and shit. I'm not sure what, if anything, it's all in aid of, but what with most people in the GTA universe committing three murders before breakfast, I've been trying to stay friendly with everyone I can. And what that entails is between every mission I have to give someone a call, drive over to their place, pick them up, drive them somewhere else, pretend to enjoy myself for half an hour, then drive them back. It's just an irritating, mindless chore. It's like we're getting off the roller coaster every five minutes to touch up the paintwork. GTA 1 was so wacky it was practically set in Toontown, and as recently as Vice City, the feel was still exaggerated and colourful. Since then, though, the series has taken a right turn at the corner of gritty and realism, which I'm not convinced is the best direction for it. As seems to be common with the current generation, realism means the graphics look like I'm viewing them through a used coffee filter. What isn't brown is grey, and what isn't grey is too dark to make out. I thank Christ for the automatic lock-on in the firefights because all the enemies are indistinct dark blobs in an indistinct dark blob factory. The driving feels more realistic, but with that slower and heavier, with all my attempts at handbrake turns resulting in spinning out like a merry-go-round. And by the way, avoid the PS3 version because those marshmallow shoulder triggers certainly don't help, and the six axis is, as always, about as much use as smashing your hand between two bricks. But I think my biggest disappointment is that we're back in dreary old surrogate New York again, because all the way back to the GTA London expansion pack, a lot of the appeal of the series has been the transplantation of the wacky gun fun into new settings like Vice City and San Andreas. Don't get me wrong, strip away the ancillary bullshit and GTA 4 is really good, I mean I'm going to play with it some more after I'm finished reviewing and that's fucking unprecedented, but frankly I'm going to reserve my enthusiasm for when they announce Grand Theft Bigglesuede.
Now that we've left GTA 4 in the dust and MGS 4 is still an overly verbose spec on the horizon, we enter the time of year known as the season of bugger alls coming out. Too far from Christmas to be of any interest to publishers, so the flow of big name titles slows to the point that internet game critics can relax a bit and indulge themselves with reviews of old games that interest them and no one else. Either to bring exposure to an underappreciated gem or add a few bitch slaps that it managed to escape the first time around, so let's talk about a game I found in a bin. Painkiller is a first person shooter from 2004 by Polish developer People Can Fly, perhaps best known for their previous title ET for the Atari 2600. Not really, of course. Painkiller is the only game by People Can Fly which makes it all the more amazing that Painkiller is fucking awesome and can kick the ass of most big name mainstream titles and have them for breakfast afterwards. Which is a shame because if the game blew goats I could have made a funny joke like Painkiller you'll certainly need one. Painkiller is in the same bucket as Serious Sam and the original Dooms in that it serves as an antidote to Fancy Pants complex modern FPSing. There are no stealth elements, no key hunting, no escort quests, no dorky support characters dribbling in your ear roll, no mission objectives besides kill everyone. There's just you, some guns and the entire population of Murder Town between you and where you need to be. It's pure genocidal fun which many FPS developers these days seem to think is somehow beneath them. Some people refer to Painkiller as the unofficial Doom 3, since the actual Doom 3 tripped over something in the dark, banged its head and forgot that it wasn't System Shock. I'm not about to shake my walking stick and say FPSs were a lot better before they started putting on airs, but it is worth remembering that sometimes all we want is the relentless catharsis of old school action gaming blended with the immersive greyish brown of current generation technology. And that's a niche Painkiller fills beautifully, it hangs out in the rough side of FPS town where keycard puzzles don't venture for fear of getting curb stomped. That's not to say Painkiller is nothing but murdering tons of dudes, there's a series of unlockable bonus cards that make it easier to murder tons of dudes, there's a soul collecting game gameplay element that results in a new and interesting way to murder tons of dudes. Okay, so maybe it is nothing but murdering tons of dudes, but it does it so well, what more could you want? You can explore the levels and hunt for secret rooms and treasures if you really must, but if more than a minute passes without a dude and a murder, you're not playing it right. It's like after the developers were resigned to making an unsophisticated shooter, they vowed to make it the most stylish unsophisticated shooter ever, and spent all the leftover escort mission and fetch quest money on tarting it up. Levels range disjointedly from giant cathedrals to military bases, and the level design gives me a big fat architectural stiffy. There are over 50 distinct varieties of dude to murder, all amazingly well designed, they don't give me any kind of stiffy though, that would be gay. The weapons are a bold effort to escape the usual lineup of melee, pistol, shotgun, machine gun, rocket launcher, overpowered exotic thing that you never get ammo for and only use in boss fights anyway. The default melee weapon is the titular painkiller, a rotating blade arrangement perfect for forecasting light showers of body parts and reenacting the lawnmower scene from the movie Brain Dead. That's dead alive if you're American and fat. As for the guns, I could mention the hugely satisfying penis extension gun that pins baddies to walls with entire trees, but all you really need to know is that there's a gun that shoots shurikens and lightning. I wish I could make something like that up, it shoots shurikens and lightning, it could only be more awesome if it had tits and was on fire. Amazingly there is a story, contained entirely within overlong between mission cinematics in which concern a man resembling a shaved bear, whose life is a cavalcade of success and happiness and sunshine and flowers, before he takes one too many lingering looks at his sexy wife and smacks straight into a truck. Wifey goes to heaven while our hero goes to purgatory because God wants him to kill the generals of Satan's army who are trying to invade through some graves and bloody bloody blood. The story is entirely needless and entirely forgotten during the actual gameplay, but you wouldn't think it the way the cinematics bang on and on, emptying huge dustbins full of half-baked expositional dialogue into our screaming faces because they were determined to crowbar this shit in somewhere. Now I'm one of the first advocates of games as art, so I like a good narrative, but any game in which you can make all of an enemy's limbs fly off in different directions is already a work of art. There are certainly plenty of criticisms aside from the fact that the storyline can go fuck itself, the criteria to unlock the bonus cards are obnoxiously difficult in some levels, souls take ages to emerge from the corpses so if you're trying to collect them then you have to hang around your conquered foes twiddling your thumbs which breaks the flow somewhat, the AI is pathetic with enemies often getting stuck behind scenery while you throw bits of rolled up newspaper and laugh, but any criticism I find is immediately quashed when I remember that one of the guns shoots shurikens and lightning. So that's pain killer, more proof that the best way to blow off steam is to blow off someone's nadges. I know what you're going to say, Yahtzee, reviewing a JRPG, perhaps I shall quickly look outside to make sure the sky is not falling and the seas are not running red with blood, ho he ho he ho. Well you smarmy cunt, I had heard that the world ends with you does things differently to most JRPGs and while I took that with mountainous piles of salt I was intrigued when I noticed that it came out in the PAL regions before America so I thought if the release dates are from Bizarro World maybe the entire game is too and will turn out to be the first good JRPG. Sadly this uncharacteristic optimism started draining when I saw the box art and noticed that all the characters are undernourished teenage androgenes who do their hair in the morning by sticking their heads in buckets of lead-based paint and dress like they stepped on a landmine in a trendy clothes shop. But let's be fair, once I started playing I found it does do things differently to most JRPGs, it just doesn't do enough things differently. Things started well when I immediately identified with the main character, a sullen hate-filled misanthrope, but sadly the developers seemed to think these were negative qualities, so before he could ascend the nearest clock tower he was roped into a mysterious Challenge Annika-esque game where he has to complete arbitrary challenges on the streets of Shibuya or die, and he has to team up with a partner, partly to make the most of the DS dual screen, but mostly to teach him a valuable life lesson about friendship and acceptance and everything else Sesame Street used to bang on about whenever Cookie Monster wasn't around. A major thing that turns me off JRPGs, and a lot of games in general, is when I don't feel that I, as a player, am contributing anything to the story. All I ever seem to do is wheel the characters from one whingy, boring dialogue to the next. Events are driven by their actions, not mine. All I am is a little angry id who takes over for the combat, spending the rest of the time jumping up and down in the back of the main character's mind, yanking on nerve endings, trying to make him stop acting like a pillock. I'll show you what I mean. At one point in the second part of the game I was given the clue 30 plus 74. Assuming your brain is located inside your skull and not your rectum, you can probably hazard 
said that this adds up to 104, which was the pretentious name of a pretentious clothes shop near my starting location. But I couldn't actually go there because the street was closed off. It only opened after I went to another nearby location and sat through another dialogue heavy cutscene in which I was boldfacedly told the answer to the puzzle. This is not interactive storytelling, this is just reading. I know Japan has a very different culture to the West, but I will never understand why they like the visual novel style of game so much. The porno ones I can sort of understand, at least there's the promise of titties to keep you motivated, but most of them play like choose your own adventure books with half the pages ripped out, which kind of goes against the whole idea of gaming. What I'm saying is that I like games where the story and gameplay go hand in hand, while in most JRPGs the story and gameplay are kept either side of a wrought iron fence made of tigers. Getting through the cutscenes is like eating a bucket of wallpaper paste, but once you finally struggle down the last few spoonfuls and move on, the combat is probably the best thing about the game, mainly because it's not turn-based and there are no random encounters. Two automatic gold stars in the special school that is the genre. Before fighting, you select a handful of badges that represent different attacks and activate them in battle by drawing on the touchscreen in their designated ways. The game does tend to frequently mistake one frantic scribble for another, and it seems to get really sniffy about what constitutes a circle, but chances are you'll find there's a handful of attacks that work well together that you can pretty much get through the whole game using nothing but and let every other pin gather dust in the green room. An aspect that doesn't work so well is the fact that the game expects you to switch rapidly between two screens and two entirely different control systems throughout the combat, and I couldn't get the hang of it. Maybe my mind isn't as vast and evolved as JRPG fans, but it was just too much of a clusterfuck, and this is coming from someone who can beat Psycho Billy Freakout on Expert. Fortunately, the computer will take over the other character if you can't be asked, and you'll get pretty much the same results, which just hangs a big question mark over the point of it all. Speaking of which, there's also a fashion trend system that changes your stats a bit if you wear the right label clothing and badges in the right parts of the city. I never really noticed any of it making much of a difference to gameplay, but I want to rag on it anyway because A, fashion victims are one step below nematode worms in the grand scheme of things, and B, like many ancillary JRPG elements, you need a fucking strategy guide spread across your thighs to make the most of it, and the only thing I like spread across my thighs is marshmallow fluff. But let's get down to it. Is Twewi a good JRPG? I have absolutely no idea. I feel like I'm on the edge of a frightening world I don't understand, treading water on the surface of a deep, deep lake full of weird-smelling creatures with completely alien concepts of fun and a tolerance for boredom to rival the man in the iron mask. There's too much dialogue, the characters are the same shallow stocks you get in every JRPG, and most of the gameplay outside the main story quest amounts to a big old grind sandwich. But working from the principle that these are all selling points for the intended audience, it's got an original aesthetic and the combat is okay, so if you're into this sort of thing, check it out. Now I have to go play an FPS before my body finishes absorbing my testicles. You know me, I'm a twitchy instant gratification kind of gamer, the sort who isn't happy unless there's a gun the size of a motorbike in his hands and a severed alien willy bouncing off the front of his space helmet, but every now and again the planets will align and I'll be affected by weird cosmic rays and suddenly all I want to do is play a nice fantasy RPG, not a JRPG, god no, it's just space radiation, not the infinite power of Christ, but a western RPG, something with goblins and swords and men in loincloths going on about winches, so this time I pumped steroids into my video cards and had a crack at oblivion. My only previous experience with the Elder Scrolls series was a brief spell of Morrowind during the previous planetary alignment, in which I ran around some muddy countryside in the rain for a few hours fending off weird subhuman creatures, so basically it was just like Glastonbury Festival. In oblivion you start off in a dungeon in the Imperial Palace, you're never told what crime you committed, I guess you're supposed to fill in that blank for yourself, so I choose to believe I was in there for shagging the Emperor's wife and daughter at the same time while playing a rock guitar solo on the desecrated corpse of God. Anyway, then the Emperor showed up, played by Captain Picard, and I have to say I liked him a lot, he was the only character who actually seemed to know they were in a fantasy RPG. He took one look at me, noticed the camera floating behind my head, and said, oh bugger, you're the protagonist, guess I have to die now. And die he did, but not before giving me the address of a mate of his for a vital and world-saving quest I could maybe think about following in between looting bodies and fast travelling. I'd chosen to play as a Nord, a race of brave William Wallace types big on football violence, and I picked specialisation in swords and heavy armour, partly out of a total lack of creativity, but mostly because I tried playing a mixed class in Morrowind and found that switching between magic and weapons mid-battle was as smooth and intuitive as shifting from fifth to reverse in a car with a missing gear lever. Oblivion's interface, however, seems a lot more user-friendly, for a PC RPG anyway, I still had to check the manual to figure out how to fucking drop things, but if you can at least swing a sword without cutting your own legs off, then it's still a hell of a lot more intuitive than anything Richard Garriott ever made. But even if Oblivion had the most perfect interface ever devised and dispensed milk and cookies while cooing gentle reassurances in a soft motherly voice, it would still be condemned by its biggest flaw. Let me tell you about Immersion. Immersion is when you go for a midnight walk after a weekend marathon of Thief 2 and catch yourself looking for your visibility gem. Immersion is when you're playing Condemned and your cat suddenly jumps onto your lap, only to be immediately launched off by a reflexive cannon-like blast of terrified piss. If a game can truly draw you in, it can make up for a lot of flaws. Take something like Assassin's Creed, so stuffed with bad design choices they were leaking out of its paws, but I didn't despise it because Assassin's Creed presents itself so well, and if you go into it with the right mindset it'll suck you in like a thousand dollar whore. Immersion can save the life of a bad game, and inversely, a lack of immersion can be a dogshit bullet right between the eyes. For a game that is obviously trying so hard, Oblivion is one of the least immersive RPGs I've ever played. The world map is huge, granted, if you intend to walk from one end to the other you'd better pack a few sandwiches, but frankly take one good look around the moment you first emerge blinking into the daylight and you've pretty much seen everything. It's like they took 200 square yards of medieval English countryside, added a few wolves, then copy-pasted it until it was roughly the size of Yorkshire. Fortunately you can bypass the insipid landscape and instantly teleport to anywhere you want, but that defeats the point of having a huge game world in the first place. I really hate to say this, but compared to that electronic smack addiction World of Warcraft, 
Minecraft. Every territory has different terrain, colours and monsters and the fast travel system, while badly in need of an in-flight movie, at least gives the impression of a huge epic world. Oblivion by comparison might as well be entirely taking place in the same fucking meadow. And then there are the characters. They all have this weird, stiff, unreal quality about them, indicating that Cyrodiil is apparently located inside the Uncanny Valley. And that's before you try to talk to them. Besides the main characters, there are about 100 million individuals with maybe two actual personalities between them, neither of which are particularly well characterised. One crazy beggar woman switched between a grackle drawl and a well-spoken aristocratic tone from line to line, so either she's pulling a very inept con or the dialogue assignment is fucked. The attempt to create a procedurally generated NPC conversation system was courageous, but then so is jumping into a skip full of used syringes. The tiny number of voice actors just makes it laughable, with characters frequently found conversing with themselves about how much they enjoy buying from the shop owned by themselves. On top of that, the endlessly repeated lines are so badly written and awkwardly delivered it's like you're trapped in a middle school amateur dramatics production of The Lord of the Rings adapted for stage by a deaf budgerigar. Oblivion might be incredibly deep and full of interesting quests that all end with foxy night elves giving you soapy titwanks, but it's all for naught because it just won't let me in. Whenever I thought I was starting to lose myself in the experience, some NPC would get stuck on a paving stone or force me to feed them that stupid conversation pie and I'd come crashing back to reality where I am nothing more than an Anglo-Australian tit trying to outsmart a cloud of ones and zeros. The root of the problem is simply that they try too hard to impress us, so if nothing else remember this. Spinning a plate on a stick is impressive, but try to spin three at once and you'll just end up digging porcelain out of your face. I think it's safe to say that very few people were madly trampling babies underfoot to grab haze on launch day. I know whatever atrophied dregs of enthusiasm I had breathed their last when I glanced at the back of the box and saw that it was an outdoor first person shooter about space marines. Whoopsie fucking do, I thought. I look forward to the vehicle section with horrible steering and spending half the game hiding under a table waiting for my health to regenerate. But then up popped the hateful little angel on my shoulder who spends most of his time talking me out of buying a Cornetto every time I pass a 7 Eleven. Shame on you, Benjamin Yahtzee Sebastian Godzilla Croshaw, spake he. Have you forgotten Call of Duty 4 already? You should give every game a chance to surprise you, or you're no better than those dipshits who never played Mass Effect but condemned it as some kind of child-corrupting boob extravaganza. I had to concede the point, and it's not like there are many other new games to talk about unless I want to start oiling up my thighs for Age of Conan. So, Hayes. There's this impossibly well-equipped corporate army thing who don't represent the United States, honest, who invade some South American country and hit upon the world-beating idea of making their soldiers fight battles in a jungle environment with a bunch of glowing yellow lights strapped to their bodies. You start off fighting for the camouflages for sissies crowd, but about halfway through you realise that the huge faceless corporation who controls their infantry with addictive drugs might possibly be a teensy bit on the amoral side and decide that blindly following all orders is a mugs game, whereupon you defect the opposing guerrilla army to blindly follow their orders instead. An unusual plot twist which would probably have had greater impact were it not given away on the back of the fucking box. The story is deeper than the usual kill everyone who is different to us military shoot affair, which I do appreciate. At the start of the game your colleagues are a bunch of psychotic macho dicks, and it was a relief to find that I was supposed to think that, because I thought the same thing about my heroic squad mates in Halo, Crisis, Turok, Quake 4, and pretty much every game in which large men stand around comparing willies. The main character of Hayes is characterised not as a wisecracking walking armoury who lactates testosterone, but a naive whinging college boy soldier who can't function without mugs of warm milk and the occasional cuddle, which gets a bit incongruous after he's mowed down enough people to populate Mozambique. The overall message of Hayes' story is that war is bad and there are no true heroes when death is on the menu, but combining that with whiz-bang shooty fun strikes me as trying to have one's cake and eat it, a phrase I'd never really understood. I mean, I think it's perfectly reasonable to want to eat a cake that you have. There's not much else you can do with a cake except maybe hide in one if you're a stripper. Sorry, lost my train of thought. Hayes is a game that can't decide what existing FPS it wants to rip off the most. Halo is the obvious candidate, it's even got the same title, give or take two letters, and the driving sections are identical, right down to the design of the gravitational challenged vehicles and the mounted turrets manned by tragic sufferers of the stupid virus. There's also a rusty old cargo ship level for fans of the one from Condemned 2, a very Quake 2-esque smelting plant, and most of the rest of the environments are straight out of the Crytek games, although it forgets the crucial jaw-dropping graphics aspect, as can be evidenced by the hilarious 2D map backdrops during the transport scenes that look like some guys are running past the chopper holding up cardboard forests on sticks. Hayes's one claim to not being the work of jaded hacks who could easily be replaced with a computerised FPS generator is the whole addictive drug business. When you're plugged into the heroin matic you can occasionally give yourself a quick fix to help out in battle, which strangely does not manifest as bullet time. Pretty much all it does is make the enemies light up like Christmas trees, which is admittedly pretty useful with current generation graphics being what they are, but then of course since drugs are bad, this all goes in the bin the moment you join the other side. Here a golden opportunity to deconstruct the genre by switching out the damage tanking gun fun for sneaky guerrilla warfare is tragically missed, when ultimately the only change is that the team switch jerseys. Your new rebel allies suddenly gain the same regenerative powers your former squadmates did, whose powered armour simultaneously gains an inconvenient weakness to bullets. The nicest thing I'm prepared to leak from my cake all about Haze is that it's at least functional, which is more than I can say for Turok. But it's insultingly short and easy for a game that costs 110 Australian dollars, money which could have bought a lot of Cornettos. If you have a liking for Halo, a crippling fear of trying new things, and a desperate need to get rid of all your money very fast, then you should probably think about getting yourself sectioned, but until then you might as well buy Haze, you mad bastard.
It's funny how things stop being funny the longer you live with them. Everyone in Britain stops sniggering at the name Spotted Dick by the time they turn 12. I've almost completely forgotten that Nintendo named a console after a bodily fluid, and it's funny how we can now hear the words Solid Snake without picturing the kind of throbbingly powerful erections you get from wearing skin-tight combat suits while hanging around women who never do their shirts up properly. Yes, Metal Gear Solid has joined Devil May Cry, Grand Theft Auto, and Resident Evil in the elite group of series that have current generation installments with shiny glistening graphics and titles with fours on the end. The series sells itself right there under the title as Tactical Espionage Action, which implies a gritty pulse-pounding sneaky bollocks run around, and while that's certainly present, it always seems to be occupying the same space as a stiff and inefficient third-person shooter and the paranoid manifesto of an internet conspiracy theorist with several gunmen short of a grassy knoll. I'm going to recount as much of the story as I can before my brain starts to hurt. Solid Snake is a cloned mercenary who is suffering from premature aging due to a planned obsolescence scheme worthy of Microsoft. He lives with his support character and best friend Otacon, and the two of them have adopted a child together. That oozing sound you just heard was made by all the world's homoerotic fanfiction writers simultaneously emitting torrents of hot ladies. Spunk. Anyway, Solid Snake is tasked with the assassination of his evil cloned brother, who is dead, but lives on through his possessed arm, which was grafted onto the body of- Oh Christ, I can't go on, this shit is bananas. Play the games yourself if you want to know what's going on, although I can't guarantee that that'll be enough. To truly get into the mindset of Hideo Kojima, you'll have to do something pretty drastic, probably involving experimental brain surgery and a complete X-Files box set. Kojima's problem is that while he's very much aware that games are a new and exciting medium for getting a message across, he doesn't have much patience for the whole game aspects. In the past, I've slagged off a lot of story-based games for having too much story and not enough game, but all those previous titles swiftly disappear beneath the waves of Metal Gear Solid's verbal diarrhea. I actually timed how long it took from pressing new game to engaging my first enemy. 23 cocking minutes, and this is supposed to be the fast-paced action hook to draw you in. Further on, some dialogues are long enough to warrant an intermission and refreshment counter, and most of them consist of the characters learning things that most of the audience figured out by the first trailer. The funniest part is, I was diligently sitting through all the cutscenes and I still wasn't sure what was going on. Somebody once said that a politician is a person who can talk for hours and never actually say anything. If that's true, Hideo Kojima could run for government and be emperor of the universe by mid-afternoon. Afternoon. Every now and again, though, the game snaps you out of your exposition-induced trance and begrudgingly lets you actually play it for a bit, and in these moments the gameplay is adequate but severely cluttered, like it's suffering from the gaming equivalent of Asperger's Syndrome. The sneaking works well, but they load you down with a toy box full of gimmicky stealth tools and techniques that you will never ever need to use, because you start off with a silenced tranquilizer pistol that can knock out enemy soldiers in one shot and never runs out of ammo, breaking the stealth gameplay over its knee with a sickening crack. There isn't even much sneaking to do compared to previous games, when you're not tripping over cutscenes the emphasis is more on the action than the tactical espionage, although it seems no one explain this to the gameplay programmer, the controls are much better suited for sneaking and when action takes over a million petty annoyances nibble at your shins. Having to press both shoulder buttons and triangle to aim and fire is not good design, and when you're ducking behind cover you have to stand up before you can fire back, which is a good way to get your moustache perforated. When you desperately need to immediately return fire, it takes a crucial agonising second to get Snake to ready his gun, presumably for fear of breaking a hip. Luckily this is compensated by most of the enemies being legendarily thick and armoured with papier-mâché. This is the part where I make gentle coups and reassurances to soften the game up before I drive the last stake through its heart. For all its frustrations, the gameplay is never flawed enough to be a deal breaker, and if you're prepared to forgive the heavy cutscene to gameplay ratio, the characters are well-rounded and imaginative enough to keep you interested. But here comes the killing blow, children. Metal Gear Solid is, and has always been, very badly written, in the same way that the world's largest pie couldn't honestly be called a good pie because it's uneconomical and probably wouldn't fit in an oven. So much of the dialogue is redundant and is in dire need of an editor, preferably one armed with waders and pruning shears. I think it's safe to say that if you're not already a fan, you're not welcome at the MGS4 party. The game assumes you know and have accepted all the bullshit that's come before, and all the characters who haven't had a poignant death soliloquy yet show up, whether we like it or not, including Mr. and Mrs. Oh Christ Not You Cunts Again from Metal Gear Solid 2. And since I hate redundant dialogue so much, I won't redundantly say that fans should buy it, because if you're a fan you've already bought it, finished it, written a plot analysis guide for Game Facts, and are now hiding behind my house trying to decide which window to break. As for the rest of you, play through the previous games first and then check it out, assuming they don't bore you so hard that even your unborn children take up tabletop gaming. The thought occurs that for all my banging of the games are art drum, art is only as good as the culture that surrounds it. A game could give the most extraordinary emotional experience in the entirety of human culture and bring tears to the eyes of a jaded war veteran with no eyes, but it's all for naught if it's not surrounded by self-important bearded tossers who read too much into things for a living, and since I'm one of gaming culture's alpha self-important bearded tossers, I thought I'd discuss the trend of internet gaming humour, and by that I mean the trend of gaming webcomics, and by trend I mean plague. So you've looked at Penny Arcade, seen the massive amounts of money, prestige and money those guys get for nine panels a week, and decided that you want in on that. Many gaming webcomic artists have thought the exact same thing, in fact let's not beat around the bush, all gaming webcomic artists, except Penny Arcade obviously. The first thing to do is to be or move in with someone who can draw, forcefully if necessary. If you don't know anyone who can draw, and you yourself draw like a flipper-handed freak child who just discovered MS Paint, don't fret, just write excessive amounts of dialogue and hide the hideous art with huge speech bubbles. If you don't know how to draw or write, are a functionally retarded quadruple amputee and can only communicate by banging your head against a Wacom tablet, that's still no reason to quit. You can wipe your ass with a page of Mega Man sprites, and there'll still be someone on Comic Genesis who'll tell you that it's brilliant. The next thing you need to do is create your main character, and since it's important to write what you know, the main character will obviously be you. But while you are a repressed, socially retarded dullard, 
Bard, who no one would ever honestly admit to liking, your author insertion character is a fantasy, so they will be a charismatic eccentric who is unconditionally loved by everyone even while he's setting their dog on fire. The secondary character is the straight man, whose job it is to play comic foil to the other character's bullshit and inexplicably tolerate his behaviour when any sane person would be checking the rooms to rent pages with one hand and slamming the idiot's face in a drawer with the other. The third character is the girl. You know girls, those mysterious creatures you see on the bus who have their own bathrooms and spray stingy liquid in your face. If you don't know much about girls because your conversations with them don't last for more than a few minutes before the police are called, just use your mum as a frame of reference, characterising the female as a disapproving eye-rolling nanny who tolerantly wipes up the whoopsies of the idiot man-children and chastises them with the occasional spanking. And since your ego should be swelling nicely by this point, she should also become the main character's girlfriend somehow because she finds something adorable about the way he gets hypnotised by her breasts. Now you have to make your comic funny, and reading most existing webcomics one could be forgiven for thinking that humour is entirely optional, but believe it or not there are people who laugh at that stuff even if it's just the author's mum. Fortunately the advantage of running a gaming webcomic is that gaming humour is incredibly easy. All you have to do is apply video game logic to the real world for comic effect. For example, in say Gears of War you have to push the analog stick to move forward when in real life you have to continually put one foot in front of the other. This might not sound like A material, but trust me, phrase this right and there's a fortune to be made in cafe press shirts. If that doesn't work, go for the edgy crowd and do a comic implying that Mario does Luigi up the arse. And if that doesn't work, just go on about the cake being a lie. So, now your comic is squatting on the internet like a sewage plant on the River Thames, but you're still not popular because you're competing with every other hack with a PlayStation and a Messiah complex, so how do you stand out against the crowd? Well, you're forgetting the most important ingredient, drama. I'm not talking about dramatic storylines, although that can certainly be part of it. Let's say for sake of example that you're sick of making companion cube jokes and suddenly do a serious storyline about your female character having a miscarriage. Obviously you'd need to have several blood clots in your brain to think this is a good idea, you're established as a wacky humour comic so this is going to be an awkward tonal shift at best and hugely disrespectful of the subject matter at worst. You're most hardcore supporters will feebly attempt to go along with you on this, smiling nervously at each other as they would around a mentally unstable friend with a shillelagh, but mean-spirited embittered cocks are going to call you out on it. At this point there are many ways you can respond, I don't see you doing anything better, I can do whatever I want with my comic, you're just jealous because I get more readers, and other equally flawed arguments, but above all else never admit defeat because the bigger a douche you are the more traffic you get as spectators line up to see you jump around the monkey cage screaming and flinging your poo. Drama is the mortar that holds the webcomic community together and there are so many wonderful ways to create it, make absolutely no effort to improve your horrible drawing style, act like a prick at a convention, respond to constructive criticism with hostility, and just generally behave like the kind of monstrous egotist that blossom like mushrooms in the darkened trough of shit that is the internet. And if anyone really pisses you off, to pick them in your comic as a ridiculous straw man and mock them with infuriating self-righteousness. You know, kind of like exactly what I'm doing now. So your gaming webcomic package is complete. All that's left to do is gather it all together and throw it in a fucking bin because you're a talentless cultural pollutant who deserves to suffocate to death on a bag of porridge. There comes a time when you have to stop ignoring something, a lesson that could well have been learned by those people who live next door to Auschwitz and thought all the smoke was coming from an unusually screamy pie factory, which by the obvious link of Nazi Germany brings me effortlessly to Lego Indiana Jones. I've been ignoring the whole Lego LucasArts coalition so far, partly because as you'll recall from my Psychonauts review, LucasArts is run by douchebags, but mainly because it sounds utterly retarded on paper. I mean once you accept Lego Star Wars, where does it end? Playmobil Battlestar Galactica? Duplo Firefly? Meccano Dune? Yeah I'm done milking that joke. I guess at first I'd- wait I've got another one! Sticklebricks Babylon 5? Sorry. I guess at first I'd filed Lego Star Wars in my massive brain database under the same heading as Barbie Horse Adventures and Bratz Hey Kids Let's All Dress Like French Tarts, cheapo toy tie-ins for harassed mothers to buy their shit-faced spawn every time they pass through a Walmart in an ongoing quest to give in to their every demand and turn them into the kind of entitled spoiled fuck spots who are virtually guaranteed lucrative acting careers in Hollywood. But now that the series has three games and people I sometimes pretend to respect have said that they might actually be fun, I thought I'd better go undercover, drill holes into my head until I'm mentally 12 years old and try out the new flippity gombo splitch. Lego Indiana Jones is exactly what it says on the tin. It's it's a heavily summarised retread of the first three Indiana Jones movies, or should I say the only three Indiana Jones movies, and if anyone tries to correct me you are wrong and should be punched, with all the characters replaced by choking hazards for the under fives. Obviously Indiana Jones is a different kettle of chimps to Star Wars though, what with all the death and face melting and all that business with the monkey brain, so the most sofa hiding moments of the trilogy are toned down to be kid friendly, Lego characters being as unfazed by dismemberment as the drugged up prostitutes in my van. Don't write it off as a kiddie game though, it's important to understand the distinction between kiddie and fun for all the family. The latter is stuff anyone can enjoy as long as they're not the kind of slack George sociopath in waiting who refuses to look at any game that doesn't have at least three police officers worth of blood on screen at all times. So if you're a child or possess the necessary brain damage to be the equivalent of one, you'll find Lego Indiana Jones to be colourful and full of lovely shiny objects to keep your laughably small brain occupied. As for adults and clever clogs, some of the attempts at humour fall a bit flat but if you take a step back, there's this undercurrent of parody about the whole experience which I find rather cathartic. I guess it's because we're taking a film series which prided itself in unexpectedly traumatising me as a child and totally emasculating it like if there was a puppet show version of The Ring. The gameplay is where the game starts to soil it 
itself, but in small manageable ways like a budgerigar. It's based around platforming and Zack and Wiki-esque adventure puzzles in which Indiana Jones and one of his mates use whatever resources are available to get to the level exit, defeat a boss, and or fill their plastic pockets with enough Spanish gold to sink the Lusitania. The support characters all have their own unique skills to bring to the fray, but their main job is to irritate you. Standing on a platform you're trying to occupy and knocking you off into death pits is their favourite trick, which only gets more hilarious when the game which seems to be in on this gleefully respawns you in such a way that you slide straight back into spiky failure. Thankfully you can kill your partners as many times as you like and the game won't punish you for it and let me tell you, brutally beating short round into a pile of bloody plastic giblets 14 times removes all feelings of antipathy you've ever had towards the character. Depending on how charmed you are by the overall feel, the combat is either lacklustre or a flaming pile of arse. A brave attempt is made to evoke the feel of Indiana Jones-esque brawls by letting you throw chairs and bottles around, but I guarantee that the auto-targeting system will ignore the gun-wielding blood-crazed Nazi in favour of latching indelibly onto the crumbs of cheese upon the whiskers of a nearby mouse. There's really no reason to use anything other than the bare fists, which can swiftly reduce any enemy to tiny component parts that your dad will later painfully discover by walking around the living room carpet barefoot. At this point the game says, what's that? You favour bare fists? Well fuck you with great big handfuls of rusty nuts and bolts, you consumer tart, because you're going to use whatever tool you happen to be carrying as a melee weapon. Oh, you want to know how to drop the tool? Well you can't, so suck it. Then the game jumps around snapping his bum and laughing, but I don't let him get to me because for committing the cardinal sin of infinitely respawning enemies I know the game will be condemned to the deepest circle of video game hell. But while an eternity being cock slapped with the colossal pointy death wang of the adversary is a fate richly deserved by George franchise aside Lucas, Lego Indiana Jones could possibly be forgiven for a lot. Multiply the Indiana Jones nostalgia facts by how much you enjoy adventure game scavenger hunts and divide by the number of times falling off the floating platform levels in Mario Sunshine made you want to slice your own face open with a broken wavebird controller and you'll get a number which somehow corresponds to how much I recommend Lego Indiana Jones. I'm not a mathematician obviously but I have fun with it and so might you. It'll certainly tide you over while we wait for the really hot release, Fuzzy Felt Deep Space Nine. I make a policy of never reading other people's reviews because it can taint my own recollection of a game and because I'm increasingly certain that I'm the only person on earth whose brain works properly. But it's been pretty difficult to avoid the popular opinion of Alone in the Dark, what with it apparently being the latest in a long line of worst games ever are and responsible for the deaths of several of my correspondents' families, judging by the way they tearfully email me requesting that I verbally assassinate it. Well, I thought, fuck those bereaved bastards who think I'm some kind of sweary ninja for hire, I'm gonna play Alone in the Dark and damn well try to like it. A few days have passed since then and you may be surprised to learn that sometimes even the majority can be totally, totally right. So Edward Carnby from the very first Alone in the Dark is somehow still alive and thankfully no longer made out of folded crepe paper and wakes up in modern day New York with a bad case of plot convenient amnesia and being hunted by rips in the wallpaper. Then all restrained gets tearfully bade farewell and put on a bus to Azerbaijan when a load of buildings blow up and Edward finds himself forced to fight against his standard satanic apocalypse scenario while coming up with several contrived excuses to drive cars over ramps in slow motion, creating a feel somewhere between the Prince of Darkness and the Dukes of Hazard. He gets joined by a female sidekick who sweeps the horrible game character awards, taking most obviously crowbarred in love interest, most irritating, least useful to gameplay, least necessary to plot, and lifetime achievement. Perhaps the crowning moment of her hideousness is when she nearly dies and the game forces you to press a button sequence in order to revive her with CPR, although the spiteful cow never actually dies, no matter how many times you deliberately fuck up. What's tragic is that the good ship alone in the dark can see port good game without a telescope, but they were apparently in such a hurry to get there that they accidentally landed at the cock up peninsula. It's full of good ideas balanced by terrible execution, which I will illustrate using two hypothetical designers I'm going to call Terry and Gonad. Hey, said Terry, let's have a damage system where you actually see persistent wound decals on your character's body. Okay, replies Gonad, but let's put them on the outside of his clothes so they look like someone glued slices of ham to his jumper. Hey again, says Terry, how about a dangerous gooey black floor that becomes neutralised by bright light? Okay again, says Gonad, now let's make the flashlight incredibly ineffectual against it and make it a one-hit kill. Then a broken and jaded Terry starts sniffing glue while Gonad goes into the fetal position and softly giggles to himself. Another interesting idea that got royally butt-fucked is the inventory system in which players are theoretically encouraged to pick up scrappy bits of junk and combine them into MacGyver-style improvised weaponry. In practice, the player will find that the people of New York casually throw away an anomalously large amount of nitroglycerin and all you need to do is pour some of it onto your bullets, then pop a hanky into the bottle and bingo, you're equipped for absolutely anything the game can throw at you. In all fairness, there are quite a few combinations to find and some actually turn out to be useful, but Gonad's presence is felt once again, firstly giving you an aggressively small number of inventory spaces in which your essential ammo, lighter and plot important MacGuffin all take up a space, and secondly by not pausing the game when you go into the inventory screen, so your attempts to fumble a wick into a vodka bottle at short notice can be interrupted at any time by the monster you intend to use it against running up and biting your nipples off. Ordinarily at this point I'd say that overambition has once again shot the kneecaps off a of production as the adventures of Edward Carnby serial arsonist attempts to incorporate combat, driving, puzzles, plus Prince of Persia platforming perplexingly, but I genuinely think that it could have pulled them all off. There was potential for true greatness here that just a little more polish could have brought out if they hadn't booted it out the door before it could even brush its teeth. Combat would have been tolerable if the camera had been a team player, driving would have worked if they tightened up the severely broken physics engine which at one point caused my car to go flying into the skybox after driving too fast over a piece of paper, and I'm not even exaggerating when I say that the fire physics are the best in the entire history of gaming. Seriously, lean too close to the screen and you're in danger of losing your eyebrows. It could have made a good game fantastic, as it stands 
it just makes a bad game pretentious. As a series, Alone in the Dark has always been about subtle claustrophobic horror, as it's sort of implied by the name. Now it makes no sense because you're not alone and it's not even dark because everything's on fire. I knew Atari were idiots when they let Uwe Boll make a god-awful action movie out of the franchise, but I never thought they were big enough idiots to use that film as inspiration. They've clearly been regarding Grand Theft Auto with envious eyes, hence the sandbox Central Park driving aspect which the linear story renders needless until they make you go hunting around looking for the spots where Satan's infernal willy is extruded from the ground and then set his pubes alight. The final straw came when I spent an hour driving laboriously around the park taking care of them all, and then after a brief puzzle sequence, 30 more popped up and the game told me I had to take care of them too. No, I replied. No, I do not. I reject your stupid fucking arbitrary gameplay lengthening World of Warcraft grind quest and I'm sick of putting up with your bullshit. I know you provide the option to skip to the next chapter, but I'm not going to use it. I've had enough. If someone serves you a dead dog for lunch, you do not stick around for the pudding. I suppose I should have realised something was up when I saw that the chapter skipping feature was proudly touted on the back of the box. So not only did the developers think that not having to play the game was a point in its favour, but there were apparently so few other selling points worth mentioning that they put it in the marketing blurb. So to summarise Alone in the Dark in a pithy newspaper headline sort of way, glimpses of brilliance buried in clipping issues and spunk. This is the bit where the big nerds get to beat me up and take my lunch money because I have to admit I don't know much about the Conan mythos because I'm afraid that thinking too much about a muscly man in sweaty pants will make me a disappointment to my parents. I liked the movie because it was Arnold Schwarzenegger back before he was trying to be anything other than a gigantic two-legged cowman who can't act, but my lack of foreknowledge of Age of Conan will ensure a fair review concentrating on the outsider's experience rather than complaining about the depiction of Daisy McSword booths from page 74 paragraph 3 of Conan gets a fixed rate mortgage or whatever. The choices of race are white human, black human or another white human, and body-wise you get to choose between big muscly football hooligan or wispy lingerie model. Not that the game will admit that, RPGs these days get laughed out of the room if they don't let you customise at least 15 separate rolls of flab, so there's the standard advanced character editing screen, but your rippling six packs barely flicker as you rattle the slider back and forth, and even the smallest available boobies resemble a lamppost with two grapefruits nailed to it. Character customization is in short a joke, and the punchline is that you're all going to be covered in the same generic pseudo-medieval outfits pretty soon anyway. In defiance of all this, I opted to play as a female Stygian necromancer with all the body sliders set to minimum, and decided to see how long I could get through the game without putting on any armour at all, thus beginning the adventures of Thinderella, the necromancer romantic naturist. The first thing that struck me about Age of Conan is that unlike my character's nubile young naked body that glistened invitingly in the morning sun, it wasn't very tight. Over the first few levels I was loaded down with a ridiculous number of evil black spells of dubious usefulness, creating an instant dilemma with each battle as I tried to decide precisely in what way I wanted to suck out an enemy's soul through his urethra, and of course I could summon undead minions. By level 20 I had eight of the doby fucks following me around, not the biggest horde in the world, more of a hordette really, but enough to obscure all the action with necrotized flesh and thong shading every time a fight broke out, and it certainly feels big whenever you die or walk through a door and have to summon them all again one at a time. Add to that 17 buffs to cast on myself, and my pre-questing preparation took so long I felt like an acne-riddled schoolgirl getting ready to hit Essex on a Saturday night. Contrary to popular belief, I don't hate Mamorphagas. I hate what they do to people, turning them into nocturnal blobs of flesh and Cheetos that communicate entirely in mouth-breathing, and I hate when I look back on my time with the Mamorphaga and realise that I've just flushed away months of my life that I could have spent writing a best-selling book, or raising a child, or pounding nails into my face. But I have had fun with Mamorphagas at the time, or rather a Mamorphaga, and since comparison is going to be inevitable, let's just get the fucker over with. Age of Conan is not World of Warcraft. Some people might say, ooh, maybe it's not trying to be, but those people are going to hell for lying, because all MMOs are trying to be World of Warcraft. Same controls, same terminology, same arduous blocks of motherfucking grind, same interfaces right down to the quest givers with big golden exclamation marks growing out of their heads like they've just spotted solid snakes shuffling through the undergrowth. But one way in which AFC does differ is in the emphasis on story. Dialogue trees are included to allow you to get to know the NPCs, but frankly I find it difficult to care about the personal lives of gormless pissants who spend their whole lives standing in one place picking their nose, and when all I want is their quest, I'd prefer to not have to ask them how their day's going before they can get to the bloody points and tell me how many wombats they want killed. Playing up the dialogue in the Mamorphaga feels like adding wheels to a hovercraft, but nevertheless Age of Conan's intention seems to be to make every player feel like the hero. Your character has 20 levels of largely solo questing to get through before they're even set loose in the big game world, and there's this ongoing story thread about you being the chosen one or some shit, but it's somewhat undermined by that niggling knowledge that there are a hundred thousand other chosen ones running around, some lower level, some higher level, but all of them dickheads who are plotting your murder. I don't know if everyone's just prejudiced against Thinderella's free spirit, but Age of Conan seems to be in dire need of smacktard fumigation. I don't think I met a single other player who didn't either run up and chop my tits off or run away assuming I'd do the same to them, and every other word in the general chat field was some kind of racial epithet. My theory is that all that solo playing they make you do at the start puts you into the wrong mindset. There's nothing wrong with being a small part of something bigger than yourself, that's how an MMO should work. Solidarity, teamwork, joining 40 friends to go stomp on a night elf's face. Age of Conan makes the same mistake as the school system by telling everyone that they're special, thus turning them into entitled twat donkeys. Reviewing MMOs is awkward because given the minimal time I can spare in between buying yachts and kissing ladies on the mouth, I can only play the first 30-odd levels 
levels of one class, but judging by the sheer number of tweaks that are still being made in patch after patch after patch, many would probably agree that Age of Conan is unrefined. The usual quartet of fighter, rogue, mage, and priest is split between 12 playable classes, and while that's a useful thing to brag about in the press release, making them all balanced is going to be akin to squeezing the bubbles out of freshly applied wallpaper while riding a unicycle, and call my determined nudity immature if you like, but the fact that I wasn't hampered in any way does hang a big question mark on whether there's any point to having armour at all. I'd say the whole game is overburdened with unnecessary miniate, and the lack of variety or spark ultimately leaves it with little more than niche appeal, specifically a niche that sells replica swords at gaming conventions and secretly dreams of living inside a Boris Vallejo painting. A cynic can be described as someone who doesn't hold out hope that anything in the future will be good, and frankly I find it harder and harder to understand why any gamer wouldn't be a cynic at this point. Film starring Morgan Freeman would have you believe that hope is your magical shield against the tribulations of life, but the games industry has collectively taken that shield and shoved it up our arse so many times it's probably time we started leaving it at home. To put it in another, less stupid way, if you go by the evidence of the last ten years and just assume that the new Sonic the Hedgehog is just going to be the usual punnet of snot, then you won't get your heart broken. So an appropriately mediocre E3 has a limped past for this mediocre year in gaming, Nintendo have proudly announced their intention to make the Wii do what it was always supposed to do anyway, while Microsoft and Sony busily compete to see who can rip off each other's consoles the most. And of course a gaggle of upcoming game trailers were wheeled out to stir up excitement, but since the eventual quality of most games is going to be essentially determined by spinning a roulette wheel where numbers 1 through 30 have all been smeared with pus, I thought I'd better fly in and point out that we're still living in a cruel corporate-run society that treats you like a wallet mounted on the back of an entranced magpie, so here's why all ye should abandon hope for the shiny objects being held up for us to gawp at. First up, Prince of Persia. Now, I thought the Sands of Time trilogy was the best game series of the last console generation. I'll pause for a moment so you can all go find your socks that just blew off. Okay, so the combat in game 1 was a basket of farts, and game 2 stumbled a bit when the prince went off his angst medication, but overall the characters were solid and the time controlling gameplay worked crazy well with a sudden death platforming, to the point that now I feel my fingers unconsciously groping for the rewind button every time my toast lands butter side down. And it seems the new Prince of Persia is going to take all that and piss boiling oil into its eye sockets. Leaving aside for now that the music in the background sounds like someone teased a cat's bollocks with pliers for a few minutes while throwing ball bearings at a piano keyboard, the setting seems to have shifted from historical Persia to somewhere between Final Fantasy X and XII, and by the look of the character design the concept artist has been spending more than a few holidays there himself. Maybe Prince of Persia's appeal lies in a grounding of reality dusted with the fantastic elements of Arabian myth, but fuck that, the kids are into anime these days, so let's all jump around on the ceiling dressed like twats. Speaking of which, Final Fantasy XIII also has a trailer and it looks good. Of course it always looks good, but my philosophy with game trailers is that footage of pre-rendered cinematics doesn't count, so bearing that in mind, the actual length of the FF13 trailer is around 0.3 of a second. The rest consists of androgynous 12 year olds running around being improbably awesome and giving absolutely no hints as to the storyline, but as an educated guess I'd say it involves some kind of evil authority, one or more heroes who were once associated with the same, a half-baked anti-industrial hippie subtext, and all in all will closely resemble what you'd get if George Lucas's brain fell out and he made a new Star Wars movie with everything that was ever good about it replaced with dodgy CG and laughable angst. Oh wait. The new Resident Evil 5 footage indicates that Capcom are counteracting the accusations of racism by including an African female sidekick resembling a white woman who's been dipped in tea. I'm sure the gameplay will be fine because Resident Evil 4 was fine and bugger all seems to have changed except now we've traded up from infected Spanish peasant village to infected African peasant village and the dialogue is still going to be so bad that every single line hurls you out of the experience like you're on a fucking trebuchet. Now then, Fallout 3. Those of you who are paying attention will no doubt notice that all these games are sequels, and for those of you who aren't paying attention... <coughs> Oi! E3 was very much Sequel Boulevard this year, which might be partly why it was such a damp squib. What, is there some kind of virus that attacks creativity going around or something? Twenty years ago, in the 8-bit era, games could be about French chefs riding giant stick insects while wielding a gun that shoots velociraptors. These days, a game's considered original if the gritty, well-armoured soldier protagonist has a moustache. Anyway, to rope this wandering steer back on topic, Fallout 3 is an RPG about a gritty, well-armoured soldier protagonist exploring a ruined city where everyone's either a mutant or a jerk. I'll admit that it looks very pretty, but then so did Rudolf Hess. Also, it's by Bethesda, developers of Oblivion, and patron saints of games that look awesome in screenshots and preview videos but ultimately play like bowls of scummy dishwater. Case in point is the demonstrated combat system where the game cuts to a dramatic angle to watch you execute a successful kill, which is groovy pants the first time, but since it seems to happen with every kill, I'm sure repetition will swiftly boil it down to just plain pants. Finally, a brief mention of Gears of War 2. That was it. So that concludes this little adventure in sports spoiling, I'd like to clarify that somewhere in the flinty pits of my petrified heart I'm open to the possibility of all these games potentially being fun, except Final Fantasy XIII obviously, but my intention is not to troll for once, but to argue that it makes the most logical sense to be pessimistic. After all, if the game's good, great, but if it's bad, you've lost nothing. Plus you get the satisfaction of knowing you're cleverer than fanboys, which is right up there with winning a beauty contest against Steve Buscemi, but still, it's a good overall rule, never let yourself get excited by trailers, unless it's the new one for the Watchmen movie. Oh yes, I can never get enough big glowing blue men with their celestial lads 
dad's hanging out. Ninja Gaiden 2 is another graduate from the Resident Evil School of Sequel Numbering and the latest in a series of similarly titled games stretching all the way back to the NES, which boldly depict ninjas with superlative historical accuracy as simple peasant spies mainly concerned with undercover espionage and guerrilla warfare. Also, the Wii totally has lasting appeal, Atari have released some god games, and Cliff Blazinski isn't an extremely sexy man. Ha ha ha, sorry. Ninja Gaiden 2 is actually about a bloke in pyjamas flipping out and jumping around in ways you wouldn't expect such tight leather pants to comfortably allow. Team Ninja are thankfully now getting out of their ugly habits of re-releasing Ninja Gaiden 1 umpteen times like they're channeling Lucasfilm or something. Oh blimey, I have been ripping on George Lucas a lot lately, haven't I? And finally decided to do some actual bloody work and make a sequel. Exactly how much work they've done is a matter for debate, since not much has changed in terms of gameplay except for the fact that they hired Eli Roth and a small team of convicted murderers to come up with new damage physics. The evil Ninja Clan, it seems, is now suffering from a widespread epidemic of leprosy, which causes their arms and legs to fly off if you so much as brush past them in a narrow corridor, and there's more than a few cases of haemophilia popping up too. So the gore's been ramped up, and as always, hand in hand with gore comes Titties, his lovely wife and business partner. As the game begins, we're introduced to a delightful young lady whose skimpy leather top looks like it's trying and failing to contain some kind of watermelon landslide, and within literally one minute, she's been arousingly chained up by baddies just in time for the hero, Ryu Hayabusa, or however you pronounce that, to leap in and rescue her giant boobs, and consequently the rest of her. Turns out that the boobs belong to the CIA, although I'm fairly certain that dressing like you were ambushed by a lawnmower on your way to the S&M club isn't the sort of thing the dress code would allow at the CIA. Maybe the T and A, but dumb tish. Anyway, this all kicks off a story of some kind, along the lines of an evil ninja clan unleashing demons upon the earth, and the CIA deciding that one solitary ninja is a much more hopeful prospect than, say, a tactical nuclear strike. But frankly, fuck you if you want a story. Here's your story. Demons over there, kill they ass. Among Japanese games, Ninja Gaiden 2 is almost unique in its immediacy. There's none of that Metal Gear Solid bullshit of cutscene dialogues that could fill a modest paperback. None of that Devil May Cry cockpittle where the cinematics selfishly hog all the fun. None of that Zelda, uh, pff, applesauce where you spend the first six hours on a starting island learning the subtle arts of waving a sharp stick around going, yeah. What they do is briefly set the scene, then hand you a sword and go off to sit on the side Lights, patiently drumming their fingers on their knees while a legion of superpowered lepers pull your ring piece out through your throat. And I respect that to a point. It's like the painkiller thing of focusing on relentless gameplay but lacking the aesthetic appeal that compensates for the story deficiency, being set mostly in a series of corridors full of twitchy blokes with increasingly bullshitty attacks. Of course, this is very much a game for the hardcore crowd, with the emphasis on hard, suggestive tone of voice optional. The combat feels like one of those improbable bullet time sequences from a wire foo movie, only sped up to normal speed, then sped up a bit more. It's all about getting in sync with the enemy, finding the right rhythm of attacking blocking and dodging, and if you lose that rhythm they'll chop off three quarters of your health bar before you can say Hattori Hanzo. And even if you do find the rhythm, there's always the chance you'll get hit by an unavoidable exploding shuriken thrown by some dick you couldn't see because the camera's pointing at a dustbin or whatever, but it presents an interesting critical dilemma. Can a game that's supposed and indeed expected by its target audience to be aggressively difficult be accused of bad design? After all, the platforming stroke wall running sections are incredibly fiddly and unintuitive and the camera's a giant piece of shit and a side of bacon, but maybe that's part of the challenge. You get loaded down with unnecessary numbers of only slightly different weapons, but maybe the developers intended for us to be flummoxed by indecision for a few moments before just getting the claws out again because everything else is shit. Some things can't be defended this way though, the graphical glitches, the level design being full of invisible walls, the occasional bewilderingly easy boss fight, and the fact that most of your magic spells make significantly less impact than turning around and breaking wind. But Ninja Gaiden 2 is part of a dying breed, so I'm inclined to be nice towards it as I would towards anyone else with a terminal illness. In this new age of mainstream and casual gaming, many linear games seem to be becoming more about the spectacle, with no further ambition than taking the player by the hand and holding their attention long enough to reach the end and get a perfunctory peck from distressed damsel du jour, or more likely the cocktease cliffhanger designed to set up a sequel that only exists in some designer's miserable and unfulfilled creative ambition. Ninja Gaiden 2 is very much a game for the old school crowd that it actually poses the kind of challenge that leaves your voice hoarse with incoherent swearing and your thumbs paralysed with wankers cramp, but on the other hand the bugs and gameplay issues make it feel unfinished and its immature obsession with blood and titties make me almost insulted to be the target audience. Ultimately it's the gaming equivalent of a fat epileptic kid hopping up and down on his Thundercats bedspread, popping right in with one stubby hand and shakily masturbating with the other. So it seems I might have let slip a few controversial statements about the Prince of Persia Sands of Time trilogy, what with phrases like best game series of the last console generation dribbling out of the corner of my mouth, since what I actually consider a good game is the eternal question that apparently keeps my correspondence up at night, and since the current state of new releases continues to be like staring into a big empty bucket made of air, I figured it was time to dribble out a few qualifying statements on the subject. So back in the olden days when Wolfenstein could still call itself 3D with a straight face, a young squire named Jordan Mechner took a bunch of pictures of his younger brother running around in pyjamas because this was a simpler time before the internet when he could could still do that without someone calling the police. He then rotoscoped the pictures and created the timeless 2D classic Prince of Persia, the first in the subgenre of realistic platformer in which you can't jump more than two vertical feet and falling two stories leaves you with your thighs poking out of your lungs. Fast forward a few centuries to the early days of full 3D when executives were scrambling around in graveyards looking for old properties to remake in big lumpy polygons and one chap with a stench of death about him suggested Mechner's opus. The first attempt at a 3D Prince of Persia was the predictably named Prince of Persia 3D, technically a Tomb Raider clone in the same sense that a bucket of mushy peas and old twigs is technically food. It was horribly designed with bugs up the arse, a particularly uncomfortable place for bugs,
Bugs and had a terrible habit of arbitrarily killing the player with leap of faith gameplay and unlabeled traps in open defiance of occupational health and safety protocols. Let's be more generous than reviewers at the time and say no more about it except that it was a huge turd. A few years had to go by before the huge turd passed through the rectum of general memory but in 2003 it fell to Ubisoft to take another stab at it and release Prince of Persia Sands of Time. The driving principle was that since instant death traps are pretty much a staple of the series then the player should be given an alternative to constantly smashing quick load with the speed of a pneumatic drill and this was achieved with the power to rewind time. This served to make the parkour platforming more fun than several barrels of particularly whimsical monkeys when the irritation of an accidental 10 story drop and splatter death could turn into a surreally humorous aside in which the prince's shattered bones instantly knit themselves back together and he's so surprised he leaps 300 feet into the air. Other pros include beautiful environments that could make a jaded architect leap up and hump the screen and actually really strong characterization. The prince was a snotty arrogant dick in itself not unusual in games but it's impossible to dislike him because a he's snarky while being very humanly flawed and b if he ever really pisses you off you can drop him down a pit as many times as you like. And I still hold up his sidekick come love interest as one of the best female characters in gaming and not just because her tits are reasonably sized, she too acts like an actual human being rather than a MacGuffin princess with no brain or motor skills or a supercilious badass action girl wearing enough armour to cover maybe one quarter of a person. The one thing I hate about Sands of Time is that the combat is repetitive and boring. The weird foible of the series is that it's always brushing up against perfection but for every step towards it they take another step back. The sequel Warrior Within had vastly improved combat but unfortunately everything else had been beaten with the angsty stick and forced to write poetry with a pen full of black eyeliner. It seems that Ubisoft decided that emo culture was in so they went around the office one morning and fired everyone who was smiling. The prince was suddenly staring out from under a black Robert Smith fringe and growling angry threats at supercilious badass action girls showing off more flesh than a surgeon's convention. The tonal shift was so unnecessary and contemptible that a critical paddling session followed which was a shame because the environments were still nice and the gameplay was better than ever it just goes to show never stick your dick in a pudding. It might still be good pudding and you can spend all afternoon explaining that but no one's going to eat it because you stuck your dick in it. The very serious and angry warrior within made fans of the first game's lightness of tone very angry and serious which is ironic when you think about it and it was with rare wisdom that Ubisoft cocked an ear and wound the angst back in time for the third game Two Thrones. On paper it looked like everything we'd hoped for, the Arabian aesthetic and light heartedness of Sands of Time combined with the refined gameplay of Warrior Within but then a lot of things look good on paper, like the little blue dolphin patterns on my toilet roll that fail to distract from the issue that I'm wiping my ass with it. While the gameplay continued to be top notch with the possible exception of needless and finicky chariot racing sequences the guy responsible for the charming dialogue and believable characters had evidently been one of the many casualties during the dark times and Two Thrones' attempt to replicate the snarky chemistry between the prince and his lady friend came across as forced and cynical, especially since the princess had evidently been on the testosterone injections and turned into an altogether now supercilious badass action girl like every love interest in their dog. It was like watching the Hollywood film version of a favourite book, seeing beloved characters and themes boiled down to tired marketable stereotypes until you want to rub Agent Orange into your eyes just to add a bit of colour to the dowdy homogenised mess. Between them the three sands of time games had the ingredients of probably the best game ever and I don't say that lightly. The first game still very resolutely sits in my top five games of all time but it could have been better. Like a variant of the uncanny valley effect the closer a game gets to portal perfection the more glaring the flaws become and their attempts to correct those flaws in the sequels were akin to removing flecks of dirt from a birthday cake with a shovel. But we live and learn so let's move on and hope the new Prince of Persia will be as good as Sands of Time and that my ass will sprout wings and fly me into space. I don't really understand fighting games. I don't hate them but then I've never frosted my pants over any of them either. I just don't get them and whenever I mention this people say the same thing. What's there to get? Violence is cathartic. It's like squeezing a great big stress ball except you're kicking it in the face and you're a skinny Japanese schoolgirl in your underpants. But if you want to relieve stress you take a herbal bath or bang your head against a wall, neither of which cost $90 at your local electronics retailer. There's got to be more to it than that. Soul Calibur 4 is the latest in the eternally misspelled Soul Calibur series and is a fighting game themed around twatting each other with swords, all of which are apparently as blunt as roofing tiles because they can't do more than knock people out. Anyway, the painfully slim justification for the twatathon is that there's a big evil chap on a tower who has the bluntest and most unreasonably large swords in the world and everyone wants to have a go with them. Some people want to destroy them, some people want to stick them up their nose and some people want to cover them in toffee and sell them at concession stands. The motivation and backstory for all the characters is so bloody complex you need a fucking flowchart to get to grips with it which the game actually thoughtfully provides in one of its many dalliances with total fucking pointlessness. I've been racking my magnificent brain going through all the ways a game can make itself fun and interesting to play and none of them seem to apply. First possibility having a good story. Well that falls at the first hurdle with two broken kneecaps and a fireside poker lodged in its head because the story mode's a joke. You pick a character, you're given a little scrolly text backstory straight out of the what not to do school of exposition, then you go through five disjointed fights in equally arbitrary locations before taking on the big baddie at the end. Then the character picks up the big swords and does whatever stupid bollocks they had in mind for them. You can run through each character's story in about half a lunch break and all in all it feels like a flimsy and vestigial edition included to mollify a sulking story writer who spent six weeks working out a complex epic before anyone told him it was a fighting game and that the story had been mostly cut to make way for more hairstyles and tits. So let's move on to the next way a game 
anything can be good. A feeling of accomplishment. The satisfaction that comes of beating every challenge it has to offer and sitting back feeling faintly superior to all the names going past on the credit roll. But winning a round in Soul Calibur 4 doesn't feel like much of an accomplishment at all, at least not as much as popping a difficult sheet of bubble wrap. Frankly, I'm amazed the game even comes with a manual. All you need is a picture of the throw button and a big arrow pointing to it. There hasn't been a single round I couldn't get through by slinging my gormless opponent around like a drunken Amish square dance. Perhaps it was because I was playing on normal difficulty. Hang on, I'll try one on hard. Nope, same result. My point is, no victory can feel satisfying if it could have been achieved just as easily by a piece of electrical tape. Next possibility, going through the process of developing a character, the creamy filling generally to be found in the RPG cake. Now, there is a character creation mode included, allowing you to make a custom fighter modelled on yourself, assuming you are a cauliflower-eared slab recently transported from somewhere in medieval Europe, where your superhuman physique did nothing to abate the mockery you earned for your terrible dress sense. You have to pick an established fighting style, though, so all you're doing from a practical standpoint is making custom models for existing characters, and you can use all move straight off so there's nothing to develop. There's all this complicated stats business and you can equip special abilities that might potentially let you break a certain enemy attack on certain days of the year if they're wearing green and are in a good mood, but none of it seems to have much effect on the throw button so it can all be safely disregarded. Custom character creation seems to be the bullet time of fighting games these days, but it does kind of render all the other characters moot because everyone would rather see themselves beating up Satan rather than some white-haired lady in an armoured swimsuit with the voice of somebody's mum, or indeed Darth Vader. Which brings me to another reason why people might play a game, because Darth Vader's in it. Like the up upcoming and inevitably awful Mortal Kombat vs DC, two franchises are climbing into a nice hot soapy bath together in a transparently cynical attempt to combine two fan bases into one beautiful pile of money. Frankly, it smacks of desperation, although I can't decide which of the two parties involved is slumming it the most. Let's not pay it any more attention, because like a small child putting the cat in a tumble dryer, that's exactly what it wants. So by my calculations, I have mathematically proved that Soul Calibur 4 cannot possibly be fun for anyone. When you get right down to it, it's more like a tool set than a game, a disjointed pile of game modes with no real structure, purpose or clear ending, a bunch of dollies and accessories that you pick up and smack together in pretend fights while doing the voices and throaty a cappella sound effects. But like I said, all fighting games bewilder me. They feel like someone took one single aspect of a complete game and tried to pad it into something else they can sell for full price. I wouldn't buy a big bag of icing and call it a cake, but then it seems like some gamers will buy big bags of rotten abattoir runoff and call it a cake as long as there's a picture of an attractive woman on the side with Yoda poking out of her cleavage. Sometimes I feel like I'm spending my entire life mining for gold in a septic tank. It seems like during the development process of most mainstream games that make a specific point of extracting everything original about them and filling in the gaps with spackle and havoc physics. Oh, I'm sure many games start off with some bright-eyed creative director foaming at the mouth with great ideas, but before long the stuffed shirts have fed his design document to an angry dog, and the sheer amount of time and manpower that has to go into just making one character walk across a fucking room in the top-tier graphics engines of this day and age has whittled away all the great ideas in direct proportion to the director's will to live. And me demanding quality from this process feels like rescuing someone from starvation, then demanding they give me a piggyback ride. And do you know who I blame for all this? You. Yes, you, the public. Especially you, a Adrian. That probably isn't your name, but it was worth it to mess with the heads of all the Adrians in the world. Ye unwashed masses who ensure massive profits for the same old cookie cutter sequels because anything that isn't safe and familiar makes you die for your security blanket. And since you spent all daddy's money on a next generation console, you won't even give the time of day to anything that doesn't have environment mapped reflective services and you're more interested in buying Master Chief novelty condoms than actual gameplay innovation. In fact, I don't know why I'm even talking to you. Piss off. Close the browser and fuck off back to Gears of War. Has he gone? Good, I hate that guy. Anyway, games are becoming more and more like the film industry in that while you may occasionally find sultanas while rummaging around in rabbit droppings, you probably have better luck at a dried fruit shop, by which I mean the independent stuff. Braid is an indie 2D puzzle platformer recently released for the Xbox Live Arcade and which is better than most full 3D titles despite and indeed possibly because you could fit the entire development team inside a phone booth. It does however undermine the whole indie aspect when you hear that the lead developer Jonathan Blow sank $180,000 into the project. I mean, how many bedroom programmers have that kind of scratch kicking around? That's like $90,000 for both of his original gameplay ideas. I kid, really. While time manipulation isn't by any means an unexplored concept, I promised myself I wouldn't mention Prince of Persia at this point because I feel if I suck that particular dick any harder it's going to drop off, it's never been quite this stylish or presented in enough new and interesting ways to still feel like something totally original. The puzzles are extremely cleverly put together and always seem to have deceptively simple solutions. The hard part is just getting your head around the sneaky time manipulation mechanics available, but when you do finally master your powers, Hero Nakamura style, and find the solution, it's a more satisfying feeling than teabagging a hundred noobs in any deathmatch shooter you care to name because it's nice to know that bits of your brain besides the 
unusual run, shoot, kill, teabag reflexes haven't turned black and dropped off yet. But wait, I think I hear the nitpick train coming into the station. After a top-notch first half, there's a sense that the game is running out of momentum. Several of the later levels are literally copy-paste of older ones, only sold with a different time power, which feels a little unimaginative. Oh yes, and here's a recurring scenario. Two doors, one key. Key only fits one of the doors, the other one makes it break. No indication of which door is the right one, broken key cannot be recovered, have to start entire level again. That, Jonathan, is what we call a dick move, and I can't think of any reason for it unless the Xbox Live Arcade has some kind of minimum shittiness quota you have to meet. There is a story, although there might as well not be. I've always said that the best stories are ones that merge seamlessly with the gameplay, and in Braid they're kept in separate rooms, with you in the gameplay room looking into the story room through a tiny hole in a dividing wall. Most of it is told through a bunch of disjointed text walls about some Burke looking for a princess, except maybe she's actually his estranged wife or his dead daughter, or maybe she's the atomic bomb, who knows? There's a glimpse of absolute genius in a really well-done endgame sequence, but it still doesn't explain much, and then it's back to obscurely written text boxes for the epilogue, which ultimately left me confused and unsatisfied, which is incidentally how my girlfriend feels most nights, and I refuse to accept that it's just because I'm thick. Of course, with the gorgeous painted graphics and excellent soundtrack, Braid is proudly wearing the arty game label, but it's possible that it might be taking refuge in that to avoid having to explain itself. Old people say it's open to interpretation and you're supposed to discuss it on forums and stuff, but I don't buy that. It's like when you tell a joke and nobody laughs, you then explain the joke and people go, oh that's pretty clever I guess, but they still won't laugh because you didn't tell the joke properly in the first place. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person who gets pissed off at this sort of thing though. Braid's excellent gameplay makes up for its pretentiousness and it's the Killer7 argument again, the flaws are irrelevant because you have to play it for the utter uniqueness alone. I've heard people complain that it's too expensive at $15 and all I can say to that is, welcome to my world motherfuckers. I live in Australia and have been conditioned to blithely accept ridiculously big markups on games. There was a time when paying twice what you hateful Yankee twats do would have pissed me off, but these days I think of it as the having the nicest beaches tax. The unspoken goal of exploration is to make the entire planet completely boring. Life was at its most interesting back when we still thought grass huts were a bit hoity-toity and when there could have been dragons made of raisin bread over the next hill for all we knew. Nowadays everything's mapped out and we've even spent enough time on the moon, in the very bottom of the ocean, to know that firstly there aren't any dragons there either, and secondly we're definitely not in a hurry to go back and double check. Now it's only the depths of space that remain unexplored and unboring, plenty of grey area where any number of interstellar sparkle dragons could be hiding. EVE Online does the impossible by making deep space boring and demonstrates that the best way to do that is to let nerds colonise it. With cards now hurled onto the table hard enough to bounce off and slice someone's eye open, let me back up. A few weeks ago, in the Age of Conan review that inspired so much delightful porn, I mentioned that all MMOs are trying to be World of Warcraft, i.e. full of grind and spiders. Well, some urban cavemen took exception to this remark and decided to fill my lug hole about their personal favourite land of make-believe, EVE Online, an online space sim boasting a gigantic playable universe with enough simultaneous players to populate a small, whiny city with serious personal hygiene issues. Also, they advertise on The Escapist, which I sometimes interpret as a challenge. I made a firm decision starting out that I wasn't going to have anything to do with any of those player-run corporations the game boasts. I've seen their recruitment threads in gaming forums, and I'm frightened that interacting with such people to any great degree would infect me with some kind of weird disease that causes flowcharts. Besides, I only had a 14-day free trial, that's enough time for a holiday but not a middle management induction course or whatever. Once again, I will play the everyman, observing from a distant bush the amusing rituals of a tribe of overweight bespectacled natives. Creating a character involves picking a home planet, a bloodline, a job, an education, a gender, a hair colour, a preferred brand of underpants and whether you squeeze the toothpaste tube from the end or the middle. There's the prerequisite physical appearance editor with the usual batch of sliders, but the fact that your character never leaves their spaceship makes it a massive waste of time, but then if there were ever four words that completely summarised Eve, those would certainly be they, with the runner-up being bored, 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 eye strain. The purpose of all the character background stuff is to tweak what skills you start out with, of which there are a massive number I couldn't even begin to get my head around. How, for example, does signature analysis differ from signature focusing, and how is it supposed to help me fly around space shooting things? What the fuck is tactical logistics reconfiguration, besides something that sounds like resume speak for I play too much Counter-Strike? Whatever, the Big Black was calling, so I just went with whatever skills I could decipher and leapt into the EVE universe, and the first thing that struck me is that whoever said that EVE is completely different to other MMOs was talking out of their intergalactic arse. Let me give a brief rundown of an average online RPG fight. You click on an enemy and start kicking his shins. He then starts kicking your shins, then you take it in turns kicking until one of you falls over. It basically comes down to who started the battle with the biggest boots, and the only strategy involved is realising when things have gone tits up and legging it. And it seems even Deep Space isn't far enough to get away from that, because all you do in EVE Online combat is fly around the enemy, taking it in turns to ram missiles up each other's exhaust pipes. The main difference is that if tits start to get upwardly inclined, you can't just run away, you have to mess around with drop down, set a destination and wait for your warp drive to warm up, by which time the enemy has already killed you, blown you to bits and displayed your ghoulies on his space mantelpiece. Another thing that sets EVE apart is the lack of a levelling system. The only way to develop your character is to train your skills. You do this by picking which skill you want to train, then turning off the game and going to sleep. Seriously, not that I'm complaining, but why am I being rewarded for not playing the game? Watching the little XP bar slowly climb in indirect proportion to my social skills is generally the only thing that keeps me going in an MMO. All you get from mining and doing missions and shit is money. Meanwhile, the market is full of weapons and ship add-ons that you can't fucking have until you've acquired the appropriate skills, so most of the time they sit on the 
the shelves and taunt you like the painted wonders in the window of a Dickensian toy maker, taunting the small orphan child with their nose pressed up against the glass. Normally you have to factor in personal taste, but if you think Eve is fun, you are provably wrong. The interface could only be less intuitive if your monitor was at the bottom of a fucking well. The missions are all just variations on go here and shoot things. It takes forever to get anywhere, and even when you arrive it's just more identical floating fucking rocks. I was gonna say in jest that Eve feels like a game that doesn't seem to want to be played at all, but on reflection I think I might be onto something. My theory is that either it's a glorified space-themed chat room for the nerds who are to nerds what nerds are to normal people, or it's an executive toy for high-powered businessmen who are too busy to play a real game, something that you run in the background and occasionally mess with in between negotiating mergers, neglecting your spouse and becoming emotionally dead. But then again there are apparently people who can stay awake long enough to join and run player corporations. Either they're all bizarro people who wear shoes on their heads, or I'm underestimating the appeal of having a second job you have to pay for. The root problem with Christianity is that their god is supposed to be all-powerful and benevolent. It sounds like an easy sell, but when life turns completely to shit you have to come up with all kinds of whacked out reasons for why kindly old Jehovah saw fit to run over little Timmy with a combine harvester and leave him in a state of vegetative limbless agony for 18 years. Ancient cultures didn't have that problem. They knew their gods were a bunch of drunken lunatics who ran around boning their close relatives and turning their ghoulies into fruit-bearing trees. Consequently they tend to make for much more interesting stories, hence why many video game writers treat mythology as a free idea bucket. So here's Too Human, the game Silicon Knights have been making instead of Eternal Darkness 2, possibly out of a crippling fear of money and success. It's based on a sci-fi reimagining aka copy of Norse mythology. The player takes the role of Balder, who in mythology was the Norse god of being a total pussy, who got his mum to call everything in the world and ask them to be extra special nice to him. Obviously this would be an awkward character to carry a badass action game, so the whole business with his mummy is carefully omitted while he's poured into the usual suit of magic power armour and turned into Space Marine hero number 580 billion. I have to admit though, the story is to be congratulated for taking the fiery thunderous personalities of the Norse gods and somehow turning them into a bunch of boring, self-righteous robotic twats with all the warmth and emotion of a glass of water. Too Human is my favourite kind of game to review because it's bad. None of that wishy washy mediocrity where I have to admit that the soundtrack was nice or that the gameplay was slightly more entertaining than lacerating my gums on the edge of a rusty tin. This is just all bad all the time, to the degree where it starts getting rather worrying. It makes me wonder if anyone actually took time out to play it before release, because there seem to be more issues than pixels. First of all, why can't anyone leave the right analogue stick alone? In third person games its job is to control the camera, that's what it's comfortable with. You try and work it into combat and it just gets frightened and confused. It's like someone made a submarine out of metal, and the metal submarine worked perfectly fine and became the norm, but then someone said, everyone makes submarines out of metal, let's make one out of bread. Here the right analogue stick is used for melee attacks, leaving you at the mercy of a wild and unfettered camera who has nothing but scorn for your desire to look at things. On top of that, Balder pauses for a fraction of a second after every single swing, presumably because he's waiting for a round of applause, so melee combat feels sticky and awkward and flows like a river of bricks. Alternatively, there's gun combat. Balder, it seems, buys his guns from the same shop as Dante, where the only available ammunition is peas and bits of tissue paper. The most you can do while the enemy is at range is chip away at the health of just one of the innumerable horde running up with intent to rape you in the nostrils. Now, enemy spamming can make for barrels of fun, games like Painkiller and Serious Sam prove that, but take note that both of those games are first person shooters. In a monster spam sandwich, being able to aim at priority targets is vital. Two human has to rely on an auto lock on system that considers a giant missile firing robot troll an equal threat to, say, an aggravated baked bean. Also, in the most erect of dick moves, some of the enemies explode when killed, granting incurable status ailments to you if you happen to be around, and you will be around, because while they're running up to you, your auto lock on will have you shooting at a vicious looking ceiling tile, and did I mention that all of the enemies can run faster than your slow ass mummy's boy knobhead protagonist? So you'll die. You'll die a lot, and by Christ does the game want you to know it. A Valkyrie who is clearly in no fucking hurry slowly flies down, picks up your corpse, and ascends gently back into heaven as if to say, there there baby, it doesn't matter that you're a ten thumbed cripple who literally can't fight to save their lives, let's get you tucked into beddy buys. Then you respawn fifty feet away with no penalties, scratching your head in bewilderment, and this happens every time you die, you can't skip it. No one could look at this and think, yep this will never get old. The only remaining explanation is that this is some kind of test. Maybe if anyone defends this on a forum they automatically get added to the government depopulation list because their minds are clearly deviant and must be purged. Too Human is a game that carries the stink of the auteur, a pet project, something that was made for the designer's sake rather than the player's. It proudly announces its intention to be the first part of an epic trilogy, which in terms of tempting fate is right up there with a character in a horror movie uttering the words everything's going to be alright, then getting their tits out. Too Human Episode 1, or whatever they end up calling it, has a measly four missions, each one fatted up into hours of endless waves of the same four or five baddies in huge repetitive environments that only exacerbate the frustration caused by Baldur's toe-curlingly slow movement speed, or perhaps I should call it Baldur's gate. If there really is an entire trilogy of this worked out, a better idea would be to combine them into one game, cutting all the missions down to one third of their intended length, but that won't happen because an auteur developer would sooner take the trimming scissors to their own eyeballs than their beloved magnum opus, and you're left with a game experience that could be recreated by walking down a wide road in the middle of nowhere, stopping every five steps to crack yourself in the eye with a hammer. And the road is a million miles long.
and the hammer is made of wank. If there's one thing history has taught us besides not to piss off people called Genghis or put lead in your water pipes, it's that if you're going to make something incredibly good that becomes frighteningly popular, make sure it's the last thing you ever make in your entire life, because otherwise you get to spend the rest of your creative career struggling under the weight of high expectations and bricks. Will Wright created The Sims, a franchise which by shrewdly combining user-designed assets, the powers of a malevolent trickster god, and a massive amount of implied nudity now annually makes about twice as much money as Belgium. So can his new game, Spore, possibly live up to that legacy? In short, no. In long, no. Will Wright's career path can basically be summed up as meddle with people's lives at increasingly close-up levels. It started with Sim City, dropping buildings from space onto an earthquake hotspot to appease little black specks. Then later on it was The Sims, where he took direct control of little computer people to make them clean toilets and fuck. Now things proceed to their logical conclusion with a game that has you meddle with the very origin of life in the universe, including a depiction of evolution that would make a furious child Darwin eat his own beard. Spore definitely has some pretty amazing technology behind it, the sheer number of creature possibilities is staggering, and it's impressive how you can give them 18 legs and 7 eyebrows that'll still somehow find a way to walk and make suggestive poses. Even if it does tend to clip into itself a fair bit, but then you just paint it blue and pretend it's a ghost. You also get to design your own buildings and vehicles further down the line, so if all you're after is some kind of 3D art program for 8 year olds, Spore is definitely for you. If you're holding out for an actual game, then you get to eat shit, but never mind, you can always design a creature that looks like a huge cock and imagine it pounding you in the arse. The gameplay is divided into 5 sections for each stage of a sentient development, and for each one the goal is pretty much the same. Carnivores have to kill everyone, herbivores have to befriend everyone, except in the early protozoan stage, in which case carnivores have to kill everyone and herbivores have to die a lot. The transitions between the stages are about as smooth and natural as a controlled demolition. Once your cell has scoffed enough food pellets, the hand of God staples a couple of legs to your ass and kicks you out of the sea to start the creature phase. Here you spend a few hours killing other races or braiding their hair and giggling, while gathering the various body parts that litter the ground like there was some kind of horrific mid-air collision and nailing them to your body every time you get your Mac on. Will Wright is clearly no stranger to the odd cheeseburger, because playing as a friendly celery-munching hippie race is a lot harder than being a bunch of aggressive warlike megalomaniacs who communicate by biting each other's faces off. Once you move on to the real-time strategy tribal phase, if you reject the savage meat eating weapon stockpiling lifestyle, you will quickly find that there are several tribes within convenient walking distance who didn't and who will make you their little whimpering bitches before you can even break out the tambourines. A stark and accurate portrayal of the development of human society perhaps, but probably not the intended experience, and it only gets more one-sided with the civilization stage, during which you either pay all the other cities to not kill you, or rampage around the world blowing up computer players who don't have the luxury of being able to pause the game and build 50 gun turrets. The chief failing of Spore is that it's trying to be five games, each one a shallow and cut down equivalent of another game, with the civilization stage even going so far as to be named after the game it's bastardising. The rigid level based structure and its constant changing of gameplay feels restrictive and schizophrenic, a much longer gradual development from cell to sentience with more options would have felt less like just ticking off boxes on a checklist. Wasn't this the whole appeal of Sim City, watching the slow transformation from Scout Hut in the middle of nowhere to sprawling carbon dioxide spewing urban vomit puddle? That's why it felt so cathartic to then drop Godzilla into the middle of it, watching everything you worked for collapse neath his mighty tread, while crying and breathlessly rubbing yourself through your trouser pocket or perhaps that was just me. The final space exploration stage seems to be what everything is leading up to, the rock under which all that trademark will right openness was hiding. In fact, everything beforehand feels like an unusually detailed intro sequence, like the recap at the start of an episode of Lost. You get to cruise around the universe, turning planets into planets just like yours, plonking down colonies without asking, and introducing wildlife so you can torment them later with your tractor beam, a masterfully satirical dig at US foreign policy. If you're happy with a pretty, if repetitive, space sim, then hooray for you! It's just not the elaborate transcendental life simulator we were promised. Fundamentally, though, Spore will never have the appeal of The Sims because of the excision of the human element. It wasn't simply controlling life that made The Sims popular, it was controlling life that resembles people we know, or optionally Batman. So I guess what I'm asking is, can brightly coloured monstrosities really compare to Batman? Short answer, no. Nostalgia is like stuffing your cheeks with cocaine-infused marbles in that it makes you say stupid things. Of course Fantasy World Dizzy isn't the best game ever, don't be so bloody idiotic. It had like five colours and the main character was a blob on some kind of permanent caffeine buzz. The flaws of our childhood amusements disappear behind an insidious rose tint because we associate them with a happier innocent time before our first damning locker room stiffy. The current popularity of retro and casual gaming that form the foundation stones of the Xbox Live Arcade and equivalents indicate that there exists a substantial niche for games that capitalise on mudded memories of past times, two of which I'd like to ransack for you today. First up, Bionic Commando Rearmed, a 3D remake of an old NES game that I've never played because mine was a Commodore 64 household, but apparently it was about Inspector Gadget battling Hitler, so presumably Nintendo were somehow getting their ideas from the things I drew on the backs of my school exercise books. The 3D aspect however is completely cosmetic, with the gameplay stubbornly riding economy class on the 2D plane, and even though I've never played the NES original, I can tell that Rearmed is an utterly faithful remake because it's console stompingly frustrating. Which brings me to the first counterpoint to nostalgia, that the majority of obsolete retro gaming tropes died out for a good fucking reason. The lives system seems like a good place to start, lives are a holdover from the days of arcade gaming when each one 
symbolized another shiny coin to be begged and whined for from your unfeeling mum. They were made obsolete when it was realized that it made for better home entertainment if any player could finish a game rather than just the obsessive psychotic ones. Rearmed is determined to keep it retro though, so if you get deadified one too many times in a mission you have to start it all over again in what amounts to little more than arbitrarily slamming a button marked lengthened gameplay raised blood pressure. And when you're hurling yourself through space with no ability to maneuver in the air with patented insta-death spike and water traps lurking just off screen like giggling trolls under bridges, deadification is inevitable. Strangely for a 2D platformer you can't jump, at least not from the start, so if you find yourself with a waist-high obstacle to deal with you have to use your grappling hook to swing over it, which strikes me as a needlessly roundabout solution. I guess if you go to all the trouble of chopping your arm off and jamming a winch on the end then you'd want to make the most of it, but you'll know that experience some regrets when you're trying to hug your children or finger your wife. And call me set in my ways, but surely it would be more intuitive to make pressing the button to shoot the grappling hook also detach it, rather than retract and leave you dangling helplessly from the ceiling like a bionic piñata. In short, the grappling and swinging controls handle like they were installed by someone reading the assembly instructions upside down, but the question this all raises is whether a remake should just blithely parrot the gameplay mechanics of the original, or take the opportunity to improve upon them with our enlightened future space technology. Well, the second one, obviously, you thick burk. There's nothing inherently sacred about game designs from the olden days, they're just old, and wrinkly, and fat, and no one but the utterly depraved wants to sleep with them. Our second game is Castle Crashers, which isn't openly trying to ape any previous game, but does nonetheless, namely Golden Axe, and everything from the same medieval fantasy sword-swinging, bikini-wearing sub-genre of 16-bit side-scrolling beat-em-ups, but this time coming to us by way of the works of Joan and Vasquez. In the classic tradition, you and one or more friends pick a character each and rampage down linear corridors, stopping every now and again to twat multiple attackers across the bonds every time they try to stand up until a big flashing pointing hand signals that your table is ready at the next monster party. So far so standard, the appeal lies in exaggerated cartoony graphics, truly imaginative set pieces and a wonderfully dark sense of humour which will probably be enough to get most people through all the muck I'm about to rake up. While the little big headed characters are fun to look at, in big fights with lots of similarly sized chaps it's easy to lose sight of the one you're controlling and this becomes doubly unfair in big boss fights when the big boss's main strategy is to conceal your character's location behind their mountainous flab. At least in Golden Axe you could play as the Amazon lady and navigate by her unfeasible boobies this is like watching midget identical twins wrestling and trying to remember which one you put money on. Also, while Bionic Commando is a 2D game presented in full 3D for absolutely no bloody reason, Castle Crashes is trying to pull the old fast one of fake 3D gameplay in 2D graphics. You have to be on pretty much the same vertical plane as an enemy to hit them, and the game will often leave you furiously dicing empty air while baddies stand two pixels into the distance laughing and flicking peanuts at your face. So to summarise in three quick points, a hilarious little romp enjoyed with a chum or two would have played better in 3D. To paraphrase my first statement, nostalgia is a mouthful of balls. Children will like anything the stupid diminutive cunts and you weren't any different. Games, or should I say the potential for games, has only gotten better as technology advances in indirect proportion to the worsening of your memory. When the gaming kids of today become the hairy winding twenty-somethings of the future they'll be declaring that Halo 3 was miles better than a game of interstellar bum pirates on the astral thought planes of the universal overmind and they'll be just as wrong then as you are now. I played both Zelda Twilight Princess and Super Mario Sunshine before I played Ocarina of Time and Mario 64 and I thought the first two were better in every buggering way. Drink down that burn sauce, fat boy. Also, I think Hitler was right. There's an insidious thought that frequently goes through the minds of gamers, and I'm not talking about the ones you get when Ivy from Soul Calibur's pants ride up and which are perfectly natural for growing young men. I mean the thought that goes, but I might need it later. The niggling little doubt that prevents you from using all your most powerful insurance policies in case there's some kind of no claims bonus at the end of it all. So we have scenarios where you're sitting on a nuclear stockpile to shame North Korea and are throwing peas at a giant robot crab on the off chance that there might be a bigger giant robot crab just around the corner. No game illustrates this phenomenon better than Mercenaries 2, or as I like to call it, Airstrikes 2, hooray for airstrikes. Mercenaries 2's plot is driven by an oil dispute in Venezuela because all the other contemporary war games had already claimed the Middle East and there was too much of a waiting list. You're a mercenary who helped some evil bloke take over the country and who made the mistake of handing him the bill while he was filling out his traitorous douchebag checklist. Surprise surprise, he betrays you and now you've got to spend an entire game doing jobs for various factions, hiring some lieutenants with hilarious accents, building up an arsenal of heavy ordnance, then piling it all together and shoving it up his big fat ass. I'm hesitant to use the term Grand Theft Auto clone anymore because open world games are becoming so ubiquitous that the term feels hopelessly quaint, like how we used to call first person shooters Doom clones, which might have been easier to say, but if you're going to boldfacedly claim that say Half-Life 2 is essentially identical to a game that was only slightly more technologically advanced than a drawing on a piece of graph paper, then I'll have to ask you to step outside. But while I could say that Mercenaries 2 is an open world game in which you get around by stealing cars and doing slightly repetitive missions generally involving at least one gunfight or escort, calling it a Grand Theft Auto clone would probably be a lot faster. Well perhaps that's not fair, there's a much greater emphasis on wanton destruction than Grand Theft Auto if you can believe that. You can destroy virtually every building in the game world if you're an extremely patient passive-aggressive anarchist, and then there are the airstrikes. Mercenaries 2 has a massive enthusiasm for airstrikes. They feature prominently in the tutorial, you'll find them lying innocently by the side of the road next to signs saying, boy I hope no one steals me, wink wink, and every time you die on a mission the game throws up tips that are usually along the lines of, see if you'd listened to us and used an airstrike maybe this wouldn't have happened you cloth-eared nonce. The only explanation is that the game somehow gets off on airstrikes because they certainly aren't particularly necessary or useful. To use most of the airstrikes 
on offer, you generally have to be close enough to your target to fling a signal flare at it, and if you're that close to the action, you might as well cut out the middleman. Handheld rocket launchers are everywhere, as are tanks and helicopters, which are easily hijacked with a oh who bloody ray brief quick time event sequence. Fittingly enough for a game whose main character is a man with tattoos and a mohawk, Mercenaries 2 is not as hard as it thinks it is. Often I'll start a mission and my squeaky Australian support character will nag my ear off about how I need to buy two more boats, three more tanks, and a few big old whacking sticks, but none of it makes any sense. All the weapons and vehicles I need are one piss easy hijack sequence away. I don't bring desks to an office temp job, they've already got some there. And why two boats? There's only one of me. Actually, this is something I've been meaning to bring up, miss. Why does the CEO of our private military company have to do all the missions personally with no backup except for an Irish chopper pilot who abandons his mission when the enemy took anything larger than a scone at him? Actually, working alone might be for the best. The AI is so thick it might as well be living in a cave. On one occasion I called down a platoon of soldiers from a friendly faction to help me take over an enemy base. Every single one of them stepped right off the edge of the helipad, fell six feet, and died. Unhelpful, but fucking funny. Less amusing was an incident later on. I was supposed to destroy some anti-air cannons in order to land a chopper on a rooftop and rescue a hostage who was up there. Bollocks to that, I thought. I'll nick an enemy chopper that they won't shoot at, pick him up, and tear out of there before they know what the fuck. Sadly, they saw through my disguise around stage three of my master plan and shot me down. I was hoping my hostage would have the same presence of mind as I and jump out when we were close to the ground, but sadly I guess he couldn't figure out his seatbelt and perished in the crash. So I tried the mission again, but he seemed to remember me now, so when I came within earshot of the building, he eagerly walked straight off the roof to join me. Hostage dead, mission failed, support character gets sarcastic, broken game gets to fuck off. Mercenaries 2 is a game that raises a lot of questions in my mind. Why does firing from the hip seem to be more accurate than iron sight aiming? Why when a vehicle I'm in explodes do I emerge with full health? Why does an enemy sounding the alarm provoke not concern, but glee that soon there will be tanks and choppers to effortlessly steal? All of these these doubts point to a game with severe inconsistency problems, as if the designers of half the gameplay mechanics weren't in communication with the designers of the other half. But a game review must ultimately boil down to one question. Is it fun? And yes, I suppose it is. Rampage showed us years ago that the freedom to cause enough civic damage to put 15 state schools out of funding does make for the fun times. All you have to do is forgive the sloppy design and the fact that the lead character constantly parrots the same unfunny four or five quips with his disinterested sounding old man voice. Forgiveness, however, isn't a strong point of mine, so I'll just conclude by saying that Mercenaries 2 can eat a dick Pavlova. I think it's safe to say I'm pretty much over the Wii. It was a nice experiment, and when the first party of Nintendo games were still fresh and sales were utterly crushing the competition neath its sandaled feet, it towered overhead in a turgid position of power and manliness. But now the honeymoon's over, and what once stood boldly upright has become limp and floppy in my hands. Whenever it's brought out, the cruel mocking laughs of onlookers savage my self-esteem, and it's starting to leak this weird brownish fluid, but I'm too embarrassed to see a doctor. What was I talking about? Well, anyway, The Force Unleashed. So the games come out for practically everything with a screen. The Wii, PS3, 360, PSP, iPhone, ZX Spectrum, graphing calculator, microwave oven. But my thinking was that since the first thing anyone does with a Wii controller is swing it around making lightsaber noises, it would be remiss of me to play an actual official lightsaber game on anything else. A slight graphical downgrade is a relatively minor storm to weather for a game that actually feels like being a legendary unstoppable warrior magician rather than merely piloting one by remote control. Playing the game, however, it turned out that the legendary unstoppable warrior magician has a Zimmer frame and Parkinson's disease, and a slight graphical downgrade became it looks like it was left in a swamp monster's trouser pocket during laundry day. Just to take another massive bladder evacuation into my horrified upward facing eyes and nostrils, I later caught a glimpse of the PS3 version being played by someone else, and not only were the graphics better, but the level design was drastically different, i.e. actually good, and the physics seemed to amount to more than just swatting things made of cardboard around various empty rooms. On the whole, it seemed like a game I'd much rather be reviewing now, but I made my stupid, stupid choice, and now I'm stuck with this watery, dead-eyed knockoff that would have embarrassed a last generation console with a pickaxe lodged in it. It just goes to prove what I've always said, free will is overrated. The story concerns Darth Vader thankfully having gotten over his difficult puberty and now expanding his evil portfolio with a dalliance in stealing other people's children. His nurturing instincts then kick in and he raises the Sprog as a secret apprentice to help him overthrow the Emperor. And why not? Because everything always works out so well whenever he pulls that shit. Apparently the plot is supposed to tie the Star Wars prequel trilogy to the original series, which raises the obvious question, why would we want to do this terrible thing? It's like tying your breakfast to a plague rat. The grubby fingerprints of George Lucas are all over the story in that none of the characters are in the slightest bit relatable. That, however, could be because of the Wii graphics limitations, making them all look like Jerry Anderson puppets of stroke victims. Your female sidekick in particular has something very eerie about her. She never blinks, for one thing. Her eyes just sort of wobble every now and again like they're about to fall out. But let's move on to the festering bone marrow of the matter, the Wiimote lightsaber controls. Sweep it left and right for horizontal slashing, up and down if you're feeling sassy. Put in practice, however, most lightsaber fights amount a little more than run up to enemy, then wave your wrist around like you're a schoolgirl who just noticed a tarantula crawling up her sleeve. The trouble with the Wii motion sensor is that it's so temperamental and intent to willfully misinterpret your every spastic flail that it's 
It's essentially like playing any other console, but with all the buttons randomly reassigned every couple of seconds. If only the controllers had some kind of, say, attachment that fixed all these issues, perhaps the games would actually be worth a damn, but there I go again on my dreamy little tangents. Since it's the Wii port's lone unique feature, I should probably mention the dual mode, in which you and a friend compete to see who can stave off carpal tunnel syndrome the longest. I and my colleague opted to fight us Anakin Skywalker vs Darth Vader just to completely fuck up the canon, but when we figured out that both of us were using the lightsaber fighting style known as Random Shaking Foo, we both just backed up and stuck forced lightning up each other's asses until one of them fell off. Back in single player town, I ended up putting all my upgrade points into force powers, because for reasons already mentioned, pulling off the lightsaber combos is like trying to follow an aerobics routine with both your arms tied to different windmills. Once you figure out that force pushing and force lightning can down an entire room full of assailants, you'll wonder why you even bother carrying that big glowing Jedi Willy extension around. I mean, Christ, Luke Skywalker was supposed to be some kind of force prodigy, and the most he could do was move a lightsaber by grimacing at it for an hour. And here's this lad clearing an entire hallway with a cough. The force unleashed on the Wii did not endear itself to me. I don't blame the developers, and I'm not just saying that because they're based in this city and might kill me. I blame the Wii for being tight-fisted with its hardware upgrades. I blame myself for failing to research the different versions. I blame Michael Atkinson, the Attorney General of South Australia, for quite a few unrelated things. But most of all, I blame George Lucas, that hirsute, chinless git, pummeling his own franchises with such ham-handedness you could put a piece of bread around each of his mitts and call them BLTs. What I want to know is when LucasArts are going to drop this shallow pretense that the prequel trilogy wasn't seven to eight hours of concentrated agony drilled right into the forebrain, declare the whole confused lot of it non-canon and move on. But no, they keep trying to make us accept it, like our parents making us invite the smelly kid with the hunchback to our birthday party so he can drink all the Fanta and determinedly wet himself. First there was that god-awful CG movie that looked like a two-hour intro cutscene, and now this. Personally, I would slap George's hands away from the editing desk, give him a colouring book, then remake the prequel trilogy so that Darth Vader uses the Force to win breakdancing competitions and chokes to death anyone who utters the word midichlorians. I don't think I would do very well in a real-world combat scenario. I hate being shouted at and I can't run very fast while wearing a backpack the size of a cow. Before I would willingly enter a gunfight, the enemy are going to have to strap big glowing red arrows to their heads and promise to stand next to windows, loudly vocalising every thought that crosses their minds. And by the time my comrades have persuaded them to do that, I'll have remembered that I'm a massive coward and legged it. Reality is a cruel and unintuitive place with frustrating gameplay mechanics, which is why it's so odd that games try so hard to resemble it. With that in mind, here is Stalker Clear Sky, or to give it its proper title, S-T-A-L-K-E-R Clear Sky. If you go into S-T-A-L-K-E-R Clear Sky in the mindset of, say, Half-Life 2, and run full pelt into enemy strongholds, gleefully spraying bullets, then your corpse will be strung up in their garden being used as a bird feeder before you can say, reload, Dr. Freeman. You know how in most FPSs you're some kind of hybrid of man and refrigerator who could take an entire munitions dump to the face while the enemy all have armour made of whipped cream and skulls made of cake? Well, it seems going into this game everyone got their character sheets mixed up. The player can't survive more than a measly handful of bullets ripping through their flesh, while the armoured enemies can take so many rounds to the torso you'd think there'd be nothing left but a spinal column and the cornflakes they had for breakfast. They can spot you in pitch darkness, even with your flashlight off, and they can shoot you from halfway to Neverland because their guns have magic accuracy that evaporates the instant you get your hands on them. I had to press quick save more often than the fire button, and this was on medium difficulty. I dread to think what the hardest setting is like, they probably give you a water pistol and replace all the enemies with fire-breathing golden lions. S-T-A-L-K-E-R Clear Sky is set in the area surrounding an alternative post-disaster Chernobyl where the power station apparently ran on fairy dust before the meltdown and released a cloud of magic instead of boring old radiation which transformed people and animals into super-powered mutants as opposed to corpses and created localized space-time anomalies that can do impossible things, like make Atari release a decent game for once. The zone's now the number one hangout for dudes with anoraks and acoustic guitars who are all voiced by the same heavily accented man, and to occupy their time by either shooting at people in slightly different coloured anoraks and stealing their baked bean piles, or showing each other the best routes to get to people in slightly different coloured anoraks to shoot at. The player character is just one of many of these types, but every faction wants him to do jobs for them because he has mastery of the zone's most effective temporal anomaly, the mystical quick save key. Actually, the various factions don't always seem to be totally clear on exactly how important you are, especially early on in the game, missions sometimes have this alarming quality of solving themselves. There was this bit where my allies were yelling my ear off telling me to help defend some control points somewhere because black anorak wearers were closing in and our occupying forces numbered one guy in a wheelchair and a sock puppet. But halfway there, I was suddenly congratulated for successfully seeing the blighters off, and by the time I arrived, the wheelchair man had already installed a bar and croquet lawn. It's good that they're not totally dependent, but my impression was that my attention was urgently required, and I was kind of in the middle of shaking down corpses for baked beans. Don't think this means you can actually rely on your allies, though, because it seems like their IQ drops 50 points when you can actually see them. Performance anxiety, perhaps. Come to think of it, there are a lot of things you can't rely on. The player uses some of the guns to store his chewing gum, so they jam with incredibly poor timing. Your character interprets crouching as ducking his head slightly, so it's very hard to effectively get behind low cover. Lying prone only drops your eye level another inch or so, so your character is either extremely fat or uncomfortably well endowed. Probably the first one, judging by how often you have to stop for a breather and a sausage roll while running cross-country. And of course there's no way of knowing that you're blundering into a high radiation zone until you've already been sterilised and grown an extra face. But having now whinged myself inside out, I have to say that I find S-T-A-L-K-E-R weirdly compelling. This is probably pretty close to how I personally would do in a real-life post-apocalypse scenario, that is, embarrassingly badly. Sure, it's hard, but it hurts us because 
because it loves us. We've all been made complacent by tutorial levels and health regeneration, it's up to games like STALKER to remind you that you're going to be just as useless after the downfall of society as you are now, nerd. Plus running around forests at night with the flashlight on makes me feel like I'm in the Blair Witch Project. So it's quite an immersive game once you adjust for the steep difficulty curve, it's just a shame it's also got more bugs than a crack whore with the sniffles. The mystical quicksave key is a dark and mischievous power that can change the very fabric of reality. I was ambushed by a bunch of jerks on my way somewhere, killed one or two, hid behind a rock and quicksaved, but then three of them all threw grenades and I ended up with a cloud of shrapnel instead of a face. After I quickloaded though they suddenly didn't seem to care. I was able to walk up and affably chat to them about how their day was going, one of them even offered to guide me through the forest but halfway through he ran off yelling, that's him, take him down. I couldn't see anyone else around but it seems he was talking to my processor because at that point the game crashed. They'll probably patch that at some stage but they won't get any points for it in my book. You couldn't get away with releasing a buggy game in the cartridge in cassette days, you'd get sentenced to trampling under the company Brontosaurus. But I'll tell you the worst part about best 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 part about and whistled for a baboon. To me, the Silent Hill series is over, and if Silent Hill 5 convinces me otherwise then I will remove three of my own vertebrae, curl my spine back, and eat my own ass. The bad news for you lovers of spectacle is that while Silent Hill Homecoming isn't that bad a game, my ass gets to stay right where it is. My promise was to chow down if the game convinced me that the series is not over, and I can already hear the words cop out ringing in my ears, but even though it didn't give me too large a hernia, Homecoming doesn't feel like a successor to Silent Hills 1 through 4. There's no way of saying this without sounding like the kind of Japanophile Naruto cosplaying subtitled anime watching westerner who spends his every waking hour gargling Pocky and cursing the roundness of his eyes, but I expected this the moment the franchise moved out of Japan. I was certain that the new American developers would do what Americans always do, muscle in on another culture's territory try to impose their own values and fuck everything up, just like they did in Iraq. The Japanese approach to horror tends to be slow building, oppressive, emphasising the horror of being totally alone with something that hates you in a very passive aggressive way, while American horror is more about putting a fucking chainsaw on your arm and slicing your way through waves of slavering baddies who all respond like blow up dolls filled with raspberry jam. Actually I'm pretty much describing a Resident Evil game there, so maybe I'm talking out to my delicious uneaten ass. but the point is Silent Hill always used to belong in the former category. It was subtle, psychological, typically you'd wander bleary eyed around deserted streets for half an hour before you even saw a monster, and especially in Silent Hill 2, which I would remind you once again is a proud member of my personal best games ever superstar tag team, a lot of them seem more interested in raping each other than actively pursuing you. Sounds boring, but since you're expecting horrors to jump out and gob on you at any moment, it puts you in the right mix of loneliness and anxiety that keeps you on the edge of your seat without even needing jump out scares. Homecoming's so excited to be here that it has you in a rusty toilet stabbing a zombie nurse in the tits before you can do your flies up. Silent Hill Origins and the movie both did the same thing, so let me give a blanket statement here. Drop the fucking big titted sexy nurses. The only reason reason they looked like that in Silent Hill 2 was because the spectacularly neurotic James Sunderland was looking for his sexy wife and they represented his frustrated libido. Alex in Silent Hill Homecoming is looking for his kid brother, who I very much doubt was a double D. And what have the new monster designs got to do with anything? A spindly man with a banana skin for a head? What was Alex's brother once traumatised by a smoothie? Pyramid Head also makes his contractual appearance for no better reason than fan service. His big scene involves him walking across a room and pausing at one point to lingeringly stare at the camera, stopping just short of doing a little song and dance routine. The whole effect is a game that's trying so hard to be part of the big boys club that you can practically hear the discs straining with the effort. The trademark sense of isolation is another point the game misses like a champ when you're given a spunky female sidekick. This is another peculiarly American habit that seems to always go unchallenged. Why does a love interest subplot have to be shoehorned into everything? Imagine if there was some kind of parallel universe where every game and movie regardless of genre was required to incorporate at least one line dancing competition. We think they were all raving lunatics and yet here's us forcing in an out of place cheesy romance scene that's more agonisingly painful to watch than any of the actual horror the game is supposed to be about. And that's not enough, you get a wisecracking black friend drenched in stereotype. Towards the end there's a bit where you're given the choice to either save him or let him die, and I could not hit that no button fast enough, I tell you that. Then of course they have the cheek to give me a bad ending. It's like they had some kind of generic Hollywood movie checklist to fill in, which makes sense because the game borrows heavily from the similarly overdone Silent Hill movie, to the point that I half expected there to be a level where you play as Sean Bean doing something totally fucking irrelevant. I can't help being biased, I once courted a game with golden hair and shining eyes and a mouth that could suck the moon through a drinking straw, but how dally had to end, and while I've been working my way through her modestly hot sisters, none of them will ever compare to those halcyon days. So let's try to judge Homecoming by its own merits. The environments are well done, but some of the levels are a bit linear and feel like arbitrary padding. Thought you could slip a quick sewer level past us and no one would notice, did you lads? The story is a lot more creative than Silent Hill Origins, let's just dump this twat in a haunted town and see how he goes, but the dramatic twist ending was about as shocking and unpredictable as the sun rising in the morning. The dodge move takes a while to master, and even then it only works if the engine's in a good mood. Shooting is the only way to guarantee not getting at least one 
one bit sliced off with every fight, but haunted towns are affected by the economic crisis too, and they can't afford to leave many bullets around. But you know what? That's a good thing. Survival horror combat is supposed to be hectic, panicky, and often not worth it. If I'm not dreading every single monster encounter, then it's not horror, is it? It's just setting up an unpaid pest control business. You don't actually spend much time in Silent Hill the town, so the thought occurs that if they dropped that aspect, changed the looks of the monsters, renamed it something like The Adventures of Captain Scowly Face, and released it as a whole new franchise, I'd probably have been kinder to it. Maybe if the original creators of something don't want to continue it, then you should listen to them, because otherwise you're only making it to please the fans. And why would you want to do anything for fans? I mean, I'm a Silent Hill fan, and I've just spent a whole review whining like a broken motor. Fans are clingy, complaining dipshits who will never ever be grateful for any concession you make. The moment you shut out their shrill, tremulous voices, the happier you'll be for it. Incidentally, why not buy a zero punctuation t-shirt? It just struck me that whenever there's a sandbox crime game, it's always the same gangs. Italians, Yakuza, or street gangsters. You're always either going on about respect, honour, or wearing your belt around your thighs. You know what there needs to be? A sandbox crime game where you play a Batman villain. You run around doing dastardly crime equipped with freeze rays and jetpacks, completing story missions that lead up to you building a giant, brightly coloured doomsday machine shaped like a top hat or something. Then Batman comes along and beats you up because you forgot to strap him into your overly elaborate slow-moving death trap, then you mysteriously evade capture in order to come back and do it all again next week. Sadly, Mankind has yet to recognise my genius, which is incidentally the title I have in mind for this project. I bring this up because Saints Row 2 came appealingly close to my vision. The level of character customization is straight jacket wearing, small animal tormenting insane, and after I'd gotten away into the game and kitted out my cockney accented psychopath with a black and red silk suit with bow tie, two tone shoes, and matching bowler hat, then started a mission in which I drove around the suburbs hosing things down with raw sewage, I suddenly realised that I was role playing as some kind of extremely unsubtle cousin to the Riddler. I wondered if there could be a follow up mini game in which I composed a set of elegant rhyming couplets pertaining to houses covered in poo. Sadly not. I know I said we should drop this term, but Saints Row 2 really is a Grand Theft Auto clone without shame. You're in a huge sandbox city that residents of New York would find weirdly familiar, you jack cars, that is, you steal them, not masturbate them, there are silly in game radio stations, and you do missions pertaining to rival gangs that run you through a colourful spectrum of vehicles and gameplay modes. The only thing it doesn't have is your fucking cousin ringing up every ten minutes to invite you on dinner dates, and that's just one reason why Saints Row 2 is better than Grand Theft Auto 4. If you give players a sandbox world full of guns, cars, and innocent blood-filled squishy people, they're going to want to fuck this world's shit up. This is something that GTA 4 didn't seem to grasp. When you put a child in a sandbox, you do not spend three hours explaining proper bucket and spade etiquette, devote lengthy cutscenes to explaining the child's motivations, nor do you interrupt the child every ten minutes to make them talk to grandma on the phone, and you also don't paint the sand brownish grey or stir in a few shovelfuls of grit. Saints Row 2 shows a much better understanding of its audience. It is fully aware that most gamers are dickheads, and if you give them any kind of freedom, their first instinct will be to abuse it. If you give them guns, they will shoot old ladies. If you give them cars, they will run over old ladies. If you give them aircraft, they will ascend to the highest possible heights and hurl themselves out onto an old lady. And if you give them customizable outfits, their first instinct will be to take off all their clothes and run around the streets hip thrusting in the faces of old ladies. If you try to stop them doing all this, they'll hate you for it. Not only does Saints Row 2 not stop you, but it keeps score. Every single one of my examples has a little mini game attached. You'd never see Nico Bellic farm points by casting his Serbian flag patterned underpants aside and waving his willy at someone's grandma, or for that matter embarking on missions in a floral print dress and top hat, but maybe if he had it, it'd have at least brightened up his miserable little brown life for five minutes. GTA 4 was a game that spent its entire playtime drunkenly stumbling back and forth between wacky fun and gritty realism, unable to decide where it was going to set up shop, so while the funny radio stations were there, the lead character was an angsty cunt with a selection of dowdy outfits like the world's least stimulating G.I. Joe. The cars handled realistically, i.e. like supermarket trolleys full of rocks, and when you drove into a pedestrian they just rolled realistically over your bonnet and collapsed in a screaming pile of broken hips. Run someone over in Saints Row 2 by comparison and their ragdoll will be launched into the sky, Team Rocket style, and end up with their spine curled around a lamppost. I found myself becoming a lot more attached to my character because whatever personality you choose, they're in this for the same reason you are, to have some fucking fun. I'm not so keen on the rather dictatorial gameplay mechanic in which you must play the aforementioned minigames to build up respect points before you can get on with the story missions. It leads to this bizarre scenario where you can be controlling half the fucking city with the legions of misguided youngsters at your command, but you're still not respected enough to do a mission until you go and fling shit at someone's house. The minigames are fun and I admit I probably wouldn't have played them if this game hadn't folded its arms and closed off the plot until I did, but I guarantee their entertainment value will run out before the story missions do. The game's also a little too easy on the medium setting, your handgun can shoot accurately enough to pierce someone's nipple from across town, and our old friend regenerating health makes a show-stopping appearance, essentially making you Robocop with more flexible ethics and trousers. Saints Row 2 isn't the most sophisticated gaming experience, in fact if it were a person it would wear dealy boppers and laugh at dead baby jokes, but it understands what it's trying to be, pure, mindless fun, like wrestling an excitable dog in a paddling pool full of disembodied breasts.
Don't think too much about that simile, I certainly didn't. The history of gaming technology has been one long quest for total realism, but now we're on the verge of it I'm seeing that it's probably not worth the effort. The ultra-realistic games of recent years have been one long gritty, depressing greyathon after another, and it's up to games like Saints Row 2 to remind us that realism is an acceptable sacrifice if it means I get to throw old ladies into jet turbines. Just for once I'd like to see a spaceship in a horror game that actually seems like it might have been a nice place to live. You know, tasteful light fittings, elegant lacquered wood panels, or at the very least throw a fucking carpet down now and then. At least that way it would almost be a surprise when it gets invaded by a horde of flesh-eating mutants. Frankly, if you paint your spaceship gunmetal grey and fit it with about half as many flickery ass fluorescent lights as are necessary, then you might as well rename it the USS Kill Beast Buffet. Dead Space is a sci-fi survival horror featuring an engineer named Isaac Clarke. Oh ho, I see what you did there, EA. He starts the game en route to a stricken mining ship with his friends Arthur C. Heinlein and H.G. Verne. The crew turned out to be perfectly okay, and the problem was a minor communications issue which is easily fixed. Little anticlimactic, but at least it's original. Wait, sorry, I'm thinking of something else. Of course the ship's totally fucked and the crew have all taken up the trendy new slavering monstrosity exercise regime. If you want to know more about the plot, you should probably just go and watch Event Horizon, because Dead Space rips it off about as frequently as it does limbs. Your commanding officer even looks like Lawrence Fishburne, and sounds like someone from North London doing a terrible Lawrence Fishburne impression. Isaac Clarke is basically the character who does everything we keep yelling at people in horror films to do. He has a suit of armour that he never takes off, he uses convenient high power cutting tools to carve his initials into slime monsters, and he never speaks, because he knows that his dialogue would have to come from the same god awful script that all the other sods are using. He's also apparently concerned about his lady wife, who was one of the crew of the stricken ship, although since the big galoot never speaks, we only have the game's word for that. Perplexingly, they keep trying to tuck out heartstrings with glimpses of the wife, but it falls completely flat because we have no emotional connection to Isaac whatsoever. It's like asking us to feel sorry for a brick because its brick children have all left home and never write it letters. Come to think of it, a lot of Dead Space comes across like it was developed by someone who knows that horror films exist and may even have seen posters for a couple of them but doesn't quite grasp the principles. You can't just tell us we're supposed to be feeling sympathetic for someone, you have to characterise them first. And yeah, it was pretty scary the first time a monster that I thought was dead jumped up and bit my ear off, but after six or seven times it had lost a lot of its sting, and I had long ago run out of ears. I've heard people praise how scary it is, but really all it does is startle, and that's not difficult. I was startled when a possum jumped into my window, that doesn't make it the marsupial answer to Stanley Kubrick. There's absolutely no pacing or effective use of stillness, the monsters just can't get enough of the spotlight, displaying themselves like mutilated peacocks from the earliest opportunity. I guess you could say I find it lacking in atmosphere, which is appropriate when you think about it. Gameplay is fine, textbook almost, if the textbook mainly consisted of pages photocopied from other textbooks. So we have Resident Evil 4, sorry, 4 Resident Evils over the shoulder precision gunplay, an incredibly frugal inventory management, combined with two system shocks, claustrophobic tangent heavy level design, and bossy support character who sits in a cupboard somewhere eating pies, constantly telling you off for being slow. There's also a time slowing mechanic, just in case you weren't completely sick of those, and an aggressively unnecessary physics gun, which you use to pull levers and move boxes and other things that could be easily achieved by two working arms, or even one working arm, or even just bumping against it with your stumps for a few minutes. My guess is that physics guns cost a lot of money, and Isaac is determined to make the most of it. On the other hand, the zero gravity mechanic is well done and creative, and it's used to great effect in a particularly spectacular boss fight that's like being stuck inside a tumble dryer with a shog off. The core dismemberment combat is jolly entertaining, and it's nice to see monsters with weak points other than a giant glowing eyeball lodged in a vagina. But the weapons are a bit overpowered, just one shot from the ripper can carve up most enemies like Thanksgiving turkey, and once I figured that out I was having to throw away most of the ammo I found like wrapping paper the day after Christmas. Also, some of the enemies have very cheap attacks, like the little swarming scuttly buggers that make Isaac spaz out like someone dropped a caterpillar down the back of his shirt. It takes him a couple of seconds to shake just one off, so if you didn't see the swarm coming and your plans for the evening didn't involve being picked to the bone and strained through a hundred tiny digestive systems, then you get to eat shit, space cowboy. Oh yes, and anyone who designs a security system so that it locks all the doors every time a monster shows up has absolutely no right to complain when they get their twat bitten off. To compress this review into a pithy but less marketable three-word phrase, Dead Space is competent but bland. It looks alright and it plays alright, it passes the time but it's not going to enthrall anyone, and if as a developer you'd be satisfied with that, then yay for you! A round of applause for Captain Ambitious over here. But it's repetitive, it's riddled with cliché, you could replace the entire cast with puppy dogs and they still wouldn't be likeable, it's repetitive, and despite its original ideas it still somehow fails to kill the feeling that we've seen it all before. All in all it comes across as the sort of thing you'd get from a soulless video game generating machine if you fed an alien's box set into the slot and asked for something less compelling and more repetitive. I hope you're ready to do some donuts on memory lane, because the original fable, an action RPG type thing concerning the adventures of a mute extremely placid faced bloke with a very strange metabolism, was of course the second review I ever made, back when I was a nameless YouTube gutter snipe with nothing to my name but a website and a couple of yellow swatches, so all I have to do is review the darkness again next week, then crash and burn into total obscurity for the next 25 years before being absorbed into someone's vagina and my life is officially symmetrical. Actually after that review Peter Molyneux contacted me and expressed his hope that Fable 2 would meet my unreasonable standards. Well that may have been a little character Statistically over-optimistic on your part, Peter, especially considering you didn't change a bloody thing. Well, okay, there are one or two new things, now you can be a mute, extremely placid-faced girl with a very 
strange metabolism too. Also, you have a dog whose job it is to point out treasure chests. A job it adheres to with admirable gusto. This is a dog that might possibly be a little bit too well trained. Who pattered about in the background while the bandit legions were carving my buttocks into luncheon meat, barking excitedly about a box full of amusing novelty hats he'd found. Other than that, though, if you've played Fable One, the actual story aspect will give you an eerie sense of deja vu. You start off as a small apple-cheeked street urchin with a hilarious mullet who leads an almost Disney-esque life of idyllic wholesomeness, presumably to amplify the perverse glee when an equally absurd tragedy comes along and shits all over it. Your sister is killed and you get shot thrown through a window and dropped 90 stories, but ten years later you're all healed up and back for more. And having been through the worst of it, injury suddenly becomes a lot easier to recover from. In fact, every time you die, you pop instantly back to life with a paltry random experience deduction that can be instantly recovered by swatting the nearest gnat. Oh yeah, and you'll also get an unremovable scar somewhere on your body, but Peter Molyneux has yet to grasp that not everyone gives a shit. As in the last game, you can technically specialise in either melee ranged weapons or magic, and as in the last game, I quickly found that most enemies picked the first option, so you better had as well, unless you want your torso looking like a satellite map of Baghdad. But really, here's the best strategy for combat. Pick an area of effect spell, pour all your points into it to get to level 4 or 5 as fast as possible, put a piece of electrical tape over the cast magic button, go to sleep, wake up, win game, have a well-deserved cup of tea, stalwart hero of the land. So the whole RPG aspect of this action RPG is a bit of a mess. The combat is easily broken, and even if you try to challenge yourself by, say, playing without using magic while someone sucks you off, the lack of penalty for death and the shortness of the story quest means you can plough through to the end credits before you've even come. But someone made the point to me that perhaps Fable 2 becomes a good game if you judge it not as an action RPG, but as a Sims-esque life simulator with action RPG bits. Of course, that's a slippery slope. Maybe it would also be a good game if you judge it as a frisbee, or from the perspective of a 19th century time traveller. It does smack a little of making excuses. One would think a game called Fable would be all about the story. I mean, a guy who works as a blacksmith for 20 years to save up and buy a house for his cunt wife. Yeah, that's the kind of timeless legend that will live on through the ages, isn't it? But whatever, we'll play it your way. The first thing you're gonna need is money. Questing doesn't pay as well as it used to, so you have to get a job. I guess I missed the short story where Conan the Barbarian took up bartending, but no, bad Yahtzee! Live simulator, live simulator, adjust expectations! Okay then, you know how in The Sims you could get a job as a mailroom clerk? You remember how you had to go into the office every single in-game day and play a little mini-game where you fling envelopes into pigeonholes? Of course not, because it would have been really fucking boring! Yes, alright Peter, it's more realistic than dead monsters dropping pocket change, but you know what else is realistic? Working a desk job for 50 years in a cloying mire of tedium and self-hatred before dying of a disfiguring fatal cancer alone and unloved, forgotten within a decade. But you won't see many games about that. That, at least not until I finish the design document. And then there's the infamous marriage aspect. Flex your arms a few times in front of NPCs, and many of them will swiftly agree that yes, your magnificent pythons and tendency to break wind in public prove your relationship commitment. Then you have the option of marrying someone, although why you'd want to is a question the game skillfully avoids. Everyone has the same voices and endlessly repeated dialogue lines, so you'll run into nine clones of your beloved down any given street, and none of them will get their tits out when you're bonking them. These are just a few of the excellent reasons why I grew bored after around 12 minutes of happy marriage and decided it was time to murder my entire family. This was the point when I discovered you can't kill children, of course. So much for total freedom, eh? What, so it's alright for someone else to shoot me in the face and throw me off a building when I'm a kid, but the moment I try to spread the love, then ooh, suddenly we're getting off message. And while we're on the subject, why can't I marry my dog? You see, you can gab on about freedom until the eagles choke, but in a game it's always going to be within some constraints. Fable 2 is actually pretty restrictive by the standards of sandbox games. The world is rather small and linear, and appearance customization is so shallow and arduous you might as well not bother. The key phrase here is, you can, but but why would you want to? You can get married, bone your spouse till their eyes drop out, pump out enough kids to start your own jazz orchestra, but it's all for its own sake. You can buy every house in the game and be crowned king, but there's no benefit besides more and more useless fucking money to make your wallet look untidy. I am of course emotionally jaded, but the characters in the game don't have enough charm to make me want to marry or rule them. They all operate as some bizarre schizophrenic hive mind who will chide you for your numerous murders one moment and praise your farting prowess the next. Fable 2 is less of a sequel, more like an upgrade of Fable 1 warts and all that just tried to destroy from the floors by going, oh, work, he's a doggy, mash up his whittle face and call him chips. All right, all right. If I had Liam Neeson's phone number, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd nervously call him up and blurt out something about how Dark Man was all right before slamming the receiver down and running away. But hypothetically, if I wasn't an idiot and talked him into doing voices for my video game, I'd have him voice a character named Captain Dynamite, who has the face of Frank Zappa and nuclear missiles instead of legs. He'd fire around the player in a magic space buggy for the entire course of the game, sprinkling rose petals and friendship. What I'm saying is I'd make the most of the talent, but Bethesda seem to be in the habit of hiring the biggest name voice actors they can find and having their character drop off the face of the earth before you've even picked a class. They did it to Captain Picard in Oblivion, and now they've done it to Oscar Schindler in Fallout 3. It's a shame because Liam Neeson's smooth, authoritative tones really helped ease the trauma of the game's opening in which you are dumped blear eyed and bloodstained out of your mum's vagina and are then expected to come up with a gender name and future appearance, which is a lot to ask from a newborn baby. The character creation sets the scene by having you play through various key points of your miserable childhood in a small underground room populated by around ten people, and it's fairly effective at drawing you in, even if the all-important immersion does receive a little hairline fracture as you're leaving the vault when a window pops up going, 
just a moment. Was there any part of your childhood you were unsatisfied with and wished to alter with your magical time traveling false memory syndrome? But anyway, you emerge blinking from the underground for the first time and then an endless land of possibilities rolls away in every direction, evoking many conflicting emotions in your naive young mind, all eventually silenced by one overpowering realization. This seems a hell of a lot like oblivion. For the most part, it's like they just took that game and put new wallpaper over it. Green hills painted brown, a few houses bombed, imps chained to mutant flies, and a fleet of garbage trucks sent around to dump rubble all over the landscape. The scenery is a bit more varied and interesting, but you'll see the interiors of more copy pasted subway stations than an indecisive hobo, and the characters of Fallout 3 and Oblivion both holiday in the same part of the uncanny valley. Voice acting's improved though, so at least when you hear different people spout the same conversations verbatim, they at least sound a little bit into it. They still do that thing where they stand ramrod stiff while talking and never break eye contact, like they're incredibly paranoid that you're gonna pick their pocket the moment they look away, which might make sense because I usually do. Of course, the major difference is that they didn't have assault rifles in Cyrodiil, which was a shame because they would have livened up the arena fights no end. With guns comes the much touted VATS aiming system. In my E3 video, I speculated that watching every single gunshot happen in slow motion from a different camera angle would get old after a while, but that's not the case. Watching a super mutant's body fly off in one direction and his head in three others never loses its charm as a spectacle, but in a nutshell, it's a system for lobster accountants who distrust the uncoordinated flailing of their pincers and would rather let numbers decide the outcome of battle. For people who actually know which end of a gun makes the loud noises, it's essentially a magic hey look over there button that keeps the enemy holding nice and still while you carefully pick off their testicles. And when you're out of action points, you can still fire manually. There's a good reason why no one's ever tried mixing real-time and turn-based combat, and it's the same reason why no one's ever tried mixing jam with pus. You also level up a lot faster than in Oblivion, and you can even do it while you're awake. I ended up putting a lot of points into lockpicking and stealth, partly because sometimes I experience minor brain hemorrhages and I forget that the Thief series are the only games that have ever done stealth well, and partly because I was going to steal shit. Games have spent the last 20 years ingraining into me the instinct that being the stalwart hero of the land basically overruled society's petty ownership laws, rather than objectivist philosophy on reflection, but I'll be buggered before I unlearn that for one fucking game. As long as no one's looking, you can pretty much help yourself, and most people are too busy staring at walls to worry about you. By the time I hit level 4, I was sitting on a hall worthy of a dingy post-apocalyptic Creasus, but still had the highest karma level because of a few quests I'd stumbled into, so the people were showering me with praise even while I wondered where their wallets had gone. Eventually I lost interest because I was practically wallpapering my house with money med kits and ammo and all the challenge had exited the game with nary a farewell or tip of the hat. Fallout 3 is a vast improvement on Oblivion, it's much more immersive and I found myself relishing the long hikes through the wasteland to my next objective as I drank in the atmosphere, met interesting characters and nicked all their stuff. But there's something rather monotonous about it that waters my enthusiasm. It's certainly closer to Branston Pickle than most games, but they chose too large a sandwich and spread the Branston Pickle so thin that there weren't any particularly chunky mouthfuls. But it's still Branston Pickle and if you let it take you in, you'll be swimming in it till your eyes fall out. Fallout 3, that is. You know what, Harmonix? I used to be on your side. When you departed the Guitar Hero franchise and left Guitar Hero 3 in the hands of Activision and Red Octane, I felt that the game was poorer for it. Then we learned you were working on Rock Band and I was thrilled because it seemed like a fantastic advancement of the concept. After all, playing pretend guitar is fun and playing co-op with a friend on another pretend guitar is even more fun and incidentally an excellent way to develop a burgeoning romance. So an entire pretend ensemble would provide excellent opportunities for fun and perhaps eroticism. I was ready to ride the harmonics train all the way to Fun Street Station. But it seems on the way to Fun Street Station, the harmonics train went off the rails around Fuckery Central. Rock Band came out in America in 2007 and I was drinking in the soundtrack waiting for harmonics to tell us when we Australian residents could expect to be banging our heads so hard the corks on our hats could take someone's eye out. I don't know, came the reply. Sometime next year, maybe. An entire year passes. Oh yeah, says Harmonix, wiping chicken grease from his face as dusky maidens fan his corpulence. Still don't know about when we're releasing it, but we do know that we're going to sell the instrument separately and charge you three times as much as Americans paid. Now caper for my amusement, you dirty Australian monkey man. But then Activision swung in through the window, wearing a rakish tricorn hat and clenching a dagger between his teeth, robbing the bloated and dastardly Duke Harmonix of his tidy little monopoly, giving complete packaged copies of World Tour to the peasants for a much more reasonable price. I vowed never to buy products from the bloated and dastardly Duke harmonics again, but then of course after a few hours of entertainment, Guitar Hero World Tour started coughing up blood and his legs fell off. In my haste to welcome him into my home, I failed to notice that he was suffering from leprosy. Believe me, after having my Antipodean nutsack paddled by harmonics for months on end, I was really desperately trying to like World Tour. I went along with it all. I got some friends around and hung plastic instruments around their throats. I put on tight trousers and thrust my hips at the drummer, even after he politely but firmly asked me to stop. I made a little simulacrum of myself in the character creator, even though you can shift those sliders to the moon and back and you'll always somehow look like Mick Jagger after being smacked in the face with a chopping board for a few hours, unless you make a girl perhaps, but everyone knows that you can't have women in proper rock bands because all the blokes are going to be looking like them anyway. The first problem we ran into is that no one wanted to sing. This is less a problem with World Tour specifically and more an inherent problem with the original concept and possibly with the people I hang around with. You see, people who like pretend guitar are introverted nerds who picture themselves as the aloof, crazy skilled lead guitarist whose hands rattle away at the strings like nervous little crabs, while he stares into the middle distance pretending to have forgotten he's holding it. Whereas people who like pretend singing are either screechy centre of attention types or a normal person who has rendered themselves massively drunk and stumbled upon a jukebox full of 80s power ballads. And the two groups rarely socialise because you need to be sober for those power solos. I'll tell you what 
what would help bring the glittering vocalist butterfly from the shambling unwashed cocoon of nerd, and that's having some decent songs on the soundtrack. Deny it as much as you like, but you're asking us to do karaoke here, and the lifeblood of karaoke is a list of memorable classics whose lyrics are ingrained into the public consciousness, or at the very least a few ZZ Top songs so I can sing like I've got a sock jammed in my throat. But on the World Tour soundtrack, for every living on a prayer or band on the run, there are two shitty emo rock warblers that no one's ever heard of. Admittedly, that's always going to be par for the course in games like these, but what the fuck is with having songs from obscure European bands with lyrics entirely in foreign? If you don't speak Spanish, singing them is like if the guitarist was required to play wearing mittens, or if the drummer were required to think. And of course, with new hardware comes the inevitable hardware issues. The slider bar on the guitar controller could be more productively replaced with a McCowan's chew bar. At least you'd have something to lick in between songs. There's virtually no warning as to when the special slidey notes are about to come up, and switching between the buttons and the slider without looking is so fiddly that I forgot how many fingers I own and ruined my future masturbation prospects. You might as well just use the fret buttons for all the notes and use the slider bar to store elastic bands to flick at the bassist. And then there are the drums, whose symbols are like a pair of dopey inbred twins whose names you need to shout three times before they'll even realise you're talking to them. Actually, Activision have acknowledged the drum problems and are sorting out a fix, but they won't score points for it unless it comes with all the songs from the Sgt Pepper album and a selection of prostitutes who will come around my house and take turns beating the slider bar with a pipe wrench. Really though, this is all getting a bit nitpicky. Playing Guitar Hero is still as inherently entertaining and shamelessly pathetic as it's always been, and the dodgy editions of World Tour don't usually get in the way of all that. Plus, the music creation facility, while just a little bit too nerdy for me to consider actually using, will ensure that there will always be plenty of new songs online to challenge you as long as you can tolerate endless MIDI renditions of the Neon Genesis Evangelion theme tune. Get either this or Rock Band because it honestly doesn't matter which, although it's worth remembering that harmonics are bigger jerks than Activision, which as achievements go has got to be worth some kind of medal. The trouble with being a freelance game critic is that no one sympathises with your problems. I can complain about how working from home, playing video games, reading porn and eating M&Ms is doing terrible things to my self-esteem and waistline, but you tell that to say a fireman and he won't sympathise for an instant, the selfish child rescuing fuck. And no one seems to care that it's proving very difficult to keep up when by the time I finished reviewing a game, six more have popped up like wooden ducks at a target range. No one that is except EA, who have been kind enough to provide Mirror's Edge, a game that I finished in a day, thus freeing up loads of time on my schedule for playing other, less horrible games. There's a reason why I never play demos, besides the fact that I spend most of my life in a video vegetative state of cannot be asked, demos create expectations and expectations colour your opinion of the final product. For most people, a demo from Mirror's Edge coloured their expectations a shimmering gold, only to realise once they bought the full game that they had been seeing the lights reflecting off a stream of piss. If you like the demo, just play it again three or four times and maybe make yourself some little cinematics with paper cutouts and you've pretty much played the full game. And it also wouldn't hurt to pay someone to stand next to you jamming shards of glass under your fingernails. Actually, I guess that would hurt. Quite a lot. So here's the gist. It's the future again, and the government are evil because they have a lot of money and wear suits. This isn't very well explained, to be honest. You play a member of an underground courier organisation who operate over the rooftops, ironically, who do jobs for someone or other, delivering packages containing... that's never really explained either. The police apparently have nothing better to do than send several armed platoons after you with helicopter support, so either no other crime ever fucking happens, or you're delivering something really amazing like the Dead Sea Scrolls or a wireless blowjob dispenser. I remember when everyone was first getting giddy about the gameplay trailer, and I being then as now determined to bring everyone down pointed out that platforming from a first person perspective has worked about as often as Western European peace treaties, highbrow joke. You can't see your feet without looking straight down so it's hard to judge your jumps and when you dangle from a ledge or pipe you're going to be treated to a face full of wall, at which point you either break game flow by slowly looking around for the next ledge or because the game asks, nay demands, a quickness of pace on your part you can take a wild guess and jump straight off hoping that solid ground can be willed into existence from the land of dreams. I turned out to be absolutely right as always but it seems I was being uncreative in my naysaying. I should have also really realise that the engine will be plagued by collision detection difficulties, leaving you hopping furiously up and down in front of a three foot high ledge, hoping the game will realise you're trying to climb onto it before the enemies are finished turning you into a rousing game of bullet kaplunk. Speaking of, Mirror's Edge can't seem to decide what it wants to do with the combat aspect. Obviously anyone who takes on armed platoons of burly soldiers empty handed would need to have had his brain and his scrotum switched around, so half the time the game will tell you to just run your stupid ass away, but at other times it will be for various reasons impossible to proceed until you've murdered all the decent hard working married police officers who are forced to open fire after you refuse to cooperate because we really only have the main character's word for it that the government is evil, about the only evidence presented is that they keep everything looking extremely clean and shiny, so okay, maybe they run their janitorial services a bit dictatorially, but for all we know you're delivering nail bombs to terrorist groups so they can plant them all under somebody's doting silver-haired mother. I do like the starkness of the visual aesthetic, if you'll forgive the degree of faggotry in that phrasing. The bright colours against uniform white make an appealing change from gunmetal grey or dystopia brown. Effort has been put into realistic visual effects like blurring and changing of light levels like you're actually looking through real human eyeballs as opposed to a camcorder zipping 
along about five feet above the ground. And yeah, maybe it would be realistic for all that white scenery combined with bright sunlight to bleed together into a big blinding blob, but it doesn't help you avoid dropping off a building for the umpteen bazillionth time. Oh, says Mirror's Edge, here manifesting as a designer with a bicycle pump embedded in his skull. Well, since that's your problem, I guess I'll just set half the game in linear claustrophobic tunnels that undermine the very concept of free running, and then fill them with excessive bloom anyway. So he did, and then he ate his own shoes. So, essentially flawed concept, dodgy detection, indecisive design, muddy story, unlikable characters, shocking brevity, put them all together and you get Es Flocon Dodgek in Desai Monster like Tozokati, and of course Mirror's Edge, but while being in itself an eight hour fecal water slide, its very existence is evidence of something positive. It's one of the few original IPs coming out this year, flanked on all sides by old hand titles with increasingly large numbers on the end. It was experimental, sure it didn't work, but that's what experimentation is for. Maybe the next combination will be a revolutionary diamond farting wonder. I for one am gratified to have been part of the scientific process, just a shame I had to pay a hundred bucks for the privilege. They'd have paid me in a laboratory, and all I'd have to do is let them put wires up my dick. It's my observation that zombies are second only to ninjas, pirates, and monkeys in the list of things nerds like and need to shut the fuck up about. They watch movies about them, they dress up like them and wander around irritating commuters in major cities, and it seems every time a hot new engine comes out some craven optimist will try to make a zombie mod for it, posting one gun model and a piece of concept art before the level designer remembers he's only ever worked in Lego and the whole thing falls apart. I guess it's just that the breakdown of society is attractive to people with absolutely no social skills, and while you may have to hide from slavering mutants your whole life, at least the big boys will never again tape you into a bin and kick you down the stairs. Valve have therefore proven to us just how big nerds they are, if that weren't already obvious from their series of games about a bespectacled scientist beating up hordes of big tough football scholarship marines with Left 4 Dead, a true blue zombie game in the Source engine. Now obviously there have been tons of games with zombies in, but in most cases they're just standard challenge obstacles to litter the corridors, interchangeable with terrorists or aliens or mean-spirited traffic barriers. The trick is to recreate the tension and emotion of the zombie apocalypse, where you and the last three sane people on earth huddle together in a basement somewhere while the entire population of the landmass stand outside meaningfully rubbing their bellies and waving ice cream scoops. That is a true zombie game, because if you can pull it off, then you could replace the zombies with, say, koalas, and it'd still feel like a zombie game. And that's pretty much what Valve have gone for, oppressive co-op zombie fun. And when I say co-op, try to imagine the word written in 80 foot high concrete letters. Usually when you talk about co-op in games, you're talking about a single player game in which some dolt follows you around hoovering up all the health and ammo, but Left 4 Dead is a rare co-op game in which the other players actually feel necessary. You need four chumps worth of guns in play to take on the hordes, and you need your friends to save you from special zombie attacks, so if you separate from the group, you might as well drizzle chopped nuts over your shoulders and start shampooing your hair with barbecue sauce. Although, frankly, the other players are also one of your major threats, because the immediate appreciable difference between a dishevelled muddy coloured survivor and the dishevelled muddy coloured undead marathon runners he's fleeing from is very little at first glance, and when things get frantic, stopping for a second glance can lose you another two mouthfuls of brain. On the other, less ethical side of things, you can also opt to play as the special zombies themselves, which transforms the game from tense survival horror into hilarious griefing engine. It's nice to see creative thinking rewarded when you successfully leap on a human player and start pulling his nibbles out, and it's also curiously satisfying for me in ways I should probably tell my psychiatrist about. It is a little frustrating, however, when most of the time you'll be killed about as quickly as a gerbil in a speed bag, and then you have to wait 20 agonising flow breaking seconds for another go. It's probably there to keep the game balanced, but there's no reason why I couldn't play as one of the little crappy zombies while I wait. No need to rein in their numbers, because they're like gerbils in speed bags full of broken glass. Whether Left 4 Dead is good or not depends on what you ask for in a game. If you like a plot, there's certainly not a lot of that. Here are some zombies, about sums it up. Other than that, you are part of a small team of the four unluckiest bastards in the entire holocaust who get rescued over and over again, but it never seems to take. There's the old Vietnam veteran, the tattooed biker fellow, the hot college girl who probably spends every single night sleeping with her ass to the wall, and there's also a nebbish office worker type who doesn't seem to need to shave if you're looking for a character you can actually identify with, although he is black, which probably fucks that up a bit. It's also not going to be your thing if you like to see a game evolve and reach closure. While most games endeavour to have a uniformly rising difficulty curve leading up to a satisfying crescendo and hopefully a massive boss fight, preferably in space, Left 4 Dead starts about halfway up the difficulty chart and stays there forever. Playing the same four campaigns over and over again might not sound like a world beater, but the repetition is eased by the so-called AI director, an omnipotent figure watching silently from the shadows who creates dramatic tension by conjuring health and ammo at the points when you need it and a billion zombies whenever he's bored, which is all the time. Anthropomorphizing the system was probably a shrewd idea, because when Cox rockets skyward, everyone likes having someone to blame who can't defend themselves. I saw someone pray to the AI director once. This is probably how cults get started. As a game in itself, Left 4 Dead is beautifully designed, but I'm unconvinced that the gameplay is varied enough to be as endlessly replayable as Team Fortress 2. Even with the AI director, after a few games you'll pretty much know all the motions, but it is fun as a shared social experience and quite invaluable if you're planning some kind of doomed voyage and need to know who among your circle of friends is most likely to spaz out under pressure. As I said, it's up to you whether you think this is all worth 50 bucks, but then of course I paid 100 bucks for Mirror's Edge, so apparently I'm a retard. Sonic the Hedgehog is sort of a rock star of the video gaming industry. He fronted a succession of extremely popular titles, made enough money to buy St. Paul's Cathedral and grind it into a fine snortable powder, hung around with a lot of suspiciously effeminate young boys, abused a number of forbidden substances, spiralled downwards as inevitably as Al-Qaeda Airways, weathered a few very embarrassing attempts to re-grab the spotlight, and now his shows are attended only by people's dads, who can only shake their heads in despair at the 
unshaven, drug-addled spaz on stage, whose pathetic spurts of activity masquerading as entertainment only serve to highlight both his and his audience's mutual decline into inexorable, piss-dribbling old age. All he needs to do now is hang himself on a doorknob while having a wank. The particular substance Sonic is abusing this time around is dual-world gameplay, because Nintendo rule over that for a while, and Sonic is nothing if not willing to jog sweatily along about 50 feet behind the bandwagon. You get to explore various thinly disguised countries of the world in either the day or the night. During the day, your lovable drug-crazed has been normal Sonic. During the night, you turn into a werehog, which, as I've been quick to remind everyone with assuredly insufferable smugness, is a misnomer. Because the word werewolf derives from the old English word were, meaning man, so man-wolf. A more appropriate word would be hog-wolf or wolf-hog, although I'm not sure he's even supposed to be a wolf, because wolves don't usually possess stretchy arms or run around ripping off God of War. I bought Sonic Unleashed to review because I was almost certain I would hate it, and I needed something to help me unwind in the stressful Christmas period. It's a fairly safe assumption that anyone who ever had any actual talent in Sonic Team has long since abandoned the company to an invading force of leprous retards who create design documents by flicking fountain pens at a pile of shredded paper. I was looking forward to a delightfully horrible game to get good and angry at, but it turns out I was disappointed. Sonic Unleashed is so bad, so utterly putrid, that I can't even get worked up about it. It falls right off the edge of my critical spectrum into the black, cloying void of dispassionate loathing. It doesn't even have the hilariously awful quality of previous Sonic games, like in the last one where he tried to get his little furry leg over a human girl who was probably underage, just in case it didn't completely creep you out. The only slightly tolerable parts of Sonic Unleashed are the nighttime manhog levels, mainly because you could put Sonic in a skirt, unfocus your eyes, and convince yourself that you're playing God of War, a much better game. It's almost entertaining to be able to pick up two small, relatively harmless enemies and slap them against each other like one of those possessed toy monkeys, and like God of War you can opt to finish off wounded enemies with a quick time event special move, but they're terribly unforgiving and if you fail, the sheer reality-altering power of your ineptitude causes them to regain most of their health, so you might as well forget it and just mash heavy attack until their skulls have been flattened against the curb. The leprous retards of Sonic Team have basically been lost in their own little world for the past few years, but occasionally something penetrates their malformed three-inch thick skulls. Recently, for example, the notion finally broke through that most people want Sonic games to be about Sonic, and that his ever-expanding entourage of neon woodland creatures can all go dive under a tractor. So the cast of Anthropomorphs is cut down on this venture. Tails makes an appearance, but he was with the series while it was still good, so I'll let that one slide. But we're also introduced to a new, helpful in massive inverted commas, pixie-like character, who is like Navi from Ocarina of Time with a cheese grater taped to her face. It doesn't help that the dialogue's so fucking embarrassingly written I had to change the language to Japanese just to give it enough of a sense of cultural distance that my hands didn't keep slipping off the controller and fastening around my throat. Another thing that finally penetrated is that putting Sonic in a 3D environment has repeatedly proven to be like releasing freshwater fish into the Dead Sea. They just don't get along. So the day missions, as normal Sonic, largely consist of running very fast on a largely 2D plane. But then Sonic Team's nanny was called away and they fell back on their leprous retard instincts. Ironically, Sonic just moves too fucking fast, running face first into pits and spike traps that you'd need clairvoyance to be able to avoid on your first go, so the levels can only be beaten by trial and error. There's more than one stage that kills you if you don't press anything in the first second or two. This is gameplay I would expect from a fucking ROM hack, designed by Hitler. They even use that obsolete fucking live system, and if you run out, you've got to start the level all over again, and then, just to be completely insufferable, when you finally reach the end of a level, the game grades you, usually very poorly. I'm ashamed enough that I'm even playing this game, and now the game itself is insulting me for it. Mind you, even getting to the next level is like pulling teeth. First you go from your world map to the country you feel like harassing, then you have to find the entrance to the mission hub while avoiding conversation with a bunch of spliffed up locals, then you have to navigate the incredibly unintuitively laid out mission hubs to find the level entrance to find the actual game part of the fucking game. And even then they won't let you in the door until you've picked up enough coins as part of a completely asinine gameplay lengthening scheme that will more often than not have you traipsing back and forth over every shitty fucking level trying to find them all. This isn't the game for you if you like jumping right into the action. Come to think of it, this isn't the game for you even if you don't. I'm not sure what kind of person could consider this the game for them, but they probably live in a cave and subsist on raw fish. Nostalgia is the only reason Sonic still gets a free ride despite repeatedly rubbing his little blue balls in our face with terrible game after terrible game. Sonic is done. He's past it. He doesn't need more games. He needs help. Specifically the kind of help that involves taking him behind the shed and tearfully putting both barrels through his confused, oblivious little face. Stuff him, mount him, repurpose him as a litter picking device. The Prince of Persia series, as it stands, can best be equated to a man who owns a goose that once when the conditions were exactly right and after being fed a particular kind of food, laid a golden egg. He then spent the next few years experimenting with the goose's bedding and vitamin intake, hoping to recreate the ideal conditions, and after nothing more than a couple of bronze and silver eggs plopped out, he went the scientific route to chopping it into fritters looking for the secret. And after that didn't work, he hastily stitched it back together, dressed it up in glittery fabrics, attached some googly eyes, and that's the new Prince of Persia, an appealingly gaudy appearance that fails to disguise the fact that the old bird is dead inside. First let me say that the best part of the Prince of Persia games, the triple-headed gameplay of Runny Jumpy Climby, is still intact. Hosts of linear parkour paths spread across the open world playground like the Saturday Night Vomit piles on the pavement outside the noodle shop, and navigating them with a smoothly rattled off sequence of acrobatics feels as rewarding as ever, compounded by the gorgeous panoramic views the Assassin's Creed engine so efficiently assaults us with. It's like having your temples gently massaged by a swarthy concubine while her twin sister stands some distance away doing aerobic stretches.
stretches in the leotard three sizes too small. The new moves incorporating the Prince's Freddy Krueger glove for the most part work well, though they often lack the grace and speed of his somersaulting predecessor's movements, especially when grinding slowly down a wall like an obnoxious pussycat descending the living room curtains. But as much as I love the Sands of Time trilogy, I understand when a series has to end. Ideally it should have been around the time Warrior Within began development, but oh well, and have nothing against starting a whole new story, as long as it's suitably epic and fantastical and features breasts at some point. Our new hero is a mysterious stranger who wanders out of the desert to find himself embroiled in the troubles of some mystical lady with no shoes, the enigma of his identity undermined somewhat by it being given away in the fucking title. He dresses like he just ran at full speed through a circus clown's washing line, and he looks like he draws on his abdominal muscles with a felt tip pen, but it seems mean to complain about that when I'd rather complain about how the two leads both talk like smart-ass American 20-somethings exchanging cliched witticisms over frappuccinos in some toothless New York-based sitcom that goes out at one in the afternoon. I know publishers have this idea that American audiences can't relate to anything but other Americans, but as weird as these words sound coming out of my mouth, perhaps we could at least try giving them credit. I imagined all the prince's lines being delivered in a thick Indian accent and it became much more appealing, although it did feel like the game was taking place in a 7-Eleven. Honestly though, his cheerfully carefree attitude and occasional funny line eventually caused me to warm to him, although that could just be because he was standing next to his sidekick, Elika, a character alongside whom even a dead goose with googly eyes attached would seem charismatic and appealing. The writer couldn't decide precisely which generic female character personality to give her, so she flits schizophrenically between fragile flower, sardonic tease, and humourless austerity. Her role in cutscenes is mainly to reiterate plot points you grasped ages ago and to almost faint every time she exerts herself so the prince gets to feel her up. In gameplay she's just there to save you from death drops and occasionally do a trick at your command, so her role could easily have been filled by a magical Labrador in a low-cut top. Her other job is to help out in combat, which is a thankless task because the combat is beyond help. Once again, Prince of Persia continues the proud tradition of taking one step forward, then two steps back. Actually, in this case, more like one step to the side and one step back into a ditch full of used surgical equipment. Gone is the old prince's acrobatic fighting style that merged seamlessly with the parkour moves in which you could run up a wall, somersault behind a pursuer, and thinly slice his buttocks before he knows what the fuck. Now you just get to shuffle back and forth, waving your sword like you were taught how to fight by an air traffic controller, occasionally weathering button mashing quick time events that call upon you to channel the spirit of Woody Woodpecker. If you manage to block an attack, and you probably will because the game helpfully slows down and highlights the block button to cater for the clueless dipshit demographic, then the enemy will just wail on you over and over, not giving you any chance to counterattack until you might as well just let them hit you and take your chances with the quick time events. The other option is to fling Elika at them, but she's really snooty about how close you have to be before she'll attack, the lazy bitch. Combat basically consists of the same sticky, frustrating fight repeated about 800 times, and in that respect goes quite well with the level progression. Despite a few little changes in scenery, the levels are all cut from the same carpet, jump around a place that's covered in black slime like a busload of smokers just rolled through, coughing on everything, fling the local bad guy off a cliff, then plonk Elika on a magic floor and finger the Y button until she explosively comes grass seeds. It works fine on its own, but when you have to go through the exact same process over and over again, my nipples explode in a desperate attempt to add variety, although on reflection it might have been for some other reason. Letting the player choose what order to do the levels in sounds good on paper, but it means that they have to all be very similar or the difficulty curve gets fucked up. To utterly misquote Benjamin Franklin, he who trades pacing for gimmicky open world freedom deserves neither. Frankly though, the core platforming and lovely scenery do a lot to make up for the flaws, almost suspiciously so. Every time I feel myself getting worked up about the characters or the combat, a nice relaxing parkour sequence mellows me out, those cunning Ubisoft twat rackets. So I guess Prince of Persia gets an extremely tentative recommendation. I've heard people complain that it's too easy, which seems odd to me, because I died more times than the nameless one in a smoothie maker. Sure, you recover instantly, but in this kind of game it works. Instant death recovery didn't work in Prey because it defanged any possible threats, but a free running game has to be all about the flow, which as Mirror's Edge aptly demonstrated can't survive constant unavoidable bucket kicking. Prince of Persia is definitely worth a look at least, but don't look too hard or you'll see the stitches. 